hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about what is dynamic programming dynamic programming is a technique for solving a complex problem by breaking it down into a collection of simpler sub problem solving of the sub problem just once and storing their solution if next time the sub problem occurs instead of recomputing its solution simply looks up the previously computed solution and this is the concept of dynamic programming for example if you're given this expression 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 equals to 15 so you have computed this expression 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 equals to 15 if you are given this expression 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 then here we don't have to recompute this expression 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 because we have computed this expression previously so we'll use the previously computed solution and we'll add that to 6 so 6 plus 15 is 21 so we reduced our computation and this is the concept of dynamic programming we used the previously computed solution instead of recomputing and this is the concept of dynamic programming we use the previously computed result to save our times so we don't have to recompute that dynamic programming has two properties one is called overlapping sub problem and optimal substructure if we find out for a problem these two properties overlapping sub problem or optimal substructure then we can apply dynamic programming for overlapping sub problem we have two approaches top down approach and bottom up approach in the next video we'll talk about top down approach and bottom up approach in details in this video let's talk about overlapping sub problem and optimal substructure first let's see the definition of overlapping sub problem then we'll see what does this mean actually one of the main characteristics is to split the problem into sub problem as similar as a divide and conquer approach the overlapping sub problem is found in that problem where bigger problems share the same smaller problem however unlike divide and conquer there are many sub problems in which overlap cannot be treated distinctly or independently let's say we want to find out nth fibonacci number this is the pseudocode to find out nth Fibonacci number from Fibonacci series. This function takes one parameter n. Inside here, we're checking if n is greater than or equals to 3. Then we're calling this function fib n minus 1 plus fib n minus 2. For base catch, we're returning 1. This is recursive catch and this is base catch. Now let's draw a recursive call tree. This is the recursive call tree. When it's finding out the value, here we're going to explain what is overlapping sub problem here we call this function fib6 then we're making this problem smaller and smaller and here we can't break this problem into smaller problem after fib2 fib1 after solving this problem we're going to return a value to this fib3 so here it will return 1 and it will return 1 so here we'll return 2 1 plus 1 is 2 so we have solved this problem fib3 and here we see that we have fib3 again and here we have fib3 again so we see that we have here a repetition or overlapping then here we have fib2 it will return 1 then for fib4 we will return 2 plus 1 is 3 so we solved this problem fib4 and here we see that we have again fib4 so we have overlapping sub problem the, the sub problem are overlapped and this is called overlapping sub problem when you find it overlapping sub problem we can apply dynamic programming here we call this function with 6 here we called this function with the number 6 if we call this number with 1 million then we'll have a plenty of repetition of function call here we see we have two repetition of this function call fib3 and here we see the sub problem overlapped here fib3 overlapped instead calling this function again and recomputing what we can do we can just store the result when we solve these sub problems 
in an array then we can use that data to to make our code efficient and we can we can read up reputation of function call and here we see fifth three fifth three fifth three the function call are overlapped and this is called overlapping sub problem this sub problem overlapped here fifth four fifth four overlapped and this is called overlapping sub problem when you find out overlapping sub problem we can apply dynamic programming to make code efficient now let's talk about overlapping substructure first let's see the definition then we'll see what does this means overlapping substructure implies that the optimal solution can be obtained from the optimal solution of its sub problem so optimal substructure is simply an optimal selection among all the possible substructures that can help to select the best structure of the same kind to exist again let's say we want to find out nth fibonacci number from fibonacci series this is the code and this is the recursive function call here we are breaking this problem into smaller problem so we break this problem into smaller problem here we see fib2 and here we see fib1 we cannot break this problem anymore now if we solve this problem efficiently that means optimally now here i want to ask you a question if i solved the sub problem efficiently or optimally can i solve the problem from the solution of its sub problem what is your answer i think you will say yes we can so here we have optimal substructure if we solve the sub problem optimally if we can solve our given problem by solving its sub problem optimally then we can say the problem has optimal substructure so here we have one and one so here we have fib2 and fib1 it will return one it will return one so it will return two then here it will return one then it will return three then this five here we have three so this three will return two because on the left and on the right we'll have one and here two plus three is five on the right here if we solved it we get here three so three plus five is eight so we can solve this problem by solving the sub problem if we can solve its a problem efficiently we can solve this problem so this problem has optimal substructure and this is called optimal substructure hope you have understood what is optimal substructure when you have overlapping sub problem or optimal substructure for a problem then you can apply dynamic programming in this section of this course we're going to be solving this seven dynamic programming problem fibonacci series longest increasing subsequent house rover mean path sum longest common subsequence zero one knapsack problem and regular expression massing we're going to solve this fibonacci series problem using top down and bottom up approach and the rest of the problem will be solving using a bottom up approach in the next video let's see what is top down approach then we'll see what is bottom up approach hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about top down approach what is top down approach first let's take an example this is our fibonacci series the first two numbers start with one then the next number is generated by adding the previous two number so one plus one is two two plus one is three three plus two is five five plus three is eight eight plus five is thirteen thirteen plus eight is twenty one and so on this is our code and this is the recursive function call now you might ask what is top down approach now you might ask what is top down approach in top down approach the algorithm start from top value and go to bottom is step to get our top value so what does this mean to find out the value of this function call we'll break this problem into smaller problem until we cannot break the smaller problem anymore so we're breaking this problem here five four three two and we cannot break this problem anymore and we cannot break this problem anymore so we'll solve this two problem first so it will return one it will return one and then this problem will return two so we're going top to bottom and then we're going up and this is called top down approach here for fib2 it will return one then it will return four if we solve this it will return two then for five it will return five then for this sub three we solved then it will return a three three plus five is eight so first we solved 
the smaller problem we're going top to bottom to get our top value and this is called top down approach hope you have understood what is a top down approach this is a divide and conquer algorithm we're just dividing the problem into smaller problem we're not optimizing this problem and here we're just showing you that top down approach so now let's optimize this problem using dynamic programming to solve this problem using dynamic programming we have to create a dynamic programming table if we're given a number six that means we have to find out the sixth Fibonacci number from Fibonacci series we have to create a dynamic programming table of length six plus one so seven here we have index from zero to six this is our code this is the dynamic programming table of length n plus one here we're checking if if the current value is not equal to zero then we'll return the value for our current number from dynamic programming table when you create an integer array in java programming language the array is filled with zero by default the default value is zero that's why we're checking if memo n is not equal to zero and here our recursive catch if n is greater than or equals to three then we'll call with fiv n minus one then n minus two and this is your base catch the base catch is for one and two for one it will return one and for two it will return one we'll not use this first three cell okay we can assume virtually we have here one we have here one we'll have here zero in fact virtually we can assume that we have here one and at the end we'll have our answer to the last cell now let's see how we can find out the value for fib six so here we're breaking this problem into smaller problem so this is the problem and here we cannot break this problem anymore this fib two will hit the base case it will return one and fib one it will return one so here we will return one plus one that is two for this fib three when it will return two for this function call we will insert at third index the value two right over here so let's insert here two we have here overlapping sub problem we will not repeat this overlapping sub problem anymore we will reduce the function call using this dynamic programming table now let's see how and here we have fib2 this is base case this will hit on base condition so 2 plus 1 is 3 so for this function call fib4 here at index 4 we will insert the value 3 let's insert here 3 now for fib5 what it will return on the left we have 3 on the right when it call with this function here we see that when it call with 3 it will check at the current cell current is 3 so at current cell we have 2 will not recompute it again okay will not recompute we don't have to go through all the function call right over here okay so we'll just return from dynamic programming table just 2 okay for 3 we have here 2 and we see that we don't have to recompute fib3 again we're just returning the value from our dynamic programming table this one function call get reduced okay so 2 plus 3 is 5 so 2 plus 3 is 5 and let's insert here 5 for this number 5 at index 5 okay then for this function call fib6 on the left we have fib5 for fib5 we have the value 5 now let's go to the right on the right we have to recompute this part okay to get the value of fib4 we have to first compute fib3 then fib2 then fib1 then fib2 again here at index 4 we already stored the value 3 and that's we solved here okay so we solved just once and then we're just reusing here we don't have to recompute this function call we'll directly return from our dynamic programming table that is 3 so we have here 3 so 3 plus 5 is 8 let's return 8 to this function call and let's insert here 8 we're done we'll just return here 8 and you say that we don't have to compute this function call if we have here huge number instead 6 if you're given a number 1000 2000 or even bigger number like 1 million then we'll have a lot of function repetition we have to call 
one functions a lot of times and that will reduce the efficiency of our code and that will treat terribly okay if we do not use a dynamic programming table then this solution will take exponential that means 2 to the power n but using dynamic programming this problem takes big o of n time complexity and big o of n space complexity but if we do not apply here dynamic programming the solution will take big of 2 to the power n that's the worst thing ever so we can reduce this exponential time complexity into linear time complexity using dynamic programming and here we have our answer at this cell of index 6 we'll just return this value 8 if we have a huge number we can apply this concept to reduce the time complexity from exponential to linear this is why dynamic programming came into the picture we're just storing our computed result then we will not recompute the result again and this is the advantage of dynamic programming this is called top-down approach hope you have understood what is top-down approach and what is the purposes of dynamic programming in the next video we're going to talk about a bottom-up approach see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about a bottom-up approach let's take an example this is our code to find out nth Fibonacci number in the previous video we talked about top-down approach now what is bottom-up approach if you look at this algorithm it actually starts from lower values then go to top if I want to find out the sixth Fibonacci number then what I'm going to do I'm going to calculate first number then second number then third all the way to up sixth number this techniques actually called bottom-up techniques so we'll start from lower values then we'll go up now let's see how it actually works this is our dynamic programming table and here output one equals to one at first cell we're going to insert one at second cell we're going to insert one then we'll start iterating from this cell and at this cell what are we going to do we're going to add the previous two cell the value at previous two cell one plus one is two to find out the value of this cell let's add the value on the previous two cell two plus one is three here what are doing we're starting from lower value one one then we're going up okay and then here two plus three equals to five then five plus three equals to eight and this is super easy and this is called a bottom of approach we're starting from lower value and then we're going to the upper value and this is called bottom of approach we're starting from bottom and then we're going up and this is called bottom of approach hope you have understood what is a bottom of approach and here we have code for bottom of approach hope you have understood what is bottom of approach and this solution will take big of n time complexity and it also takes big of n space complexity now I hope you have understood what is a top-down approach and what is a bottom-up approach of dynamic programming. For Fibonacci series problem, for normal cat it takes exponential time complexity. For db top-down it takes big of in space and time complexity. For db bottom-up approach it will takes big of in space and time complexity. For normal cats it was taking exponential time complexity and that's the worst thing ever now when to use top down and when to use bottom up now let's compare them for ease of algorithm top down approach is easy to come up with solution and for bottom up approach it's not so easy to come up with a solution for time efficiency top down is slow and bottom up is fast for space efficiency top down approach use stack internally for recursion called stack and for bottom-up approach we use we will use loof so there is no stack is used for both approach we have to use dynamic programming table for most cases so for space efficiency bottom-up approach is the winner we can say and when to use top-down and when to use bottom-up when you need a quick solution then we should consider top-down and when you need an efficient solution then we should choose bottom-up approach hope you have understood everything about top-down and bottom-up approach if you're not understanding what is top-down and bottom-up approach let us know thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video
hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to solve a coding interview question longest increasing subsequence given an integer array nums return the length of the longest strictly increasing subsequence a subsequent is a sequence that can be derived from an array by deleting some or no elements without changing the order of the remaining elements for example 3627 is a subsequent of the array 0316227 here we see we deleted 0 then 1 then any of the 2 okay and we get this subsequent and we have the order okay when we're talking about subsequence we're looking for a sequence that can be contiguous and also that can be non contiguous what is contiguous? Contiguous means first 10, then 9, then 2. And here 10, 9, 2 is contiguous. If we say 5, 7, 18, and that is not contiguous, and this is called non contiguous. So a subsequent can be contiguous and it also can be non contiguous. Now let's take some example. For example, if you are given this array as input, then you have to return the length of the longest strictly increasing subsequence. In this array, we have two strictly increasing subsequence, 2, 5, 7, 100, and 2, 5, 7, and 18. So we have to return the length of any of the longest increasing subsequence. So for this given array, we have to return 4 because the longest strictly increasing subsequent in this array is this two array so we have to return the length of this array and that is four so for this given array we have to return four if we are given this array as input then you have to find out the length of the longest strictly increasing subsequent the longest strictly increasing subsequent is this zero one two three so we have to return the length of this subsequent and this is the longest strictly increasing subsequent and the length of this subsequent is 4 so for this given input we have to return 4 now how we can approach this problem now let's talk about how we can solve this problem for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this array we can solve this problem in 2 to the power n time complexity and that's the worst solution and we will not talk about that in this video we're going to solve this problem in quadratic time complexity using dynamic programming. We'll use our intermediate results to solve this problem. Now let's create a dynamic programming table. This is our dynamic programming table. Initially, we'll fill up the first cell with one. Why is that? When you consider, when you consider this is our array of length one, here we have only one element. So we can assume that we have the longest strictly increasing subsequent of length 1. That's why we're inserting here 1. And we're going to use two pointer i and j. i will initially point to the second element and j will point to the first element and we'll have a max variable. Now we're gonna check this two value where i and j pointer is points to. Now we're gonna check does the value at j pointer is less than the value at i pointer? No. So let's move j to the next and j will point right here when j will point right here we'll stop because j and i is pointing to the same element now in that case what are we going to do we're going to insert max plus one to the corresponding cell of db programming table where i pointer is points to so let's insert here max plus one and that is one and let's move i to the next and j will always points to the first cell when you move z to the next now let's do the comparison does 10 is less than 2 no so let's move z to the next element does 9 is less than 2 no so let's move z to the next element z and i will point to the same element so we'll stop now we're going to insert to this cell max plus 1 and that is 1 so let's insert here 1 now let's move i to the next element and z to the first element now let's do the comparison does 10 is 
less than 5? No. So let's move 0 to the next. Does 9 is less than 5? No. So let's move 0 to the next. Now we see 2 is less than 5. When you found the value at J pointer is less than the value of I pointer, then we're going to get the value from a dynamic programming table where J pointer is points to, to the corresponding cell and we're going to get the maximum. So max of max and the value at the corresponding cell where j pointer is points to. The max of 0 and 1 is 1. So we're going to change this 0 to 1. So max equals to 1. Then let's move 0 to the next and j and i is pointing to the same cell. So we're going to, so we'll stop here and we're going to insert max plus 1 to this cell where i pointer is maps to. So let's insert here 2. And also we have to set our max to 0. Now let's move i to the next element and z to the first element. Now let's do the comparison. Does 10 is less than 3? No. So let's move z to the next. Does 9 is less than 3? No. So let's move z to the next. Now we see 2 is less than 3. Now what are we going to do? We're going to update the value of max variable. So we're going to find out the max. Maximum of max. So max is 0 and the value at is pointed to the corresponding cell to our dynamic programming table and that is 1. So max of 0 and 1 is 1. So let's update this value of max to 1. Now let's move 0 to the next. Does 5 is less than 3? No. So let's move 0 to the next. And now we see z and i is pointing to the same cell. So let's insert to this cell max plus 1. That is 2. And we have to reset max to 0. Now let's move i to the next and z to the first element. Now let's do the comparison. Does 10 is less than 7? No. So let's move z to the next element. Does 9 is less than 7? No. So let's move z to the next element. Does 2 is less than 7? Yes, it is. Now what are we going to do? We're going to update the value of max variable. Now what are we going to do? We're going to update the value of max variable. So maximum of max, max is 0 and the value at our corresponding position to dynamic programming table where j pointer is pointing is 1. So max of 0 and 1 is 1. So let's change this value to 1. Now let's move z to the next. Does 5 is less than 7? Yes, it is. So what are we going to do? We're going to update the value of max variable. So maximum of max, max is 1 and the value at the corresponding position to a dynamic programming table where j pointer is points to. And that is 2. So max of 1 and 2 is 2. So let's update this value 1 to 2. Now let's move z to the next element and that is 3. Does 3 is less than 7? Yes, it is. Now what are we going to do? We're going to update the value of max variable. So maximum of max and the value of z pointer in your dynamic programming table. So max is 2 and the value at this position to a dynamic programming table is 2. So max of 2 and 2 is 2. So this value of this variable max is unchanged. Now let's move z to the next element. And here we see z and i is point to the same element. So we'll do nothing here. Now we're going to insert here the value of max plus 1. So 2 plus 1 is 3. So let's insert here 3. And let's reset max variable to 0. Now let's move i to the next and z to the first element. Now let's do comparison. Does 10 is less than 100? Yes, it is. Now we're going to update the value of max variable. So maximum of max and the value in your dynamic programming table where j pointer is points to 1. So maximum of 0 and 1 is 1. So let's insert here 1. Now let's move z to the next element that is 9. Does 9 is less than 101? Yes, it is. So let's update the value of our max variable. So maximum of max that is 1 and this 1. So maximum of 1 and 1 is 1. So this value is unchanged. Now let's move there to the next element. Again, we see 2 is less than 101. So let's update the value of max variable. So maximum of max and this 1. So max of 1 and 1 is 1. This value is still unchanged. Now let's move there to the next element. 5 is less than 101. Now let's update the value of max variable. So maximum of max and the value here we have 2. So maximum of 1 and 2 is 2. So let's update this value 1 to 2. Now let's move z to the next element that is 3. 
3 is less than 101 so let's update the value of max variable so maximum of max and this value 2 because the pointer is maps to this 2 so maximum of 2 and 2 is 2 so this value is unchanged now let's move to the next element and that is 7 7 is less than 101 so let's update the value of max variable so maximum of max and the value here we have 3 so maximum of 2 and 3 is 3 so let's update this value 2 to 3 now let's move there to the next and now we see z and i is pointing to the same element so we're going to insert max plus 1 to this cell where i pointed is maps to so let's insert here max plus 1 that is 3 plus 1 4 and let's set this value to 0 now let's move i to the next element and z to the first element now let's do the comparison 10 is less than 18 so let's update the value of max so maximum of 0 and 1 is 1 so let's update this value to 1 then let's move z to the next 9 is less than 18 so let's update this value of max variable so maximum of max and 1 is 1 so this value is unchanged let's move z to the next 2 is less than 18 so let's update the value of max variable to so maximum of max and this one that is one so this value is still unchanged so let's move there to the next element 5 is less than 18 so maximum of max and the value here 2 so maximum of 1 and 2 is 2 so let's update this value 1 to 2 now let's move there to the next element here we see 3 is less than 18 so let's update the value of max variable so maximum of max and the value 2 so maximum of 2 and 2 is 2 so this value 2 is unchanged now let's move there to the next element now we see 7 is less than 18 so let's update the value of max variable maximum of max and 3 so maximum of 2 and 3 is 3 so let's update this value 2 to 3 now let's move z to the next element that is 101 101 is greater than 18 101 is not less than 18 so let's move z to the next and in this case z is points to the same element where i pointed is points to so we'll stop here and we're going to insert here 3 plus 1 and that is 4. in the next iteration i will point to the out of array boundary so we're done this is how we can solve this problem this is the intuition to solve this problem this is a dynamic programming problem we're using our intermediate result to solve this problem okay hope you have understood the intuition this solution will take big o of n square time complexity and big o of n square space complexity to construct our dynamic programming table answer to this question is the maximum value we have in this array we can scan this dynamic programming array for the maximum value and the maximum value we see four we have double four and we can get any of them we have here double four that means we have two strictly increasing subsequence that means we have two longest strictly increasing subsequence we can scan this dynamic programming table using a for loop or we can keep track our maximum element using a variable and that we'll see in our pseudocode and we'll not scan this dynamic programming table for our maximum value we'll keep track our maximum value during generating the dynamic programming table now let's see the pseudocode this is our pseudocode to solve this problem we have this function length of longest increasing subsequent l i s this function takes one parameter inside here we're checking if num.length equals to zero if the given array is empty then we'll return zero then we're constructing the dynamic programming table and we're inserting at the first position one uh, why we're inserting one we have talked about in the previous slide and then we have our answer equals to one initially because initially we have one element that means the first element okay the first element is a longest increasing subsequent we can consider that and that's why we're inserting it at the first cell one and then we're running a loop for i from zero to db dot length minus one and we have here a max variable and here for j from zero to i minus one if nums i is greater than nums j we'll find out our maximum maximum equals to maximum of answer 
and the value where j pointed is points to from dynamic programming table and then we're inserting up to the fall of max plus one and we're keep tracking our maximum value using this answer variable we don't have to scan our diffy array to find out the maximum value okay and at the end we're returning our answer this code will take big of n square time complexity for the worst case and it will take big of n space complexity to construct the dynamic programming table and we have here our array and we have our dynamic programming array we have constructed the dynamic programming table we don't want to waste your time i'm going to leave you the resource for you and i would suggest you to construct this dynamic programming table use the concept we used in the previous slide all right guys this is my solution to this problem hope you have understood this video explanation if you have any question if you have any suggestion or if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching i will see you in the next video hey guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to solve a dynamic programming problem house rubber you are a professional rubber planning to rub houses along a street each house has a certain amount of money the only constraint stopping you from rubbing is of them is that adjacent houses have security systems connected and it will automatically contact the police if two adjacent houses are broken into on the same night in this problem you are given an integer array nums representing the amount of money of each house return the maximum amount of money you can rob tonight without alerting the police for example if you are given this array in this array we have five elements each element indicates one house and in that particular house we have some amount of money and we have to rob in the house edge without alerting the police that means we cannot rob adjacent houses and we have to return the maximum amount of money if we rob at this house then we cannot rob to this house so if we rob at this house too then nine then one if we rob at this house seven then we can rob at three and here we see that if we rob at two then at nine and then at one the maximum value we can get 12. if we rob at seven then the value we will get that means the money we will get 10. so here we have to return 12. without robbing at the adjacent houses we can made 12 dollars if we consider if we consider the given number as a dollar so if we're given this array we have to return 12. let's take another example for example if you're given this array as input then what is the maximum amount you can rub from this array so first we'll rub at 7 then we'll rub at 30 then we'll rub at 4. here we see that we're rubbing at 30 then we're not rubbing at the adjacent houses that's okay here we see that we can rub at this house too instead of rubbing at 2 we're rubbing at 4. if you rub at 2 then we'll have less money that's why we're skipping this house the maximum money you can rub 41 for this given array 7 plus 30 plus 4 equals to 41 so if we're given this array we have to return 41. now let's take another example for example if you're given this array as input what is the maximum money you can rub without rubbing at the adjacent houses first we'll rub at 20 then we'll rub at 13 then we'll rub at 40. so the maximum money you can rub from this array is 73. 40 plus 13 plus 20 equals to 73. so if we're given this array we have to return 73. first we'll rub at this house where we have money 20 then we'll rub at here we'll get the money 13 then we'll rub at here we'll get the money 40. so we'll return 73 for this given array now how we can solve this problem we're going to solve this problem using dynamic programming we know that for dynamic programming problem we can use top down approach or we can use a bottom up approach in this video we're going to see how to solve this problem for a bottom up approach we're not going to talk about top down approach we can use top down approach as well 
Now let's see how we can solve this problem using bottom up approach. For sake of understanding, let's say we're given this array. In this problem, we're going to use a bottom up approach to solve this problem. First, let's create a dynamic programming table. This is the dynamic programming table. We know that in bottom up approach, we'll not break our problem into smallest problem. Instead, we'll start solving the smallest problem, then we'll go up. Let's see how we can solve this problem. At first cell, maximum money we can rub that is 2. For the second cell, we have two choices. By rubbing at this house and by not rubbing at this house. If we rub at this house, the maximum money we can rub 7. If we do not rub at this house, the maximum money we can rub 2. We'll just copy from the left cell. So the maximum of 7 and 2 is 7. So we'll insert here 7. Now we have solved this problem for this part. Now let's populate the value for this cell. Here we have 9. Our first choice is if we rub at this house 9, the maximum money we can rub 9 plus 2. We'll skip the one cell because we cannot rub at adjacent house. So we'll just skip this house and we'll add, we'll add 2 to 9. So 11. 9 plus 2 is 11. And if we do not rub at this house, the maximum money we can drop 7. So maximum of 11 and 7 is 11. So let's insert here 11. At this point, we have solved the problem for this subarray. Now let's populate the value for this cell. If we drop at this house 3, the maximum value we can. If we drop at this house 3, if we drop at this house, the maximum money we can drop 3 plus 7. That is 10. If we do not drop at this house, the maximum value. If we do not rove at this house 3, if we do not, if we do not rove at this house 3, the maximum money we can rove, that is 11, we'll copy from the left cell. So maximum of 10 and 11 is 11. So let's insert here 11. We have already solved this problem for the left portion, so we don't have to worry about the value on the left cell. Now at this point, we have solved this problem for this summary. At this point, we have solved this problem for this summary. Now let's populate the value for this cell. If we rub at this house, the maximum money we can rub 1 plus 11, that is 12. If we do not rub at this house, the maximum money we can rub 11, we'll copy from the left cell. So maximum of 11 and 12 is 12. So let's insert here 12 and this is the answer. So if we're given this array we have to return 12. This is how we can solve this problem. For better understanding, let's take another example. Let's say we're given this array and this is our dynamic programming table. At first cell, the maximum money we can rub 6. For second cell, the maximum money we can rub the maximum of first cell and the maximum of second cell and that is 7. So let's insert here 7. Now let's populate the value for this cell. We have solved this problem for the left subarray. Now let's populate the value for this cell. For this cell, we have to try it. If we rub at this house, the maximum value we can rub 1 plus 6 by skipping one house because we cannot because we cannot rub at adjacent house. So 1 plus 6 is 7. And if we do not rub at this house, the maximum money we can drop 7 will copy from the left. So max of 7 and 7 is 7. So let's insert here 7. So we have solved this problem for this left summary. First we're solving the smaller problem, then we're going up. Now let's populate the value for this cell. By rubbing at this house, the maximum money we can generate 30 plus 7. 37. By not rubbing at this house, the maximum money we can drop 7. So maximum of 7 and 37 is 37. So let's insert here 37. So we have solved this problem for this summary. At this point, the maximum money we can drop 37. So what we understood, we understood that if we consider this is our summary, the maximum money we can drop 6. If we consider this is our summary, the maximum money we can drop 7. If we consider this is our summary, the maximum money we can drop 7. And if we consider this is our 
Savory, the maximum money we can draw 37. Now let's populate the value for this cell. If we draw at this house 8, the maximum money we can draw 8 plus 7, that is 15. If we do not draw at this house, the maximum money we can draw 37. So max of 37 and 15 is 37. So let's insert here 37. So at this far, we find out the maximum money we can draw 37. Now let's populate the value for this cell. If we rove at this house 2, the maximum money we can rove 2 plus 37, that is 39. Here we're skipping the one house because we cannot rove at adjacent house. So 39, if we do not rove at this house, the maximum money we can rove 37. So maximum of 37 and 39 is 39. So let's insert here 39. Now let's populate the value for this cell. If we rove at this house 4, the maximum money we can rove 4 plus 37, that is 41. If we do not rove at this house, the maximum money we can rove 39. So maximum of 41 and 39 is 41. So we'll insert here 41. So if we are given this array, we have to return 41. This solution will take big of n time complexity because we are traversing the given array once from left to right and it will also take big of n space complexity because we are constructing the dynamic programming table of length n. Now let's take another example for even more better understanding. Let's say we're given this array. Let's create dynamic programming table. This is our DP table. At first cell, let's insert 20 because here we have only one choice. If we rove at this house, the maximum money we can rove 20. Now for this cell, if we rove at this house, the maximum money we can rove 5. If we do not rove at this house, the maximum money we can rove 20. So maximum of 20 and 5 is 20. So let's insert here 20. So we have solved this problem for this subarray. Now for this house, if we rove at this house, the maximum money we can rove 20 plus 1. That is 21. If we do not rove at this house 1, the maximum money we can rove 20. So maximum of 21 and 20 is 21. So let's insert here 21. So we have solved this problem for this subarray. For this cell, if we rove at this house 13, the maximum money we can rove 13 plus 20, that is 33. If we do not rove at this house, then the maximum money we can rove 21. So maximum of 33 and 21 is 33. We have solved this problem for this summary. Now let's populate the value for this cell. If we rove at this house, the maximum money we can rove 6 plus 21, 27. If we do not rove at this house, the maximum money we can rove 33. So maximum of 27 and 33 is 33. So let's insert here 33. Now let's populate the value for this cell. If we rove at this house, the maximum money we can rove 11 plus 33, that is 44. If we do not rove at this house, the maximum money we can draw 33. So maximum of 33 and 44 is 44. Now this is our final cell. Here we will have our answer. If we draw at this house the maximum money we can draw 40 plus 33 that is 73. If we do not draw at this house the maximum money we can draw 44. So maximum of 73 and 44 is 73. And here we see that we rove at this house 20, at this house 13, and at this house 40. So 40 plus 13 plus 20 equals to 73. And here we find out 73. And this is how we can solve this problem. Hope you have understood how bottom of solution works. This is bottom of approach. We're solving the smallest problem first and then we're going up. Now let's see how we can solve this problem using pseudocode. This is the pseudocode to solve this problem. This is the function rove. It takes the given array's input. Here we are checking if nums equals to null 
or if the length of the given array is 0 then we are returning 0 if the length is 1 then we will have only one element and we are returning that element if the length of the given array is 2 then we are returning the maximum of 2 if not we are creating dynamic programming table then here we are inserting at the first cell the first value and at the second cell the maximum of first cell and second cell then we are running a loop for i from 2 to the length of the array minus 1 that means we are starting from index 2 all the way to the end then we are populating the value for dynamic programming table maximum of here we have the condition if we rove at current numsci plus dp i minus 2 we are adding the current element and then we are skipping one element on the left if we are not roving at the current hout then we are copying the value from the left at the end we will have our answer at the last cell in our dynamic programming table now let's see how let's say we are given this array and this is our dynamic programming table first we are inserting 2 then the maximum of first and second and that is 7 then for this cell here we are applying this formula nums i plus dp i minus 2 9 plus 2 that is 11 and just 7 so maximum of 11 and 7 is 11 here what we are doing here we are considering if we if we drove at this house then we are adding 9 plus by skipping the one element on the left 2 so 9 plus 2 is 11 if we drove at this house the man we can draw of 11 if we do not draw at this house then we're copying from the left and this is what we're doing here then for this cell 3 plus 7 10 and 11 that is 11 maximum of 10 and 11 is 11 then for this cell if we draw at this house 1 plus 11 that is 12 and here we have 11 so here we'll insert 12 and this is our answer this is how we can solve this problem this is a bottom-up dynamic programming problem. We can solve this problem using top-down approach, but for now, we're solving this problem using a bottom-up approach. And this is how bottom-up approach work. The solution takes pig of n time complexity where n is the length of the given array. And it also takes pig of n space complexity to construct the dynamic programming table. Hope you have understood this video explanation. If you have an issue understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to solve a dynamic programming problem, minimum path sum. Given a m by n matrix filled with non-negative numbers, find a path from top left to bottom right which minimizes the sum of all numbers along its path. Note that you can only move either down or right at any point in time. Now let's see some example. For example, you are given this matrix. If you are given this matrix, you have to start from this top left cell and you have to visit the bottom right cell such that it minimizes the number of sums along its path. We can go right or bottom from any cell okay from this cell we can go right and bottom from this cell we can go bottom or right from this cell we can go right or bottom so we have here two directions we can go right or we can go bottom and we have to find out a path from top left to bottom right such that the numbers along each path has a minimum sum so what does this mean if we visit this one something like this first one then four then two then one one plus one plus four plus two eight plus one nine so in this path the summation of the numbers along its path is nine in this matrix the minimized path sum is this path one plus three plus one four plus one five plus one six and this is the path where we have the minimum path sum. So if we are given this matrix, we have to return 6. Now let's take another example. For example, if you are given this matrix, you have to start from this top left cell. Then you have to visit the bottom right cell. 
Now we have to find out a path from this top left cell to bottom right cell such that the sum of numbers along its path is minimum. So what is the minimum path? We can go from 1 to 3, then 2, then 2, then 3, then 1, then 2. Or we can go from 1 to 3, to 5, to 4, to 5, to 1, to 2. But we have to find out the minimum path sum. So which is the minimum path sum for this matrix? So what is the minimum path? So what is the path that has minimum path sum? For this matrix, the minimum path sum is this path. For this matrix, the minimum path sum, let's find out the path. Here we have this path. 1, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, then 2. And the path sum is 13. 1 plus 3 plus 1 is 5 plus 2, 7 plus 3, 10 plus 1, 11 plus 2, 13. So for this given matrix, we have to return the minimum path sum 13. Now how we can solve this problem? This is a dynamic programming problem. We can solve this problem using top down approach or bottom up approach. In this video, I'm going to solve this problem using a bottom up approach. First we'll solve the smallest problem, then we'll go up. First we'll solve the smaller problem, then we'll slowly get into the bigger problem. Now let's see how we can solve this problem. For sake of understanding, let's assume we are given this matrix. And first, what are we going to do? We are going to create a dynamic programming table. First thing, what are we going to do? We are going to find out the path sum for the first row, then for the first column. Let's find it out. For this cell, we'll just copy the value from this cell. So let's insert here 1. Then here, we are going to add 1 plus 3, that is 4. Then for this cell, 1 plus 4, okay, that is 5. So for this cell, the value is 5. Now let's find out the path sum for first column. So 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 4 is 6. Here we can do this using 2 for loop, and that's super simple. And we'll see that how we can do this when we'll go through our pseudo code. Now we'll start iterating from this, we'll start iterating from this cell all the way to the end. That means from this cell to this cell. We'll start from this cell and we'll end up with this cell. And here we'll have our answer. This is our current cell. Now what are we going to do? We're going to find out the minimum value on the top and on the left. So the minimum of top and left is 2 here, right? So on the top we have 4, on the left we have 2. So the minimum is 2, 2 plus 5 is 7. So let's insert here 7. Now for this cell, we have the value 1, so the minimum of left and top is 5. 5 plus 1 is 6. Let's insert here 6. Then here we have 2. The minimum of 7 and 6 is 6. 6 plus 2 is 8. Then the minimum of 6 and 8 is 6. 6 plus 1 is 7. This is our answer. If we're given this matrix, we have to return 7. And this is how we can solve this problem. For better understanding, let's take another example. Let's say we're given this matrix, we have to find out the minimum path from this cell to this cell. And this is our dynamic programming table. First, let's find out the path sum for the first row and for the first column. So for this cell, 1, for this cell, 3 plus 1 is 4, for this cell, 4 plus 5 is 9, for this cell, 9 plus 1 is 10. Now for first column, 1 plus 3 is 4, 4 plus 1 is 5. Then 5 plus 4 is 9. We can do this using to follow for first row and for first column. Now we're going to start iterating this matrix from this cell all the way to the end of this matrix. We'll stop right here and here we'll have our answer. This is our current element. Now let's find out the minimum on the top and on the left. Minimum of 4 and 4 is 4. 4 plus 2 is 6. The minimum of 9 and 6 is 6 and the current element is 4. So 4 plus 6 is 10. Our current element is 5. The minimum of top and left is 10. 10 plus 5 is 15. Now here, if you are said, you have to visit this cell, the last cell of row 2 from 
the top left cell the minimum path sum is 15 now this is our current element the minimum of top and left is 5 5 plus 2 is 7 the minimum of top and left is 7 and here we have current 3 so 7 plus 3 is 10 the minimum of top and left is 10 and current is 1 so 1 plus 10 is 11 and this is our current element the minimum of top and left is 7 7 plus 3 is 10 then this is our current element the minimum of top and left is 10 10 plus 5 is 15 then our final cell here we'll have our answer minimum of top and left is 11 and the current element is 2 so 11 plus 2 is 30 and this is our answer so if we're given this matrix we have to return 30. the solution will take big of m n time complexity where m is the number of row and n is the number of column for the given matrix and the solution also takes big of m n space complexity for the dynamic programming table we can solve this problem in flat then it will take constant space complexity and we will add the code for in flat solution but for explanation we will use dynamic programming table the auxiliary matrix now let's see how we can solve this problem using pseudocode this is our pseudocode to solve this problem this is function mean path sum this function takes the given matrix as input then we're calculating the height and width then we're creating dynamic programming table and at the first cell that means to the top left cell we're just copying the value from matrix top left cell then we're filling out the first column using this formula and then we're filling out the first row then we'll start iterating from one to the height and here we have z from one to the width and then here we're applying this formula minimum of top and left and the current and at the end we'll have our answer to the right most cell of the dynamic programming table or in the matrix if we do in pledge let's say we're given this matrix and here we're going to create a dynamic programming table this is our dynamic programming table so first we're going to copy the first value then we're going to populate the first column using this formula so here we're starting from 1 so 1 plus 3 is 4 4 plus 1 is 5 5 plus 4 is 9 then for the first row 3 plus 1 is 4 then 5 plus 4 is 9 then 9 plus 1 is 10 so the max of 4 and 4 is 4 4 plus 2 is 6 using this formula then for 4 6 plus 4 is 10 then 10 plus 5 is 15 then 5 plus 3 is 7 then 7 plus 3 the minimum of 10 and 7 is 7 so 7 plus 3 is 10 then minimum of 10 and 15 is 10 10 plus 1 is 11 then minimum of 9 and 7 is 7 7 plus 3 is 10 now minimum of 10 and 10 is 10 so 10 plus 5 is 15 the minimum of 11 and 15 is 11 11 plus 2 is 13 so for this given matrix we'll return this 11 13 by this written statement so for this given matrix we have to return 13 and the solution takes big of m in time complexity where m is the number of row and n is the number of column and it will also takes big of m in space complexity for this dynamic programming table or we can solve this problem in flat by modifying this array by modifying the matrix itself and then it will takes constant space complexity all right guys this is the bottom of approach of dynamic programming for min path sum problem hope you have understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching i'll see you in the next video welcome to the coding interview question longest common subsequence here's the problem statement you're given two strings text one and text two return the length of their longest common subsequence a subsequent of a string is a new string generated from the original string with some characters deleted without changing the relative order of the remaining characters all right a common subsequent of two string is a subsequent that is common to both strings the input string consists of lowercase english characters only 
if there is no common subsequent then we have to return zero all right and this is our overall problem statement now let's see some examples if you are given this two string here we see this two string share the character a then it share the character b then it share the character c all right so the longest common subsequence for this two string is a b c and the length of the longest common subsequent is 3. When you see the word subsequent, then it could be any sequence of the character. It don't have to be contiguous, but it may be contiguous. Here we see it contiguous, right? Now let's see some more examples. If you're given these two strings, then we see this two string share the character A, then we see it share the character D, and then we see it share the character A's. In this case, we see the longest common subsequent is 3, A, D, H, and here A, D, H. So we see here, this is not a contiguous. If we have this two string, then we see this two string share the character A, then it share this character B, then it share the character E, then it share the character F. So the longest common subsequent for this two string is A, B, E, F. So the length of the longest common subsequent is 4. Now let's see how we can find longest common subsequent. To solve this problem, we're going to use dynamic programming. All right. Now let me walk through the intuition to this problem. Here we have our pseudo code. First, I'm going to declare a function longest common subsequent that takes two string, string one and string two. For testing purpose, let's assume string one equals to A, B, C, D, E, F and strings2 equals to a c b e f d okay then we're going to convert this two string into a character array okay then we're going to construct a dynamic programming table all right this is our dynamic programming table then we're going to initialize a variable with zero and this variable will hold our answer then we have here two loop and this loop will start iterating from this box and it will stop when it reached at this box. Then we have this condition. If we see two character match, then we're gonna copy the value from diagonal. If not, then we're going to get the max from top or from left. And then if we found a value at current index is greater than the answer, then we're gonna change the answer to that value. At the end, we're going to return the answer. Okay, now let's fill out this dynamic programming table. And we're going to fill out this dynamic programming table in bottom-up approach. All right, so we have your empty string and empty string. So empty string and empty string is a match. But the length of the longest common subsequent for empty string and empty string is zero. Then we have your character A. The longest common subsequent for character A and empty string is zero. Now the longest common subsequent for AV and empty string is zero. Then we have AVC and empty string. Then longest common subsequent of ABC and empty string is zero. Then longest common subsequent for AB B, C, D is 0 also for this two box on this row. Okay, now let's fill out the value for this 0th column. All right, so here we have empty string and A. So the length of longest common subsequent for empty string and A is 0, and for empty string and A, C, 0, for empty string and A, C, B, 0, for empty string and A, C, B, E, 0, and for empty string and A, C, B, E, F, 0, and also for empty string and a c b e f t is zero okay we fill up the zeroth row and zeroth column now let's populate the value for the rest of the boxes now we see here a and a and that is match so this condition will run so diagonal value plus one and that is one so here it should be one then we see we have a and b and that is not a match so then we're going to copy the max from top or left so in this case the max of 0 and 1 is 1 then we see a and c is not a match so max of 0 and 1 is 1 okay then we see a and d is not a match so max of 0 and 1 is 1 and same for this two all right now we see here a and c is not a match so max of this top or this left is 1 
then b and c is not a match so max of one and one is one all right then we see c and c that is match so the diagonal value plus one so one plus one is two then we see d and c is not a match in that case we're going to get the max for top and left so top one and left two the max of one and two is two so here it should be two also c and e is not a match so max of one and two is two then here we see f and c not a match so so max of one and two is two all right then a and b so we see a and b is not a match so max of top or left and that is one then we see b and b is a match so diagonal value plus one so we have here one plus one so two then c and b is not a match so max of two and two is two then we see d and b is not a match so max of two and two is two we see e and b is not a match so max of two and two is two then we have f and b so this is not a match max of two and two is two all right then here we have a and e so this is not a match so max of one and zero is one then we see b and e is not a match so max of 2 and 1 is 2 then c and e is not a match max of 2 and 2 is 2 we see d and e is not a match so max of 2 and 2 is 2 all right at this position we see e and e match so the diagonal value plus 1 and that is 3 then f and e is not a match so max of 2 and 3 is 3 now we see a and f is not a match so max of 1 and 0 is 1 then we see b and f is not a match so max of 2 and 1 is 2 then we see c and f is not a match max of 2 and 2 is 2 okay in this case we see we have d and f so this is not a match so max of 2 and 2 is 2 then we see e and f is not a match so max of 3 and 2 is 3 then f and f is a match so diagonal value plus one so four here then we have a and d is not a match so max of one and zero is one then we see b and d is not a match so max of two and one is two then we see c and d is not a match max of two and two is two all right so we see d and d is a match so diagonal value plus one so two plus one is three then we see e and d is not a match so max of two and three is three then f and d is not a match so max of 4 and 3 is 4 all right and this is our answer okay we can have here instead this answer this code so that will return this value okay so if you use this return here then you can just remove this if statement and this answer variable don't worry you can use any of them so we found the answer that is 4 now how we can find the longest common subsequence we found here the length. We can get the longest common substring from this dynamic programming table. First, we see here this 4 is coming from the top. When you see a value is coming from the top, that means this d is not the part of our longest common substring. All right, then here we see this 4 is coming from this 3. When we get a value from diagonal, the string will contain in our subsequence. All right, then we see this 3 is also coming from this diagonal because this e and this e is same so in this case the e also in our subsequence okay then we see this 2 is not coming from the diagonal it could be from left or from top so let's go to left all right then we see this 2 is clearly coming from the top or from left so here let's go to left all right and here we see this 2 is coming from the diagonal because the character b and b are the same so here diagonal when you have diagonal then we'll include that character and that is b all right and here we see this is coming from the top all right and then we see this is coming from the diagonal when you have diagonal then we get a that's how we can get the longest common subsequent a b e f all right we see here we have different switch so we can go to any of the directions okay at this place we have the character e and f instead going to the left if we go to top let's see what's happened so if we go top all right here we see this two is coming from the left so this two is coming from the diagonal okay because this character c and c are the same so this will be in our answer so let's add your c okay so we see this character one and that is coming from the left all right and we see this one is coming from the diagonal so a will be in our answer so in this case we get the longest common subsequent a c e f so we see in this string we might have different longest common substring but the length of the longest common substring is four and we might have here couple up longest common substring with length four okay so 
that's how we can solve this problem this is the intuition to this problem and that's how we can solve this problem using dynamic programming in bottom up approach okay this solution will take bigger of m in time complexity where m is the length of the first string and n is the length of the second string it also takes space complexity big of m in to construct this dynamic programming table where m is the length of the first string and n is the length of the second string hope this concept was clear if you have any question if you have any doubt if you have any suggestion let me know thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video till then take care welcome to this video in this video we're going to solve a coding interview question 01 nav check problem here's the problem statement you're given weight and values of n items put these items in a nav check of capacity w to get the maximum total value in the nav check all right if you're given these four items with weight and values and total weight seven now we have to pick item from this set such that some of their value is maximum and some of their weight is equals to or less than the total weight now how we can solve this problem to solve this problem we're going to use dynamic programming okay before that what does this 01 means 01 means either you pick the item or you don't pick the item but you can't split the item 0 mean you don't pick the item 1 mean you pick the item all right now let me give you the inside intuition to this problem okay here we have our pseudo code first i'm going to declare a function nav check that takes val weight and total weight as input all right for testing purpose we have these two array for val and for weight and we're given total weight equals to seven all right then we're going to construct a dynamic programming table all right this is our dynamic programming table here we have val then we have weight and here we have zero to seven weight and this is the site of our nav check we can store seven weight in our nav check so we have here from zero to seven and here we have index then we have these two loops this loop will iterate through from this starting box until it reached at this box all right then we have this if condition if i equals to zero or j equals to zero then we're going to insert just zero so first it will fill up this row okay and in this row we'll have the value zero because if we have the total weight in your nav check is zero then if we have zero weight and zero values then we can insert here zero right if we have one total weight then we can have zero value here because we have here zero weight all right we'll feel that then we have else if if the current total weight let's consider this and this three okay when we fill up this box we see here this condition is true because this weight is less than or equals to the total weight in this case okay then we have here two choice the first choice is what we can do best by selecting this weight and the second choice is that what we can do best without selecting this weight three so that's what we're doing here then if not we're going to copy the value from the top at the end we're going to return whatever value we have at this position all right now let's see how we can fill this dynamic programming table we're going to use bottom-up approach to fill up this dynamic programming table all right first we have here zero weight and here also you have zero weight and value zero so the value for all the box set for this zeroth row will be zero okay so for each iteration of this i it will fill up this column right for sake of understanding i'm going to fill up right now so here also we'll have zero if we have total weight of zero then if we have item zero so we'll have here zero okay here if we have the size of a nap check weight zero then we can't put any more items here so the value will be zero here all right now here we see one and one so this condition is match so we have a two choice the first choice is that so what i can do best by selecting weight one all right so one plus here one is the value for this weight one plus by subtracting this one from the total weight we are left with zero 
so we have here for top row at total weight zero we have your zero so one plus zero okay the second choice we have here without selecting weight one so without selecting weight one we have here zero on the top so max up one and zero is one so here we will have one okay then we have here two and one total weight is two and this weight is one okay here also we have two choice what we can do best here by selecting this weight one value we have here one and now let's subtract this weight from this total weight so we are left with one so at one we have here zero so one plus zero is one and if we do not select the weight one then we can do best is zero so max of zero and one is one okay so we have here three and one what we can do best by selecting the weight one and that is one plus by subtracting this weight from this weight that is two so here we have zero so zero plus one is one and then without selecting this weight one we can do best zero so max of one and zero is one okay here we have four and one so this condition is match here what we can do best by selecting this weight one and that is one plus by subtracting this weight from this weight we're left with three so for three we have here zero so one plus zero is one and without selecting this weight we have here zero so max of one and zero is one okay then we have five and one all right so this condition again match then what i can do by selecting this weight one so one plus five minus one is four so here we have zero so one plus zero and the best we can do without selecting this weight one that is zero so max of one and zero is one okay similarly the value for these two boxes will be one okay here we have one and three so the total weight is less than this weight if we have the total weight upon next step is one then we can't store there three weights right so this condition is false then we're gonna copy from the top okay then it will be one from here all right then we see two and three so again we're gonna copy the value from the top all right now we see three and three is equal so this condition is true then what we can do best by selecting the weight three that is we have value for weight three is four okay now by subtracting this weight from the total weight we're left with zero weight so for zero weight we have here zero so four plus zero and what i can do best without selecting this weight three and that is one so max of four and one is four and this is how it work okay let's insert here four now we see four is greater than this weight so here we have two to it by selecting this weight three we can do best four plus then we're left with here one weight because four minus three is one so here we have one so four plus one and that is five and without selecting this weight best we can do that is one so max of four plus one is five so max of five and one is five then we have here five and three so by selecting this weight three best we can do the value here we have four and by subtracting this weight from the total weight that is two so for two we have here one then without selecting this weight three best we can do that is one so max of five and one is one and this is how it work so let's insert here five okay now we see six and three so total weight is greater than this weight so this condition is true in this case we have two choice first choice by selecting this weight three best we can do four plus six minus three that is three so for three we have here one and by not selecting this weight three we have one so max of five and one is five all right then we have here seven and three so this condition is again true then we have here two choice what we can do best by selecting this weight three that is four and three minus seven is four so here for four we have one so four plus one is five best we can do without selecting this weight three and that is one so max of five and one is five okay now we see we have four and one so this will run this else condition so it will copy this value from here to here all right then also it will copy this value one to here and also this will copy this value from here to here okay so now we see four and four that is match so what is the best we can do by selecting this weight four that is five and we're left with by subtracting this four from this four is zero so for zero we have here zero 
so 5 plus 0 and what the best we can do without selecting this 084 and that is also 5 so max of 5 and 5 that is 5 and this is how it works all right so let's insert here 5 okay now we see 5 and 4 this condition is true so what is the best we can do by selecting this weight that is 5 and then by subtracting this 4 from this 5 we're left with weight 1 so that is 1 here let's add here 1 without selecting this weight best we can do that is 5 so max of 6 and 5 is 6 let's insert here 6 then we have here 6 and 4 all right so in this case we have two choice by selecting this weight 4 best we can do is that 5 plus then subtract this 4 from the 6 we're left with 2 so so for 2 we have here 1 so 5 plus 1 is 6 and here we have 5 without selecting this weight best we can do is 5 so max of 6 and 5 is 6 okay here we see 7 and 4 so this condition is true then here we have two choice first choice by selecting this weight best we can do 5 plus let's subtract this 4 from 7 that is 3 so the value we have for 3 we have here 4 so 5 plus 4 is 9 and without selecting this weight best we can do that is 5 so max of 9 and 5 is 9 so let's insert here 9 okay now for this box we see this total weight is less than this weight so this else condition will run so it will copy the value from the top and here it also true this else condition so let's insert here 1 and it will also copy this value from here that is 4 and also it will copy this value 5 here okay now we have 5 and 5 so this else if condition is true now we have here 2 choice by selecting this weight 5 best we can do 7 plus 5 minus 5 that is 0 so we have here also 0 so 7 plus 0 without selecting this weight best you can do that is 6 so max of 6 and 7 is 7 then we have here total weight 6 and weight 5 so by selecting this weight best we can do 7 plus let's subtract this 5 from 6 so we have 1 so 7 plus 1 is 8 and best we can do without selecting this weight 5 that is 6 so max of 8 and 6 is 8 all right now we are at this final position here we'll have our answer okay now let's calculate it we have here 7 and 5 so this else condition is true here we have again two choice first choice is that by selecting this weight 5 best we can do 7 plus now let's subtract this 5 from 7 that is 2 so we have here 1 for 2 total weight okay so we have here 7 plus 1 that is 8 and without selecting this weight 5 best we can do that is 9 so max of 8 and 9 is 9 okay so here our answer should be this 9 and it will return 9 okay so that's how we can solve this problem now how we can find the actual items with that we get this answer 9 now let's find out first we see this 9 is coming from the top when we see a value coming from top that means the item is not included in our answer list now we see this 9 is not coming from the top so this weight will be in our answer list so here weight and 5 is value okay now by subtracting this 4 from the 7 we get 3 right so for upper row 0 1 2 3 and this is 4 and we see this is not coming from the top so this weight is included in our answer list so weight 3 and value 4 we clearly see that this 4 is not coming from the top okay now by subtracting this 3 from the total weight we get 0 so for 0 at this row we have 0 right so for this weight 1 we have no item selected because here we have total weight is 0 so at the end we get these two items weight 4 and value 5 and weight 3 and value 4 and we see that the sum of their value is maximum when we have total weight of 7. The solution will take big of a main time complexity or m equals to length of the value array and n equals to max weight. It also takes space complexity big of a main to construct this dynamic programming table or m equals to length of the value array and n equals to max weight. Hope this concept was clear. If you have any question, if you have any doubt, if you have any suggestion, let me know. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video. Till then, take care. In this video, I'm going to talk about a coding interview question, a regular expression massing. Here's the problem statement given an input string H and a pattern P. Implement a regular expression massing with support dot and asterisk. Here, dot means message any single character 
asterisk means message zero or more of the preceding character that means message zero or more character that we have before asterisk the massing should be cover the entire input string not partial string is can be empty and contains only lowercase character a to z p could be empty and contains only lowercase character a to z and characters like dot or asterisk now let's look at some examples we already saw this right dot means message and a single character asterisk means message zero or more of the character that we have before pattern here we have on the left side pattern and on the right side string and for pattern a it message only the string a and it doesn't match a a a b or a a a and for a dot b it message a c b a b b a x b but it doesn't match a b a b y b a how does this match work here dot means any single character we have dot in between a and b so we can have any single character in between a and b here we have c in between a and b here we have b in between a and b and here we have x in between a and b so this three string message the pattern now for this pattern a asterisk b it match b a b a a b a a a a b but it doesn't match a or a c b or a d b how does this work asterisk means message zero or more of the preceding character we have the preceding character here a right it's saying that here message zero or more of this character a so here we have b so here we see a appears zero times so it's true then we have a b a can be appears zero or more here we see a appears once so it's true and for this string a appears twice so it's also two and for this string a appears four times so it's also true but for this string this pattern doesn't match then we have here dot asterisk dot asterisk match all string right every string here we have a b b a b b d d c g whatever string we have it will match everything now let's see how does this work we know that dot means any single character right and asterisk mean zero or more of the preceding character here we have preceding character dot so dot means any single character and dot can be zero times or more times here we have dot asterisk and for this a b and b a we have two dot because dot can be zero times or more times whenever we see asterisk after dot now this dot match the first a and this dot match this b so it's a match b a so here this first dot match b and the second dot match a and dot means any single character all right and we take here six dot for this string b b d d c c and the first dot match b second dot match c third dot match this d fourth dot match this d fifth dot match this c and six dot match this c so it's a match right frankly speaking dot asterisk match everything and here how it work right and here c asterisk a asterisk b it match c b because c can appears zero times or more times a can appears zero times times here we see c appears once and a appears zero times and b here we have at the end so it's a match b for the string c and a appears zero times 
and here C A B C and A appears once and for this string C appears to it A appears to it and we must need to have B at the end and it match but C A it not match because we should have at the end B A B B so it's not a match we should have at the end B and here we have A right but this is not a match because you have here b c x a b here it matches this c at the end we have b but in between c and b we have x and a so this is a unmatch and for the last it calls a asterisk b dot asterisk y here we have b y it's a match why here in the strings a appears zero times and b appears once and dot asterisk means zero times or more times of dot so in this case zero times dot that means nothing so b y it's a match a b y here a appears once then we have b then we have y and dot asterisk as you know dot asterisk it can match everything or nothing then we have a a b y a appears twice then we have b then we have here y here we have a y this is unmatched because we must need to have b and y at the end and also a at b and also this string is not a match all right now i think you understood how this match works all right now write a function is underscore match that takes a string and a pattern as input and this function should return true or false if the pattern matches the strings then this function should return true if the pattern does not match the strings then it should return false this function calls should return true because the pattern matches the strings so it should return true this function calls should return true also because this pattern matches the string and for this function calls we should return false because this pattern does not match these strings all right now i'm going to solve this problem using dynamic programming here's how my solution might look like first i'm going to declare a function is underscore match that takes a string and a pattern then we're going to construct a dynamic programming table and here we have s dot length plus one and p dot length plus one. If we consider a dot asterisk b a pattern and a x y b a string, then the dynamic programming table will be look like this. Okay, this is our table t. Now here we have empty string and here we have empty string, right? Empty pattern and empty string is a match. So we will put here t. T for true. By default, when you created this 2D array, we have value for all the box false and we will represent f as a false. Okay, and here we have t00 equals to true because empty string and empty string is a match. Then we're going to take a and empty string. So a and empty string is not a match. So here we'll put f. Then a dot and empty string and a dot and empty string is not a match so here we'll also insert f then we're gonna run a loop and the loop we used only for this type of pattern we have this for loop only for the patterns that can be matched with empty string so when we encountered asterisk We'll check that in this for loop. Here for i from 1 to t0 dot length. And this is the length of the column, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And here 5. So it will run from 1 to 4. If pi minus 1 equals to asterisk, for first iterations, it points to a, right? And a is not asterisk. And for second iteration, it will points to dot. So dot is not an asterisk then it will point to 3 and here 3 minus 1 equals to 2 so 0 1 2 and here we see asterisk right then this condition is true here t 0 i t 
t0 so this is this is the row and i equals to 3 in this case so 0 1 2 3 and here it will copy whatever we have in here and that is f and 0 3 minus 2 1 so here this is row 0 and 3 minus 2 1 0 1 so that is f so it will copy f over here and then a dot asterisk b and empty string and that is not a match so here we'll have f okay and for this column we'll have f right here if here if why this all value or false because empty pattern and a will not match so this is false empty pattern and ax will not match empty pattern and axy will not match empty pattern and ax yb will not match so all the value are false now let's populate value for the rest of the box okay here we're going to run a loop for i from 1 to t dot length minus 1 and this is the length of the road right 0 1 2 3 4 and here we have length 1 2 3 4 5 minus 1 4 this for loop will run from 1 to 4 then we have another for loop for i from 1 to 1 to t 0 dot length minus 1 and this is the length of our columns and that is also 5 and 5 minus 1 4 so this loop also will run from 1 to 4 okay and this two loop will iterate through until we get to this box now let's see how we can calculate now let's see how we can calculate the value for the rest of the boxes first i equals to 1 and j equals to 1 okay so here we have p 1 minus 1 equals to 0 and at 0 we don't have dot so this is false then p j minus 1 and 1 minus 1 is 0 so it points to a and here it's i minus 1 i equals to 1 right so it's 0 a and a is a match right so if we have a match between a and a then we have like this a and a right and this is a pattern and this is a string so we see we have a match here a and a so we can just remove both of them then we'll have empty string right then we'll copy what we have empty string versus empty string and here we have t and we're going to just copy this t right over here all right and this is the exact formula to copy this value from here to here then we have dot right and for the next iteration the value of j will be 2 and here p j minus 1 and this is 1 right and 0 1 and that is equals to dot so this condition is true then it will goes to this line t i j so 1 2 this is 1 and 0 1 2 here and here the value we will have f right and here the value will have f now let me clarify this how this actually works okay a dot and a right and this dot match with a so we can just remove this dot and this a then we have a and empty string so a and empty string for a and empty string we have here f so we just copied this right over here okay for the next iteration the value of j equals to 3 and this is not match and this is not match okay so then it will goes to this else if part here we have p j minus 1 and that is 3 minus 1 is 2 and that is equals to asterisk so this condition is true since this condition is true here how we can calculate the value for this here we can get the value whatever value we have right over here t and we can just copy that here and this is the exact formula to copy the value from here and let me clarify how this actually works we have here a dot asterisk and we have here a now with dot and asterisk okay so here if this dot and asterisk and may have zero occurrence so we can just remove it then whatever value we have for a and a here for a and a we have t so we can copy t from here to here all right if we have j minus 2 equals to dot 
okay so here j minus 2 and here we have 3 minus 2 equals to 1 right 1 for pattern 0 1 we have dot right and this condition is true since this condition is true then this code will run this value may be overwritten right here what do we have so t i j whatever value we have we have t and then we have here t i minus 1 so it will go up and it will just copy whatever value we have here so t true or false and that is equivalent to true so here we have true right now for the next iteration the value of j will be 4 right 4 j equals to 4 this is false and this is false so it will directly insert here false now for the next iteration of this for loop the value of i will be 2 then it will point to this row okay and then whenever we have j equals to 1 okay so then here we see a and x and this is not a match if this is not a match then we'll have here directly false and here directly we have f and this part will run for that we have this value f here and then for the next iteration of j we have dot and x so here this is a match and t i j now let's calculate the value for this box okay so here t i minus 1 so it will go off so it will go off and j minus 1 and j equals to 2 so it should be 1 so 0 1 whatever value we have here we have here t now let me clarify how this actually works we have pattern a and dot right and we have string a and x and here dot and x match right so we can just remove this because dot match any single character and we have here a and a so for a and a we have here t so we can copy whatever value we have in this box so we have here t so we copied here t all right and for the next iteration j we have here asterisk right and asterisk and x here it comes to this line here whenever we have this condition set then it will then it will stay on the same line and it will go back j minus 3 so 1 0 1 so it will copy whatever value we have at this position f so f now since this this condition is true we have j minus 2 that means 3 minus 2 1 0 1 equals to dot since we have here dot then this condition will run right so we have already here false it will go up and then we have t i minus 1 so it go up and j j equals to 3 so 0 1 2 3 and then false or true equals to true so here this value should be true now for the next iteration of j then we have v and x and this is not a match so here we should have false all right so for the next iteration of i it will point to this row and j equals to 1 it will point right here so here we see a and y that is not a match so here we have f then for next iteration of j we have a dot here right so here dot then we need to copy whatever value we have so let's calculate that i minus 1 so this is 3 minus 2 so it go up then j minus 1 so 2 minus 1 is 1 and here 0 1 whatever value we have here it just copied over here how this actually works now let me clarify that we have here a and dot and a x y so dot can match y right dot can match so we can remove dot and y then we need to match a and x and for a and x we have here if so we can just copy it that right over here and for the next iteration of j we have your asterisk right and here we have asterisk and then we have to go back here we have false right so it will copy just false right over here since j minus 2 and that is p1 and that is dot since this is dot then we're going to go off and get the value whatever value we have here we have here t so here the value should be t because if r if or t false or true is equal to true for the next iteration of j we have value 4 and it will point here and b and y is not a match so here we should have f then for next iteration of i in the next iteration the value of i is 4 and it points to this last row 
So here this J value it points to this box and here A and B is not a match so here we can have directly F then we have here dot and B. So this is a match so let's go to F here and here we have false so just copy the value over here. Then we have here asterisk right. If we have here asterisk then we are going to go back here and here we have if so just copy it over here since the value of j minus 2 is equals to dot since this value is equals to dot then it's going to copy the value whatever we have in the top here t so it will copy t right over here now let me clarify that how this actually works so we have here a dot asterisk and here we have a x y b so here dot asterisk so it match with b so we can just remove b as the part of it then we have a x y and a dot asterisk so for a dot asterisk and for a x y we have the value of t so we can just copy that value right over here how simple is that then for the next iteration we have here b and b equal so this part will run so we'll just copy whatever value we have here so here we should have t and at the end we're going to return s dot length and that is 4 and p dot length that is 4 so 4 and 4 so this value since we have 2 here since we have 2 here that means this pattern matches with the strings and this solution takes space complexity bigger of n m where n is the length of string and m is the length of pattern to construct this dynamic programming table and the time complexity for the solution is bigger of n m where n is the length of the string and m is the length of the pattern all right guys i think you have a clear understanding on this problem regular expression massing if you have any doubt if you have any questions let me know i'll be glad to help if you like this video if you want to get more video like this make sure you subscribe to the channel thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next one bye bye hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about graph data structure what is graph data structure graph is a nonlinear data structure consisting of nodes and edges the nodes are sometimes referred to vertices and the edges are lines that connect any two nodes in the graph we can say a graph G is an ordered pair of set V of vertices and a set E of edges. This is an example of graph data structure. We have here five vertices. The vertices is called nodes. So we can say we have five nodes in this graph data structure and we have here seven edges. These are called vertices. Vertices is also called nodes. And this line in between two vertices is called edges. So here we have seven edges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So in this graph data structure, we have five vertices and seven edges. So the set of vertices v1, v2, v3, v4, v5 and set of edges v1, v2, v2, v3, v2, v4, v2, v5, v3, v4, v4, v5 and v5, v1. So we have here seven edges. This graph is undirected graph. We will see what is undirected graph in the graph terminology section of this video we will see what is undirected graph what is directed graph and a lot more in the next video this is an example of graph data structure we have here five nodes the nodes are called vertices and we have seven edges. now let's see some real life application that uses graph data structure social network uses graph data structure Facebook is a popular social media. Facebook uses graph data structure. Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, etc. uses graph data structure. Now, we're going to talk about the Facebook networks. 
let's say this guy mr a use facebook this guy has a friend mr b so mr b is the friend of mr a and mr a is the friend of mr b here we have mr f this guy is the friend of mr a so you can say mr f is the friend of mr a and mr a is the friend of mr f this guy mr f is the friend of friend of mr b because mr b is the friend of mr a mr f is the friend of mr a so we can say mr b is the friend of friend of mr f let's say we have here another guy mr c this guy is the friend of mr a also this guy is a friend of mr b but this guy mr c is not friend of this guy mr f let's say we have here this guy mr e mr e is a friend of mr c so here we can say mr e is a friend of friend of mr a also mr e is a friend of friend of mr b mr e and mr a is not the direct friend here we have this guy mr i mr i is the friend of mr c here mr e is the friend of mr f here we have this guy mr s let's say this guy is the friend of mr i this guy mr d this guy is the friend of mr f mr g friend of mr d mr g also friend of mr e mr e also friend of mr d here mr h is the friend of mr g this is an example of small social network facebook uses advanced concept but the core principle is the same all the social networks uses graph data structure let's say this guy mr b posted on facebook something and the publicity is public then all the people on the facebook can saw the post if the post that posted by mr b with publicity friends and friends of friends then this two guy and the friends of friends so this guy this guy and this guy can saw the post that posted by this guy mr b this is a simple example of graph data structure the facebook network something like this here this guy is connected to this guy this guy is connected to this guy this guy is connected to this guy this guy is this guy is connected to this guy and so on and so forth this is an example of facebook networks here one more examples the facebook networks work something like this the graph data structure a little bit advanced than other data structures like array linked list stacks queues trees this is the one uses of graph data structure google map uses a graph data structure in google maps we can find out the shortest path between two cities let's see a simple map let's add him this is a simple graph data structure we have here some cities city a city b city c and so on city a is connected to city c here we have a path here we have from city a we can visit this city d from this city a we cannot visit this city f directly for that first we have to visit this city b then city f or we can visit this city d then this city f and so on now how we can find out the shortest path in between these two city city b and city r in order to find out the shortest path in between these two cities we can apply some graph algorithms to find out the shortest path between two cities we will see how to find out shortest path in between two cities in this section of this course we will talk about in details with code this is a simple graph representation this is an example of simple math google map uses a graph data structure google map might uses some advanced techniques strategy but the core principle is the same they are using a graph data structure in different ways so these are the two uses of graph data structure social networks uses graph data structure 
Google Map uses graph data structures and there are a lot of applications of graph data structures. Now let's see some applications of graph data structure. Google Map uses graph data structure. Social media like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, etc. uses graph data structure. Operating system uses these data structures, recommendation engines, path optimization algorithms and for scientific computations we use graph data structure. In this section of this course we will talk about a lot of graphs algorithms and how to find out shortest path in between two cities and there are some popular algorithms, graph traversal techniques, graph representations and a lot of contents goes on in this section. In the next video we are going to talk about a graph terminologies. See you in the next video. Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video. In this video we are going to talk about graph terminologies. Vertices. First let's talk about vertices. Vertices are the nodes of a graph. If you are given this graph, in this graph we see we have seven vertices. That means seven nodes. We have nodes V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6 and V7. So we have here seven vertices. These are vertices, okay? So vertices are the nodes of a graph. Now let's talk about edges. Edges are the lines between any two vertices. So in this graph, this is an edge, 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 and this is an edge. So in this graph data structure, we have total 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So in this graph we have total 10 edges. Edges are the lines between any two vertices. We saw that here we have two vertices and this is a line and this line is called edge. Now let's talk about unweighted graph. A graph not having a weight associated with any edges is called unweighted graph. In this graph we have some vertices and we have some edges. But we saw that there is no weight is associated with any edges. So this graph is an unweighted graph. So this graph is unweighted graph. Now let's talk about weighted graph. A graph having a weight associated with each edges is called weighted graph. This is an example of weighted graph. In this graph we have weight associated with is edges. So this graph is a weighted graph. So this graph is a weighted graph. We saw that in this edges the weight 1 is associated. Here 1 is associated and so on. So we see that this is a weighted graph. We saw that in this graph we saw that 1 is associated with this edge, 1 is associated with this edge, 2 is associated with this edge and so on. So we can say this is a weighted graph. Now let's talk about undirected graph. It is a graph where the edges don't have any direction associated with them. This is an example of undirected graph. We saw that in this graph there is no direction associated with any edges. So this is an undirected graph. Now let's talk about directed graph. It is a graph where the edges have direction associated with them. This is an example of directed graph. Also we can say this is a weighted graph because weight is associated. So we can say this is a weighted directed graph. Here we see we have a direction with this is. Here we have a direction with this is and we saw that we have a direction associated with is edges. So we can say this is a directed graph. Now let's talk about unweighted undirected graph. It is a graph where the edges don't have any direction and don't have any weight associated with them. This is an example of unweighted undirected graph because 
because in this graph we saw that there is no weight is associated with any edges so this is an unweighted graph and there is no direction associated with its edges so this is not a directed graph so this is an undirected graph so you can say this graph is unweighted undirected graph now let's talk about weighted undirected graph it is a graph where the edges don't have any direction but have a weight associated with them in this graph we see that there is no direction is associated with is edges but weight is associated with is edges so we can say this is a weighted undirected graph now let's talk about unweighted directed graph it is a graph where the edges don't have any direction and don't have any weight associated with them this is an example of unweighted directed graph we have direction but we don't have any weights associated with its edges we saw we have direction associated with its edges so this is a directed graph but unweighted so you can say this is a unweighted directed graph now let's talk about weighted directed graph it is a graph where the edges don't have any direction but have a weight associated with them this is an example of weighted directed graph in this in this graph we saw that is edges consist a direction is edges has a direction associated with them in this graph we saw that is edges has a direction and a weight so we can say this is a weighted directed graph now let's talk about cyclic graph a cyclic graph is a graph having at least one loop a cyclic graph is a graph having at least one loop this is an example of cyclic graph in this graph we see that we have a loop here we can go from this vertices to this vertices v2 from this vertices v6 from this vertices v7 from this vertices v7 to this vertices v1 so if we start from these vertices we can visit these vertices so if we start from these vertices we can visit these vertices so we find out a loop here so this is a cyclic graph if we find it at least one loop in a graph then you can say that's a cyclic graph here we have another loop we can start from this node v1 to v2 from v2 to v3 from v3 to v4 v5 v6 v7 v1 also from here we can move to this node v5 from v5 to v6 from v6 to v7 to v1 so we have here three loops so this is a cyclic graph now let's talk about a cyclic graph and a cyclic graph is a graph having no loop in it this is an example of a cyclic graph here if we start from this vertices we cannot visit these vertices if we start from these vertices we cannot visit these vertices and so on we have no loops in this graph so we can say this is a cyclic graph now let's talk about an interesting graph data structure tree tree is a special case of directed a cyclic graph this is a tree we all know that this is a tree this tree is a graph we have this node 5 from this node we can move to this node from this node we can visit this node we cannot go to the top we can go only to the bottom to left or to the right and here as well from 5 we can visit 7 from 7 we can visit 1 from 7 we can visit 6 so we say that in this data structure there is no loop we cannot revisit a node so we can say this is a directed a cyclic graph here we have a direction because we can move only to the bottom okay we cannot move to the top we can move only to the bottom so you can say this is a directed acyclic graph this is why all types of tree is a acyclic graph this is why all types of a tree 
is a special type of graph data structure and that is a directed acyclic graph. Hope you have understood graph terminologies. These are the common terminologies that we have talked about in this video. Hope you have understood all the terminologies. If you have an issue understanding any of them, I would request you to post your question in the Q&A forum. I'll be glad to support you. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about types of graph. This is the pictorial representation of graph data structures. First, we have categorized graph into two categories, directed and undirected. Directed and undirected graphs is also categorized into two categories weighted and unweighted and weighted graphs we categorized into two parts positive and negative now let's see all of them in general we have these six types of graphs unweighted undirected graph unweighted directed graph positive weighted undirected graph positive weighted directed graph negative weighted undirected graph and negative weighted directed graph now let's see all of them one by one this is unweighted directed graph because there is no weight associated with the axis we have a direction with all axes so this is a directed graph and there is no weight with axis so this is unweighted graph so we can see this is a unweighted directed graph this is an example of unweighted undirected graph we see that there is no weight associated with the axis and there is no direction associated with the axis so this is a unweighted undirected graph this is a positive weighted undirected graph first this graph is weighted we have weight associated with the axis so this is a weighted graph and we see all the weights having value positive so this is a positive weighted graph and we see that there is no direction associated with the axis so this is an undirected graph so we can say this is a positive weighted undirected graph this is positive weighted directed graph we have weight associated with all the axis and the weight are positive so this is a positive weighted graph and we say that with all edges we have direction so this is a directed graph so we can say this is a positive weighted directed graph this is a negative weighted undirected graph first we see there is no direction associated with the edges so this is a undirected graph and we see we have weight with all the edges so this is a weighted graph but we say that we have negative weights in this graph so this is a negative weighted undirected graph if we saw at least one negative weight then you can say this is a negative weighted graph since there is no direction so we can say this is a negative weighted undirected graph this is negative weighted directed graph we see we have at least one weight that is negative so this is a negative weighted graph and we see direction associated with the axis so this is a directed graph so we can say this is a negative weighted directed graph these are the types of graphs in general hope you have understood these four types of graphs this is the pixel representation so we saw all types of graphs in general hope you have understood this video explanation in the next couple of video we're going to talk about how to implement graph data structure and we'll see graph representation techniques see you in the next video hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about graph representation graph representation is a technique to store graph into the computer memory there are many different ways to store graph into the computer memory but in this course we're going to talk about 
two popular graph representation. One is called adjacency matrix and the other one is called adjacency list. Now let's talk about adjacency matrix. This is an example of adjacency matrix. This matrix represent this graph in this graph we have five vertices and seven aces we are representing this graph in data structure using this adjacency matrix this is a logical representation of this adjacency matrix we are representing this graph data structure using this matrix this is called adjacency matrix we'll see how it actually works in this video we're just showing you this graph is representing with this adjacency matrix for adjacency list this graph will be represented something like this when you use adjacency list this is just a logical representation of this adjacency list. We'll see how it actually works. We'll talk about every bit of information that you need to understand the graph representation and we'll go through a line by line of code. In the next video, we're going to represent unweighted undirected graph using adjacency matrix and weighted undirected graph using adjacency matrix then we'll see the graph representation for adjacency list first we'll talk about the graph representation for adjacency matrix then we'll talk about for adjacency list see you in the next video hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about when to use which representation in this section of this course we saw how to represent different types of graphs which representation you should choose in which cases now let's talk about that if the graph is a dense graph then we should use adjacency matrix here we have the definition for dense graph dense graph is the graph in which the number of aces is close to the maximum number of aces that means the number of aces we have in a complete graph in a complete graph we'll have all ages maximum number of aces and if the graph is a sparse graph then we should use adjacency list here we have the definition for sparse graph a graph with only few edges is a sparse graph. This is an example of adjacent matrix and this is an example of adjacency list. First thing what I have to do first we have to check the number of edges in a given graph. If we saw the number of edges is close to the maximum number of edges that can have in the given graph then we'll consider adjacency matrix. We're using here matrix. If we have few number of edges, then we will perform few operation here. The most of the cell will be unused. That's why in that case, we have to use adjacency list and the size of adjacency matrix is fixed. If we saw the number of edges is close to the maximum number of edges, we will use adjacency matrix if we saw in the given graph with few edges, then we will use adjacency list and that's space efficient. We'll have a lot of unused cell in this adjacency matrix if we represent sparse graph using adjacency matrix. If we represent sparse graph using adjacency matrix, we'll have a lot of unused cell in this matrix and that's not space efficient. That's why we have to consider adjacency list. And if we have number of edges is close to the maximum number of edges, then we should not use adjacency list. We should use adjacency matrix. For these types of graph, we can consider adjacency matrix 
and for these types of graphs we should use adjacency list to represent the graph for complete graph we should consider adjacency matrix what is a complete graph if we have the number of edges in the given graph is maximum then the graph is called complete graph is this graph a complete graph no this graph is not a complete graph in complete graph we will have n times n minus 1 divided two vertices but in this graph we see that we have seven vertices here we have five edges so five times four equals to 20 20 divided 2 equals to 10 and here we have seven edges but we should have the number of edges n times n minus 1 divided 2 here we see that this vertices is connected to this three vertices but in complete graph any vertices is connected to all the vertices in the given graph here 0 is connected to 2 2 is connected to 4 and this one is connected to 4 if we have this connections or this type of edges we can say this is a complete graph here we have total 10 edges and that follows this formula n times n minus 1 divided 2 so we can say this is a complete graph for complete graph, we should consider adjacent matrix all edges. Hope you have understood when to use which representation. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about graph representation using adjacent matrix. In this video, we're going to see the representation for unweighted, undirected graph and for weighted undirected graph first let's talk about unweighted undirected graph then we'll talk about weighted undirected graph now we're going to talk about unweighted undirected graph now we have to represent this undirected unweighted graph using adjacency matrix we have here total five aces 0 1 2 3 4 so we'll create a matrix with five rows and with five columns here we have five rows and we have here five columns now let's see how we can represent this graph using this adjacency matrix first we have here this cell this cell is empty in this matrix we'll denote true by one and false by zero so we will store in this adjacency matrix a zero or one the default value are zero initially this matrix is filled with zero here for this first cell for zero and zero we see we have here zero and we do not have any loop here so here we will have zero we have here no loop from zero to zero so here we'll store zero there is no edge for this node zero to zero also you can see this is a vertices the default value are zero for sake of understanding or inserting zero when you're inserting zero it means that the value is already zero we're just doing it just for sake of understanding now for zero and one in between zero and one we see we have an edge so here we'll insert one one means we have an edge in between these two vertices 0 and 1 that's why we inserted here 1 1 indicates we have an edge in between these two edges 0 and 1 so here we have 0 and 1 since this is undirected graph we will insert here 1 as well we have an edge from 1 to 0 also from 0 to 1 that's why we have inserted here 1 and here 1 as well 1 and 0 now for 0 and 2 for 0 and 2 we see there is no edge in between 0 and 2 so let's insert here 0 now in between 0 and 3 we see in between 0 and 3 we have an edge so let's insert here 1 here it means that we have an edge from 0 to 3 and also from 3 to 0 and this is why we will insert here 1 here it means that we have an edge from 3 to 0 now for 0 and 4 for 0 and 4 in between these two vertices we see we have an edge so let's insert here 1 here we have edge 
from 0 to 4 and we have the is from 4 to 0 so we'll insert here one as well because this is an undirected graph now for 1 and 0 we have here 1 for 1 and 1 there is no loop from this node to this node here sometimes I'm saying nodes and sometimes I'm saying vertices don't be confused about that vertices and the nodes are the same so here we'll insert 0 because we do not have any edge in between this node 1 and this node 1 now for 1 and 2 we see for 1 and 2 we have an edge so let's insert here 1 here we can go from 1 to 2 and also we can go from 2 to 1 so let's insert here 1 as well now for 1 and 3 we see for nodes 1 and 3 we have an edge so let's insert here 1 we can go from 1 to 3 and you can go from 3 to 1 so let's insert here 1 as well we can go from this node 3 to this node 1 also you can go from this node 1 to 3 now for 1 and 4 we see we do not have any a's in between 1 and 4 so let's insert here 0 now for 2 and 0 we see there is no age so here we'll insert 0 we have here 1 for 2 and 1 because we can move from 2 to 1 now for 2 and 2 there is no loop in this node we cannot go from this node to this node 2 because we do not have here any loop so let's insert here 0 now 2 and 3 we have an is let's insert here 1 we can go from 2 to 3 and also we can go from 3 to 2 so for 3 to 2 here we will insert 1 now for 2 to 4 we cannot go from 2 to 4 we do not have any is so let's insert here 0 here we have 3 value already for 3 this node 3 and 3 we do not have any a so let's insert here 0 then for 3 and 4 we have an a so let's insert here 1 we can go from 3 to 4 and 4 to 3 so let's insert here 1 now for this cell for 4 and 1 we do not have any a's so let's insert here 0 now for the nodes 4 and 2 we do not have any a's so let's insert here 0 finally 4 and 4 there is no loops in this nodes we cannot move from this node to this node there is no edge in between this node and this node itself so we're going to insert here zero we have constructed this adjacency matrix this is the representation of this graph data structure this is just a logical representation and this matrix will be stored in our computer memory we're not storing this data structure or something like this we're storing this matrix and this matrix is represented logically something like this and this is the graph data structure hope you have understood how to represent unweighted undirected graph using adjacency matrix here we're storing one one indicates we have an edge in between two nodes zero indicates we do not have an edge in between two nodes here we're storing one if the graph is a weighted graph then we will store the weight that associated with the current is and we'll see that in this video now let's see the algorithm this is the algorithm for unweighted undirected graph we have the class graph inside here we have the adjacent matrix this is story matrix and here we have a variable vertices then here we have the constructor it takes the vertices as input and inside here we're inserting the vertices to this variable vertices and we're creating 2d matrix with vertices and vertices the number of rows and number of columns then here we have this function add is int i int j and we're inserting here one for i j inserting one and for j i we're inserting one because we have two direction we can grow from node a to node b and also from node b to node a this is why we're inserting 1 and 1 ij1 and ji1 then we have here this function remove is this function will remove the is in between any two nodes i equals to 0 and ji equals to 0 and here we have this function to string this function will return the graph as a string here we're creating a string builder then here we're running a loop for i from 0 to vertices minus 1 then here we're inserting i the current index plus this semicolon just for printing stuff 
then here we're running this loop for j adjacent matrix i here we're appending if j equals to 1 we're inserting 1 otherwise we're inserting 0 and at the end we're inserting a line break and at the end we're returning the string we're converting the string builder into string and we're returning the string now let's see how it actually works if we instantiate the graph with vertices 5 it means that we're creating an adjacency matrix with row 5 and column 5 this is the adjacency matrix with row 5 and column 5 and here we're representing the graph data structure this is just a logical representation of the adjacency matrix now if we call graph add edge with 0 1 it will connect these two nodes or you can see the vertices will have one here and we can move from 0 to 1 and from 1 to 0 so we will insert here 1 to 0 here 1 here we're inserting 1 i is equals to 1 and 0 equals to 1 for the direction we can go from 0 to 1 and from 1 to 0 if we call this method add age with 0 4 then here we are connecting these vertices with these vertices 4 and here we will insert 1 so here we have an edge where we can go from 0 to 4 and from 4 to 0 so here we will insert 1 as well using this formula here it's pretty simple right now let's call this method again with 0 3 if we call then it will connect this node with this node and here in this adjacent matrix what you will do we will insert here 1 0 3 and for 3 0 we can go from 3 to 0 so here we will insert 1 as well so this is the representation of this adjacent matrix this is our graph data structure now let's call add age method with 1 2 here we have 1 and 2 so here we will have 1 and we will connect this node with this node we can go from 1 to 2 and from 2 to 1 so from 2 to 1 here we'll insert 1 now let's call this add edge with 1 3 if we call with 1 3 we'll insert here 1 it means that we have a edge in between these two nodes 1 and 3 here we see we can move from 1 to 3 from 1 to 3 and from 3 to 1 so here we'll insert 1 now let's call this add edge with 2 3 here it will set this edge so we can go from 2 to 3 from 2 to 3 and from 3 to 2 let's call this method add edge with 3 4 so it will connect this two node 3 4 so from this node 3 we can move to this node 4 let's insert here 1 also we can move from 4 to 3 so from 4 to 3 and all the empty cell are filled with 0 because the default value is 0 we filled the default value with 0 now we call this method to string then it will return this string by this written statement sv.toString here we say that this is this graph okay this is the representation of this graph data structure hope you've understood how to represent unweighted undirected graph using adjacency matrix we have implemented unweighted undirected graph and we have explained it with line by line of code now let's talk about weighted undirected graph this is a weighted graph this graph is weighted and we see there is no direction associated with any edges so this is undirected graph so you can see this is a weighted undirected graph now let's see how we can represent this graph using adjacency matrix let's assume this is our adjacency matrix we have here five edges so we created this adjacency matrix with five rows and with five columns now for this node zero there is no loop in this node there is no loop from this node zero to this node zero so here we'll insert zero then for zero and one we have a is here and here will not store one in this time because this is a weighted graph we'll store the weight in this is so let's store here the weight and the weight here we see two so let's insert here two we can go from zero to one and from one to zero 
So here also we'll insert the weight 2. We can move from 1 to 0. Now for 0 and 2, there is no connection. So let's insert here 0. There is no yet. Okay. Then from 0 to 3, we see we have an 8. So let's insert the weight in this A's. The weight in this A's is 5. Let's insert here 5. We can move from 3 to 0 as well. So here let's insert 5. Now from 0 to 4, we can move from 0 to 4. And here the weight is 3. Let's insert the weight 3 here. And also we can move from 4 to 0. So let's insert here 3. Now from 1 to 1, there is no loop in this node. We cannot move from 1 to 1. So we'll insert here 0. Now from 1 to 2, we see we have an age with weight 4. Let's insert here 4. We can move from 2 to 1. So let's insert here 4 as well. Now for 1 and 3, we have an age with weight 3. So let's insert here 3. From 3 to 1, we can move from 3 to 1. So let's insert here 3 as well. Now from 1 to 4, we do not have any age. So there is no weight associated. So we're going to insert 0. Now from 2 to 0, from 2 to 0, there is no age. So we're going to insert here 0. The default value is 0. Now from 2 to 3, we have here value already from 2 to 1. Now from 2 to 2, we do not have any age from this node 2 to 2. So we're going to insert here 0. Now from 2 to 3, we have an age with weight 4. Let's insert here 4. We can move from 3 to 2 as well. So here we're going to insert 4. Now from 2 to 4, from 2 to 4, we have no age. So let's insert here 0. Now from 3 to 3, we do not have any loop from this node 3 to this node 3. So let's insert here 0. Now from 3 to 4, we have an 8 with weight 2. Let's insert here 2. We can move from 4 to 3. So let's insert here 2, the weight 2. Now from 4 to 1, we have no A's. Let's insert here 0. Now from 4 to 2, we do not have any A's. So let's insert here 0. Now from 4 to 4, we have no age from 4 to 4, so let's insert here 0. If we have a loop something like this, only then we'll return the weight of this age. Since we have no loop here, so we'll insert here 0. So we have constructed the adjacency matrix for this weighted undirected graph. And this is the representation of this weighted undirected graph using adjacency matrix. Now let's see the algorithm. This is the algorithm for weighted undirected graph. We have class, here we have adjacency matrix and we have here vertices variable. Here we have constructor graph, it takes the vertices as input and here we are setting the vertices to this variable and we are creating adjacency matrix with number of vertices rows and number of vertices columns. And here we are adding is using this function add is, it takes three parameter i, z and weight. And we're setting the weight to the current axis. We can move from A to B and from B to A. And that's why we're setting I is equals to weight and Z equals to weight. And here we're removing the A's by setting to zero. And here we're just returning the string representation of our graph. We have here string builder. And here we're running a loop from for I from zero to vertices minus one. Inside here, we're appending the index plus the colon. And here, we're running a loop to this current row. Here, we're checking if z is not equal to 0. Then we're appending z, otherwise 0. At the end, here, we're appending new line. And here, we're returning the string. We're converting the string builder into string and we're returning the string. This is the string representation. This function will return the string representation of our graph data structure. Here we're instantiating this object graph equals to new graph with 5. 5 is the vertices. So we're going to create adjacency matrix with 5 rows and 5 columns. And here let's draw 5 nodes. If we call this method with 0, 1, 2, 2 is the weight. From 0 to 1, we have a edge and here we're going to insert 2. Here from 0 to 1, from 0 to 1, here we're going to insert 2. And also you have direction from 1 to 0 since this is undirected. So we're going to insert here 2 as well. 
if we call this function again with 0, 4, 3, we'll have connection from 0 to 4 with weight 3. So here from 0 to 4, we're going to insert here 3. And from 4 to 0, we'll have the weight 3. Now let's call this method with 0, 3, 5 from 0 to 3. Here the weight is 5. The weight is 5. So from 0 to 3, the weight is 5. So let's insert here 5. And we have the direction from 3 to 0. So here we'll have 5. Maybe call this function with 1, 2, and 4. Here in between these two node 1 and 2, we have an is with weight 4. So let's insert this weight here, 1 and 2, right here. So weight 4. Here we can move from 2 to 1. So here we are going to insert 4 as well. If we call this method again with 1, 3, 3, from 1 to 3 here, we have an is with weight 3. Let's insert. 3 right over here, 1, 3, 3, and we have direction from 3 to 1, from 3 to 1 here, let's insert here 3. Now let's call this method with 2, 3, 4. So from 2 to 3, we have an is with weight 4. Let's insert 4 here, 2 to 3, 4, we have direction from 3 to 2, from 3 to 2. So here we're going to insert 4. Let's call this function with 3, 4, 2. Now we have an is here with weight 2. So let's insert the weight for 4 to 3 here. The weight is 2. And from 3 to 4. From 3 to 4 is 2. Now we're done. And the empty cell or the vacant cell will be filled with 0. The default value is zero. We see that we utilize many cells in this matrix. If there are more edges in between nodes, if this graph is a complete graph, then we will have more used cell in this matrix. If we saw the number of edges in the graph close to the maximum edges, we will use this adjacency matrix. Otherwise, we'll use adjacency list, and this is the and this is the representation of weighted undirected graph. Here, let's fill the vacant cell with zero. All right, we filled the vacant cell with zero. In computer memory, we'll store this adjacency matrix, and this matrix will treat as a graph a data structure. This matrix will be represented logically something like this. In real life. Instead 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we will use city name or person name. Or we will store the details information of a city or, or a person. Now for understanding of graph data structure, we are trying to understand the core principle of graph data structure. That's why we are not using here city name or person name or details about city or details about person. We're just using some integer as a vertices or nodes. Hope you've understood how to represent unweighted undirected graph and weighted undirected graph using adjacency matrix. Now, if we call this method to string, this method will return this string. This is the text representation of our graph data structure. Hope you've understood how to represent graph using adjacency matrix. In the next video, we'll see unweighted directed graph representation and weighted directed graph representation using adjacency matrix. Then we'll see graph representation using adjacency list. See you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to see the representation of graph using adjacency matrix, unweighted directed graph, and weighted directed graph. First, let's talk about unweighted directed graph. Now, we're going to talk about the representation of unweighted directed graph. Let's assume this is our graph. In this graph, we have total five vertices or nodes, and we have seven aces. And we say that direction is associated with each ages, so 
this is a directed graph there is no weight associated with axis so this is unweighted graph now let's see how we can represent this graph using adjacency matrix we have here five vertices so we created a matrix with five rows and with five columns at this cell zero zero we're going to insert zero we have no loop here there is no edge from this node zero to this node zero that's why we inserted here zero now for zero one we see in between zero one we have an edge this edge goes from zero to one so here we're going to insert one one means we have an edge from zero to one here we cannot go from one to zero because we do not have a direction from one to zero that's why we cannot go from one to zero now for zero and two we see there is no edge so let's insert here zero now for zero three we have an edge and it goes from this node zero from zero to three so here we're going to insert one we do not have a direction from three to zero now for zero to four from zero to four we have a direction so let's insert here one we cannot go from four to zero we have a direction from this node zero to four now for one zero we cannot move from one to zero so let's insert here zero now from one to one we do not have a loop in this node from this node one to this node one so we're going to insert here zero now from one to two we have a direction let's insert here one now from one to three we have a direction let's insert here one now from one to four we do not have any a's so let's insert here zero now from two to zero we do not have any edge so let's insert here zero now from two to one we do not have any edges we have an edges but this edges goes from one to two it cannot goes from two to one so we're going to insert here zero this is a directed graph not undirected graph now from two to two we're going to insert here zero now from two to three we have an edge and this edge goes from two to three so let's insert here one now from two to four we do not have an edge from two to four so let's insert here zero now from three to zero we have an edge but the direction goes from zero to three we cannot go from three to zero so let's insert here zero now from three to one we have an edge but we have direction from one to three let's insert here zero we cannot go from three to one now from three to two we see we have an edge but the direction goes from two to three we cannot go from three to two so let's insert here zero now from three to three we do not have any loop here so we're gonna insert here zero now from three to four we see we have an edge and the direction from three to four let's insert here one now from four to zero we have an edge but the direction goes from zero to four so let's insert here zero now from four to one we do not have an edge let's insert zero now from four to two we do not have any edge now from four to two we see there is no edge for this node four and two so let's insert here zero now from four to three we have an edge but the direction goes from three to four so let's insert here zero now from this node four to this node four we do not have any edge so let's insert here zero we're done we have constructed our adjacency matrix for this unweighted directed graph and this is how this unweighted directed graph represented using adjacency matrix this is how this unweighted directed graph represented using adjacency matrix now let's see the algorithm this is the algorithm for unweighted directed graph representation we have this class graph inside here we have adjacency matrix 2d matrix 2d array here we have variable vertices this is a constructor it takes one parameter vertices and here we're setting vertices to this vertices variable and we are creating matrix of integer type with number of vertices columns and with number of vertices rows we have here this function add h this function takes two parameter i and j then here we have this function remove it this function takes i and j inside this function we're just setting i j to one here we're just setting i is equals to one because this is a directed graph here as a centimetrics i is equals to zero we're just deleting the 
aces in between two nodes by this method remove ace. Here we have this function to string. First we're declaring string builder, then we're running a loop for i from 0 to vertices minus 1. Here we're appending i plus this colon and we're iterating the current row and we're appending 1 or 0 and here we're inserting new line and we're just returning the string representation of the graph. Let's say we instantiate of the graph class that means we created an object of this graph with five vertices. So we're going to create adjacent matrix with five columns and with five rows. Let's assume this is the logical representation of this adjacency matrix. Now if we call this method add is with 0 1 then here from 0 1 we're going to insert 1. So from 0 to 1 we have an age. So let's add here an age. The default value for this matrix are 0. The empty cell means we have default value 0. If we call this method with 0 4 here we'll insert 1. So let's add here an age from 0 to 4. Now graph add age 0 3 will add an age from 0 to 3. So let's insert here 1. So we have an age from 0 to 3. Now if we call this method with 1 2 here we'll insert 1. We'll have an age from 1 to 2 here. If we call this method with add is 1 3 we're going to insert here 1. We'll have an age from 1 to 3. If we call this method with 2 3 we'll have here 1. We'll have an age from this 2 to this 3. If we call this method with 3 4 we're going to insert here 1 and we'll have an age from 3 to 4. And if we call this method to string, this method will return this string. This is the representation of our graph. In this matrix, for the vacant cell or for the empty cell, we will have 0. So let's fill the vacant cell with 0. So we filled the vacant cell with 0. This is the representation of this graph. This matrix will be stored in our computer memory, and this is the logical representation of this adjacency matrix. Hope you've understood the representation of unweighted directed graph. Now let's talk about weighted directed graph. In this graph, we saw that weight and direction is associated with each ages. So this is a weighted directed graph. Now let's see how we can represent this graph using adjacency matrix. For 0 and 0, we're going to insert 0. There is no edge from this node 0 to this node 0. If we have a loop here, only then we will insert non-zero value. From 0 to 1, we have an age and the weight is 2. So we're going to insert here 2. We're not inserting here 1, we're just inserting here 2. Now from 0 to 2, we do not have an age. So let's insert here 0. Now from 0 to 3, we have an age with weight 5. So let's insert here 5. Now from 0 to 4, we have an age with weight 3. So let's insert here 3. Now from 1 to 0, we have an age, but we cannot move from this node 1 to this node 0. So let's insert here 0. Now from 1 to 1, we do not have any loop for this node from 1 to 1. So let's insert here 0. Now from 1 to 2, we have an age with weight 4. We have direction from 1 to 2. So let's insert here 4. Now from 1 to 3, we have an age with weight 3. And we have direction from 1 to 3. So let's insert here 3. Now from 1 to 4, we do not have any age, so let's insert here 0. Now from 2 to 0, we do not have any age, so let's insert here 0. Now from 2 to 1, we have an age, but we cannot move from 2 to 1, so let's insert here 0, because this is a directed graph. If we have a direction here, something like this, then we should insert here 4, but here we do not have a direction from 2 to 1. Now from 2 to 2, we do not have any loop from 2 to 2, so let's insert here 0. Now from 2 to 3 we have an age with direction 2 to 3 and weight 4. So let's insert here 4. Now from 2 to 4 we do not have an age. So let's insert here 0. Now from 3 to 0 we have an age but we cannot move from 3 to 0. So let's insert here 0. Now from 3 to 1 we have an age but we cannot move from 3 to 1. So let's insert here 0. Now from 3 to 2 we have an age but we cannot move from 3 to 2. So let's insert here 0. Now from 3 to 3 we do not have any loop for this node 3. So let's insert here 0. Now from 3 to 4, we have an age with the direction from 3 to 2. Now from 3 to 4, we have an age here with weight 2 and we have direction from 3 to 4. So let's insert here the weight 2. Now from 4 to 0, we have age but the direction is from 0 to 4. We cannot move from 4 to 0. Now from 4 to 1, 
we do not have an 8 let's insert here 0 now from 4 to 2 we do not have an 8 so let's insert here 0 now from 4 to 3 we have an 8 but the direction from 3 to 4 let's insert here 0 now from 4 to 4 we do not have any loop in this node if we have a loop from 4 to 4 the only thing we will insert here the weight associated with this edge but we do not have any loop here so let's insert here 0 we're done we have solved this problem now let's see the algorithm this is the algorithm for weighted directed graph we have this matrix then we have this vertices variable here we have constructor here we are creating adjacent matrix and we're setting the vertices into this vertices variable here we have this method add is it takes three parameter ij weight ij and weight here we are inserting the weight at i and z index here we're removing the is we're setting to zero and here by this function to string we're returning the text representation of the graph let's say we instantiate this class with five so we will create a matrix with row five and column five this is the matrix and this is the graph representation of this matrix now if we call this method add edge it will add at index 0 1 at 0 and 1 here 2 the weight 2 so here we will have an edge from 0 to 1 with weight 2 if we call this method with 0 4 3 0 4 3 so here we'll insert 3 we'll have an edge from 0 to 4 with direction from 0 to 4 with weight 3 if we call this method with 0 3 5 here we'll insert 5 from 0 to 3 we'll have an edge with direction from 0 to 3 with weight 5 if we call this method add edge with 1 2 4 from 1 to 2 we'll have weight 4 so we'll have an edge from 1 to 2 here with weight 4 if we call this method with 1 3 3 from 1 to 3 here we'll have weight 3 here we'll have an edge from 1 to 3 with weight 3 now if we call this method with 2 3 4 2 3 so here we'll have 4 and we'll have an edge from 2 to 3 with weight 4 if we call this method again with 3 4 2 from 3 to 4 here we're going to insert the weight 2 let's insert here 2 so from 3 to 2 we will have an edge with weight 2 here we have vacant cell the default value is 0 so let's fill the vacant cell with 0 in this matrix we saw that we have total 5 times 5 equals to 25 cells but we're just utilizing 7 cell so for this type of graphs adjacency list is the best choice in the next video we'll talk about adjacency list now if we call this method to string it will return the text representation of this graph this is the text representation of this graph this is how we can represent and implement weighted directed graph hope you've understood how to represent graph using adjacency matrix this matrix will be stored in your computer memory and this is just the logical representation of this matrix hope you have understood this video explanations if you have any question if you have an issue understanding this video explanation i would highly encourage you to post your issue on the q a forum thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about graph representation using adjacency list in this video we're going to see the representation of unweighted undirected graph and unweighted directed graph now let's see how we can represent unweighted undirected graph and unweighted directed graph using adjacency list first let's talk about unweighted undirected graph then we'll talk about unweighted directed graph now let's talk about unweighted undirected graph this is an example of unweighted undirected graph in this graph we see that we have five vertices and we have total seven edges we do not have direction and weight associated with any edges so this is a unweighted undirected graph now how we can represent this graph using adjacency list first what we're going to do we're going to create an array of link list we're going to create an array of size five because we have here five vertices this is an array this array will store link list in between these two vertices zero and one we have an edge so 
let's create a node with value one and we're going to connect it to this index zero then it will be represented something like this here we say we have direction from zero to one and from one to zero and we're going to add a node of value zero from this index one something like this so we have two vertices here from zero to one and one to zero now here we see we have two vertices zero and four here we have an ace now we're going to create a node with this value four and we're going to add that as the next node of this node so let's add here four so we have two edge from zero to one and from zero to four since this is undirected so we'll have direction from four to zero so let's add here another node with value zero something like this now from zero to three we see we have an edge so let's add here another node with value three we have direction from three to zero as well so let's add here a node with value zero something like this now from one to two we see we have an edge so let's add a node at index one here we're going to add a node with value two as the next of this node because we have a node here so let's add a node here too since this is undirected we will have direction from two to one so let's add here another node one from this vertices one to this vertices three we have an edge so let's add a node three right here and a node one right here we can go from three to one and we can go from one to three now from two to three we see we have an edge we do not have any direction we can go from two to three and three to two so let's add here a node three and right here a node two so we can go from two to three and we can go from three to two finally we have these two vertices and here we have an edge here we see we can go from three to four so let's add here a node four we can go from four to three so let's add here another node with value three here we see that we can go from three to four and we can go from four to three and this is the representation of this graph data structure using adjacency list in computer memory we'll store this adjacency list this is a logical representation of this adjacency list now let's see the algorithm this is the algorithm for unweighted undirected graph we have vertices and we have here an array of linked list the linked list will store integer this is the adjacency list here we have constructor it takes vertices as input and we're setting here vertices to this variable and we're creating link list and we're inserting link list to this array using this for loop from index 0 to vertices minus 1 and here we have the method add edge this method takes two parameters source and destinations and here we're inserting the node at current index and here we have print graph method this method will print the graph now let's see how it actually works let's say we instantiate this class graph with value 5 here 5 means we have 5 vertices so let's create here an array with 5 elements and here we'll store link list this is not an integer array this is a link list array and this is the logical representation now if we if we call this method add is with 0 1 we'll create a node with value 1 and we'll insert here and we'll create a node with value 0 and we'll insert here it means that we have a direction from 0 to 1 and from 1 to 0 so let's add the edge here in between these two vertices 0 and 1 now if we call the method add is with 0 and 4 we'll add 4 here and we'll add 0 right here it means that we can go from 0 to 4 and we can go from 4 to 0 so let's add an edge here if we call this method with 0 and 3, we'll add 3 right over here and we'll add 0 right over here. It means that we can go from 0 to 3 and we can go from 3 to 0. So let's add an edge in between these two vertices 0 and 3. Now if we call this method with 1 and 2, we'll create a node with value 2 and we'll insert here and we'll create a node with value 1 and we'll insert here. So we can go from 1 to 2 and 2 to 1. So let's add an edge in between these two vertices 1 and 2 something like this if we call this method with 1 and 3 now let's create a node with 3 
and let's insert here and let's create a node with one and let's insert here. So we're going to go from one to three and from three to one. So let's add an edge here. Now from two to three, we call, now we call this method with two and three. Let's create a node with value three and let's insert here and let's create a node with value two and let's insert here. Okay. So we can go from two to three and we can go from three to two. So let's add an edge in between these two vertices. Now we call this method with three and four. Let's create a node with value four and let's add it here. And let's create a node with value three and let's add it here. So we can go from three to four and we can go from four to three. Let's add an edge in between these two vertices. So let's add an edge in between these two vertices four and three. Now if we call this method print graph, this method will print the graph data structure, this adjacency list. And this is the output of this print graph function. So if we call this method, it will print this output. Hope you've understood how to represent unweighted undirected graph using adjacency list. Now let's talk about how to represent unweighted directed graph. This is an example of unweighted directed graph. We have no weight associated with edges, but the direction is associated with east edges. So this is a directed but unweighted graph. So this is a unweighted directed graph. Let's see how to represent this graph. We have here five vertices, so we're going to create an array of linked list of size five because we have here five vertices. Here we have index from zero to four. Now from zero to one, we have an edge. The direction goes from zero to one. So let's create a node with value one and let's add here. It means that we can go from this node zero to node one. We can't go from one to zero. So we'll not add here the node with value zero. Now from zero and four, we can go from zero to four. So let's add here four. We can go from zero to three. So let's add here a node with value three. Now from one to two, we can go from one to two. So let's add here a node with value two. Now from one to three, we can go from one to three. So let's add a node here with value three. Now from two to three, we see we can go from two to three. So let's add here a node with value three. Now here we have this edge. We can go from three to four and also you can go from four to three. So here first we're going to create a node with value four and let's insert that node right here. And let's create another node with value three and let's insert right here. It means that we can go from three to four and we can go from four to three. This is the representation of this unweighted directed graph. Hope you have understood how to represent unweighted directed graph using adjacency list. Now let's see the algorithm. This is the algorithm for unweighted directed graph and this algorithm is similar to unweighted undirected graph. Here we have one line instead two lines. In the previous algorithms we saw, we have here another line adjacency list destination dot add source here, right below of this line. Since this is a directed graph, that's why we have here this one line. Now let's see how it works. Let's say we instantiate this graph class with five. Five is the vertices. So we're going to create an array of linked list of size five. And this is the representation. This is the logical representation of this adjacency list. Now, if we call this method with 0, 1, we're going to add a node here. If we call this method add is with 0, 1, we're going to add a node here with value 1. So here we have a direction from 0 to 1. Let's add here an edge from 0 to 1. Now, if we call this method with 0, 4, we're going to add here a node with value 4. And we have a direction from 0 to 4. And here we have an is with direction. Now, if we call this method with 0, 3, we're going to add here a node with value 3. And let's add an edge from 0 to 3. Something like this. Now, if we call this method with 1, 2, now we're going to add a node here. We can go from 1 to 2. So let's add a node here and let's add an edge that goes from 1 to 2. Now, let's call this method add edge with 1, 3. Let's add here a node 3. So we have an edge from one to three. Let's add here an edge with direction one to three. If we call this method with two and a three, then we're going to add an edge from two to three here. And let's add a node here with value three. If we call this node with add is three, four and with add is four, three, we'll add a node here with value four and we'll add a node here with value three. So we can go from three to four and from four to three. 
so we'll have direction from 4 to 3 and also from 3 to 4. This is the representation of this unweighted directed graph. And this is how we can represent and implement unweighted directed graph. If you call this method print graph, this method will print this output. This is the representation of our adjacency list. This adjacency list will be stored in our computer memory and this adjacency list represent a graph. This is a logical representation of this adjacency list. Hope you have understood how to represent unweighted, undirected and unweighted directed graph. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video. Hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video. In this video we're going to talk about how to represent a graph using adjacency list. In this video we're going to represent the graph weighted directed graph and weighted undirected graph. Now let's talk about how to represent weighted directed graph then we'll talk about weighted undirected graph. Now we're going to talk about how to represent weighted undirected graph. This is an example of weighted undirected graph. In this graph we have total 5 vertices and 7 edges. We see weight is associated with each and every single edges. So this is a weighted graph but there is no direction is associated with edges. So this is an undirected graph. Now let's see how to represent this graph. First let's create an array of linked list. Here we have index from 0 to 4. First we have these two vertices 0 and 1. Now in between these vertices we have an edge with weight 2. Now what are we going to do? We are going to create a node. The node will have three attributes. Now we are going to create a node. The node will have three attributes. Destination, weight and the next pointer. Let's create a node here with value 1 and with weight 2. And let's insert that right here. It means that we can go from this node 0 to 1. Nodes means vertices. So we can go from this vertices to this vertices. And here we have weight 2 in between these vertices. We do not have any direction. So we can go from 1 to 0. So let's insert here another node with value 0 and weight 2. In between these two vertices we have an A's with weight 3. So let's insert here node 4 and weight 3 and here node 0 and weight 3. Now in between these two nodes here sometimes I am saying nodes and sometimes I am saying vertices. Don't be confused. Vertices and nodes are the same thing. Here 0 and 3. In between these two vertices we have an A's with weight 5. Let's create a node with 3 and with weight 5 and let's insert it right here. So we can go from 0 to 3 and we can go from 3 to 0. So let's create here another node. Here we have value 0 and weight is 5. Now from 1 to 2. Here we have an is with value 4. So let's insert. So let's insert node 2 right here and node 1 right here with weight 4. Now for these two vertices we have an is with weight 3. So let's insert a node right here. 3 3 3 is the vertices and 3 is the weight and let's insert here the node 1 with weight 3. Now we have these two vertices 2 and 3. So let's insert here node 3 with weight 4 and here node 2 with weight 4 as well. We can go from 2 to 3 and we can go from 3 to 2 and here we have weight 4. Now from 3 to 4 and 4 to 3. So let's insert here node 4 with weight 2 and here nodes 3 with weight 2. This is the representation of this graph data structure. This is just a logical representation and this adjacency list will be stored in computer memory. Now let's see the algorithm. This is the algorithm for this weighted undurated graph. We have here class node. This node has three attributes value, weight and a next pointer. And here we have vertices and here we have area of linked list. This is adjacency list. And here we have the constructor. It takes one parameter vertices. Here we are setting vertices to this variable vertices and we are creating here linked list and we are inserting the linked list into the adjacency list. Here we have add is method. This method takes three parameters source, destination and weight. And here we are inserting the data into our adjacency list. And this print method will print our graph data structure. If we instantiate this class with 5, we will create an array of length 5. This and it will store the adjacency list. This is an array of linked list. And this is the logical representation of graph data structure. If you call this method add edge with 0, 1, 2, here 2 is width, 1 is the destination, and 0 is the source. So here we're going to add a node with value 1 and with width 2. 
since this is undirected here we will add also by this two line okay here we see that we can go from 0 to 1 and from 1 to 0 so let's add an edge here with weight 2 now if we call this method with 0 4 and 3 we'll add a node here and here with weight 3 so let's add here an edge with weight 4 so let's add here an edge with weight 3 if we call this method 0 3 5 here let's add an edge and let's add two nodes here and here so let's add an edge here with weight 5 now if we call this method with 1 2 4 here we'll have an edge with weight 4 so we can move from 1 to 2 let's add here a node and let's add here a node we can go from 1 to 2 and from 2 to 1 with weight 4 so we can go from 1 to 2 and from 2 to 1 and we have weight 4 so let's add here an edge with weight 4 now if we call this method with 1 3 3 and let's create a node and let's add here these two nodes and let's add here an edge with weight 3 if we call this add edge with 2 3 4 let's add a node with value 3 and here let's add a node with value 2 and here we have weight 4 so let's add here an edge with weight 4 now if we call this method again with 3 4 2 we'll add a node 4 here and a node 3 here with weight 2 so let's add here an edge with weight 2 and this is how it works hope you've understood the representation of weighted undirected graph now if we call this method print graph this method will print the adjacency list and this is the output hope you have understood how to represent weighted undirected graph now let's talk about weighted directed graph using adjacency list now we're going to talk about weighted undirected graph representation using adjacency list so this is our graph here we have direction and weight associated with is edge and here we have adjacency list of length 4 this is adjacency list now here in between these two nodes we have an edge with weight 2 let's insert a node here with value 1 and weight 2 now from 0 to 4 here we have an edge with weight 3 so let's add here a node with weight 3 and value 4 now here we have an edge with weight 5 let's add here a node with weight 5 and value 3 now from 1 to 2 here we see we have an edge with weight 4 let's create a node with value 2 and let's add it here here we have weight 4 now from these vertices to these vertices we have an edge with weight 3 so let's add here a node with value 3 and weight 3 now from 2 to 3 we have an edge here with weight 4 let's add here a node with weight 4 and value 3 now from here to here we see we have direction from 3 to 4 and 4 to 3 and we have here weight 2 so let's add here two node 3 to 4 and 4 to 3 we have here weight 2 and this is the representation of this graph data structure using adjacency list now let's see the algorithm this is the algorithm for weighted directed graph representation here we have little difference here we have only one line of code but in the previous algorithm for weighted undirected graph we saw here another line but here we have one line because of directed graph let's instantiate this class graph with value 5 so let's create an array of linked list and this is the representation of graph if we call this method add age with 0 1 2 here we will add a node and here let's add an age if we call this method we will add a node here and let's add an age here with weight 3 if we call this method with 0 3 5 we will add a node here and let's add an age here with weight 5 if we call this method with 1 2 4 we'll add a node here and let's add an edge here with weight 4 if we call this method with 1 3 3 here we'll add an edge and let's add here a node with weight 3 and value 3 let's add here an edge with weight 3 now from 2 to 3 now if we call if we call this method with 2 3 4 here we'll add an edge and let's add here a node if we call this method with 3 4 2 we'll add a node here and if we call this method 4 3 2 we'll add a node here here we see that we can go from 3 to 4 and from 4 to 3 so we'll have here direction from 3 to 4 and from 4 to 3 something like this with 
with two and this is the representation and this is how this algorithm works if you call this method print graph this method will print the adjacency list and this is the output hope you've understood how to represent weighted directed graph and weighted undirected graph using adjacency list thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about what is graph traversal graph traversal refers to the process of visiting each vertex in a graph if you're given this graph as input first you have to choose a source node and from the source node you have to visit all the vertex in this graph and this process is called graph traversal in graph traversal techniques you have to visit all the vertex in a graph now let's talk about the graph traversal techniques for traversing a graph we have two popular method bed first charts and depth first charts bfs and dfs now let's talk about breadth first charts what is breadth first charts bfs is an algorithm for traversing graph data structure it starts at some arbitrary node of a graph and explores the neighbor nodes for depth first charts this is an algorithm for traversing graph data structure it starts at some arbitrary node of a graph and explores as far as possible along each edge before backtracking this is the definition of breadth first charts and this is the definition of depth first charts now let's see how breadth first charts and depth first charts works for that we're going to take a couple of examples to understand that first let's take these examples let's say we're given this graph we have to visit all the vertex in this graph data structure we have to take any one vertex we can start from any vertex let's start from this vertex zero now here i'm going to see first breadth first shares so let's see the bfs traversal first we have to pick a vertex we can pick any vertex as source vertex here I'm going to pick this vertex 0 so let's print the value of this vertex 0 now what I'm going to do I'm going to explore all the adjacent vertex first now here I'm going to explore all the adjacent vertex the adjacent of this vertex 0 is 1 3 and 4 we can pick this adjacent vertex in any order we can pick in 4 3 1 order or we can pick 1 3 4 or we can pick 1 4 3 or 4 1 3 we can pick any order but it depends on the implementation of graph data structure and the implementation of bfs algorithm if we choose here one for the rest we have to follow a pattern now i'm going to choose one let's choose here one so let's print here one now I'm gonna choose four and I'm gonna choose three so I pick three adjacent vertex in this order one four three since we have picked this vertex one as the first vertex so we have to explore all the adjacent of one the adjacent of one is zero three and two we see we already explored zero and three so let's pick this vertex two so we'll pick this vertex so let's print two now we see that we explored all the vertex in this graph data structure so we're done this is one valid bfs traversal of this data structure if we choose this node one as if we choose here this vertex one as source node here i am sometimes saying vertex and sometimes saying node node and vertex are the same thing here we're gonna print one first since we picked one as the source vertex now what I'm going to do I'm going to pick 0 this vertex 0 then 2 then 3 so we explored 0 3 and 2 now let's visit all the adjacent of 0 the adjacent of 0 is 1 3 and 4 here we see we have already visited 1 and 3 so let's so let's pick this vertex so let's print here 4 this is another valid BFS for this graph now if we check 4 as our source node now what I'm going to do, I'm going to pick first this adjacent vertex, then 3. You can explore adjacent vertex in any order, but it depends on the implementation of graph data structure and the implementation of 
with his algorithm. We picked here 0 as first vertex. So let's explore all the adjacent of 0. We see adjacent of 0, 3, 4 already visited. So let's print here 1. Now let's explore all the adjacent of 3. The adjacent of 3 is 1, 0, 4 and 2. We see 2 is unvisited. So let's explore 2 and we printed here 2. This is another valid BFS traversal. In this graph data structure we might have numerous valid BFS traversal. This 3 traversal is valid BFS traversal. Now let's see DFS traversal. First we have to pick a node as source node. Let's pick this node. So first let's print 0. Now first thing what I'm going to do, I'm going to find out adjacent nodes. Any one adjacent node. We can go here or we can go here and we can go here. It's different on the implementation of graph data structure and the DFS algorithm. We'll not visit all the adjacent vertex. Instead, we will go to any one vertex. Now, I'm going to move to this vertex 3. Now, I'm going to explore this vertex 3. Then, I'm going to explore this vertex 4. We see that we have two vertex 0 and 3 and they're visited. So, let's backtrack here at 3. Now, here we backtrack. From here, we can go to 1 or we can go to 2. But here, I'm going to move to 2. And from 2, we can move to 1 because 3 is visited. So, let's move to 1. And we printed here 1. And we are done. This is a valid DFS traversal. Now, let's pick 1 as source vertex from 1. Let's move to 3. From 3 to 4. From 4 to 0. And here we see, for 0, we see we have 3 adjacent but all are visited. So let's backtrack here. Here we see all are visited. 0 and 3 visited. Now here for 3 we see 1, 0, 4 visited but this is unvisited. So let's explore this vertex. So we're done. We traversed all the vertex in this graph data structure. Now let's pick 4 as our source vertex. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to explore 3. Then I'm going to explore 2. Then I'm going to explore 1 then I'm going to explore 0. We can move it in any direction and this is called DFS traversal. For BFS traversal, we traversed all the adjacent vertex first. For BFS, all the adjacent vertex. But for DFS, we're trying to move to in any one directions. If we find out no way to go, then we'll backtrack. And this is called DFS algorithm. Now, let's take another example for better understanding. Here, this is a tree tree is a valid graph data structure. First, let's see BFS. The BFS is first will traverse 0, then 1, 2, then this level 3, 4, 5, 6. This is a valid BFS traversal. Or you can go in this direction here. First 0, then 2, 1, then 6, 5, 4, 3. These two are valid BFS traversal. But this first one is common BFS traversal. Now let's see DFS traversal. For DFS traversal, first we move to the left here, then we move to the left here, and here on the left we have null, on the right we have null. So we'll backtrack. Let's go here, and here we see 4 is unvisited. Let's go to 4. So here there is no way to visit. So first we visited 0, then 1, then 3, then 4. So here let's backtrack. Here we have no adjacent of 1. So let's backtrack here. Let's go to this node 2. Now let's move here. This is the adjacent. On the left of 5 is null, on the right is null. So let's print 5 and let's backtrack here and we see here 6 is unvisited. So let's visit 6. So this is a DFS traversal. Now let's see another DFS traversal here. First we'll move to this node 2 instead here. Okay. So let's move here. So first 0, then 2, then 6. Then, no node to explore here, so let's backtrack here, and let's move here. So, there is no nodes to explore here, let's backtrack, backtrack here. Here we see 1 is unvisited, so let's visit 1. Now, let's pick this one, we are picking from the right. This is the pattern of our algorithms, because first we choose 2, instead 1. So, let's explore 4, then 3. This is also a valid DFS traversal. Hope you've understood BFS and DFS traversal for a graph data structure. Now let's take another example. For this graph, if we pick 0 as vertex, if we pick 0 as source vertex or source vertex, 
now here the adjacent of 0 is 1 and 3 we can pick any of them let's pick here 1 now let's print here 3 since we pick 1 first so let's explore adjacent of 1 the adjacent of 1 is 2 and 4 we can pick 4 or 2 so let's pick here 2 then 4 so we explored 2 and 4 now here let's explore the adjacent of 3 adjacent of 3 is 7 let's print 7 then the adjacent of 2 adjacent of 2 is 6 and 5 let's pick first 5 so we explored 5 then 6 now let's visit the adjacent of 4 we see adjacent of 4 is 1 and 8 1 is already visited so let's print here 8 now for 7 we see for 7 the adjacent 3 and 8 already visited now for 5 for 5 we see adjacent is 9 and 2 9 is unvisited so let's print 9 for 6 we see adjacent 2 and 9 already visited for 8 the adjacent of 8 9 4 7 already visited then 9 for 9 the adjacent 5 6 8 they are visited so we're done this is a valid bfs in bfs traversal first to explore all the adjacent vertex here if we pick one as source vertex then we'll pick this adjacent here zero then i'm gonna pick two then i'm gonna pick four this is the order since you pick zero as first vertex so let's explore the adjacent vertex of zero here three let's explore three now for two for two adjacent five and six first let's explore five then six now for four for four the adjacent is eight so let's visit eight then for three adjacent is seven and zero zero is already visited so let's print seven now for five adjacent is three and for five adjacent is two six nine two six already visited so let's visit nine so let's print here nine for six the adjacent already visited the adjacent of eight already visited for seven and nine the adjacent already visited so we get this traversal this is a bfs traversal this is a valid bfs traversal now let's see dfs traversal for dfs traversal if we pick zero as source vertex we'll go in any direction okay if we have no way to go then we'll backtrack here we have zero now the adjacent of zero is one and three now let's go in this direction first three then seven then i'm going to move to eight then nine then six from nine we can explore five but we're exploring here six now i'm going to explore two from two i can move to five or i can move to one from here i'm gonna move to five now we see we have two adjacent and they're already visited so let's backtrack here we see we have three adjacent two adjacent already visited so let's visit this adjacent now here we see we have three adjacent four is not already visited so let's visit four now let's backtrack to one there is no unvisited then two there is no unvisited then to five we see there is no unvisited from one i will backtrack to five from five let's backtrack to two there is no unvisited from two to six there is no unvisited here nine no unvisited for eight no unvisited for seven no unvisited and for three there is no unvisited and for zero there is no unvisited so we have explored this graph data structure and this is called dfs search we're trying to explore in any one directions well no way to go if we find out no nodes to explore then we'll backtrack and this is called dfs traversal now if we pick this vertex one as source vertex we have your three adjacent vertex we can move in any direction we have your three adjacent vertex we can explore any one vertex so let's explore this vertex four from four let's explore eight from eight we can go to nine or we can go to seven so let's explore here nine from nine let's explore six from six let's explore two from two let's explore five now we see there is no unvisited adjacent let's move here here we're backtracking then let's backtrack here then let's backtrack at nine let's backtrack at eight now for eight we see we have here three adjacent and one is unvisited so let's visit seven for seven we have two adjacent one is unvisited let's visit three for three we have one adjacent zero unvisited so let's visit zero 
there is no unvisited adjacent of zero so let's backtrack there is no unvisited adjacent of three let's backtrack there is no unvisited adjacent of seven so let's backtrack let's backtrack here and let's backtrack here so we backtracked at our source node so we're done we've traversed the entire grab data structure and this is called and this is called this is called DFS traversal hope you've understood what is DFS traversal and what is BFS traversal now let's take one more example now let's take another example for better understanding I want to clear your doubt on BFS and DFS that's why I'll take here total six examples now let's see example number four here we have this graph data structure this is a graph and data structure now let's see BFS let's pick zero as source vertex if we pick zero as source vertex from here we have to explore all the adjacent first the adjacent of zero is three four one let's explore one then three then four so we explored one three and four now for one let's explore all the adjacent adjacent is six five and two first let's explore two then five then six and we see there is no vertex and visit it so this is a valid BFS source now if we pick one as our source vertex what you will do we'll pick zero then two so we have adjacent of one zero two six five so zero two then we'll visit five then six so zero two five six now let's visit the adjacent of zero adjacent of zero is three four here we can pick in any order three four or four three but it's different on the implementation of grab data structure and the algorithms here let's pick three then four so this is a valid BFS traversal let's see some more BFS traversal if we pick five as source vertex then we'll visit one then if we pick five as vertex we will visit one then zero then two zero now if we pick five as source vertex then we'll have this kind of traversal this is called BFS traversal let's see the traversal result okay I'm not going to go through each step then the video length will be increased so here I'm going to just showing you this path this is a valid BFS traversal 5 1 then 6 then 2 then 0 then 3 then 4 okay now let's see DFS traversal for this graph let's pick 0 as source vertex so first what I will do I will move to 4 so there is no way to go here we see there is no unvisited vertex for this node 4 so let's backtrack at 0 3 is unvisited let's visit 3 now let's backtrack here there is no unvisited vertex connected to this vertex so let's backtrack here we have this vertex let's print 1 now let's go to here to this node 6 then to this node 5 then 2 this is a valid DFS tower cell let's see if we pick one as source node then this is the DFS tower cell this is a valid DFS tower cell if we pick five as source vertex then this is the valid DFS tower cell I'm not going to go through each traversal by picking different vertices as source node if I do then the video length will be increased now let's see how we can traverse this grab data structure using BFS and now let's see how we can traverse this grab data structure using BFS and DFS algorithms first let's see BFS and let's take let's take zero as source vertex now we have zero from zero we can move to one and three so first one then three for one we have three adjacent first let's explore first let's explore two then four now for three there is no unvisited vertex now for two we have two unvisited so let's pick here first eight then nine now for four for four we have three unvisited vertex here okay so let's pick first five then six then seven so we explored five six and seven for eight there is no unvisited vertex is connected to this vertex eight now for nine there is no unvisited vertex here now for five there is one unvisited vertex that is ten so let's print here ten 
For 6, there is no unvisited vertex. For 7, there is no unvisited vertex. And for 10, there is no unvisited vertex. So we're done. This is a valid BFS traversal. If we fix here this node 3 as source vertex, then what is the result of our BFS traversal? Here I'm going to showing you the result. I'm not going through here I'm not going to go through by taking different vertex as source node. So let's see the BFS traversal. 3021894567 7 and 10. This is a valid BFS traversal. Now let's take another vertex as source node 5. Then the BFS traversal is 4, 6, 7, 4, 6, 7, then 10, then 1, then 0, 2, 3, 8, 9. Now let's see DFS traversal for this graph data structure. Let's take 0 as the source vertex. First, what I'm going to do, I'm going to move to this node 3. So we explored this node 3. This is the adjacent. Also, one is adjacent. We can move to 1 as well. But here, I'm moving to 3. You can choose any direction. But it's different on the implementation of graph data structure and the implementation of DFS algorithm. Then I'm going to explore 2. I'm not caring here the adjacent. I'm trying to go to in one direction. If we see, there is no vertex to visit will backtrack from here i'm going to visit nine from nine there is no vertex there is no adjacent vertex for nine there is no unvisited adjacent vertices so let's backtrack from two this is unvisited and this is unvisited here i'm going to explore eight now let's backtrack again here we have one here unvisited let's visit one for one we have only one direction let's go to four let's explore four here for four we can move to three direction to 5 to 6 or to 7 here I'm going to explore 7 first for 7 we see we have two unvisited vertices 5 and 6 here I'm gonna explore 6 for 6 we have one unvisited that is 5 for 5 we have one unvisited 10 and for 10 we see there is no unvisited let's backtrack here then 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 here, then here, then add this vertices 2, then add 3, then add 0. This is the DFS traversal. We're not exploring all the adjacent vertices. We're trying to move to in one direction. And if we find it, there is no unvisited adjacent matrix, we'll back. If we pick here different vertices as source node, then let's see what's going to happen. If we pick here different vertex, let's pick this vertex as source node then this will be a valid DFS traversal. If we pick 5 as source vertex, then this would be the valid DFS traversal. I would highly encourage you to try to go through this graph data structure to find out this two traversal. Now let's take one more example for better understanding. Now let's see the BFS traversal for this directed graph. Let's pick 0 as source vertex. If we pick 0 as source vertex, the adjacent of 0 is 2. We cannot move to 1. We have a direction here. The adjacent of 0 is 2 and 3. So we can explore 2 or 3. First, let's explore 0, then 2, then 3. Now for 2, we have vertices already explored. For 3, we have two vertices, 1 and 4. Here, let's explore 1. And then let's explore 4. And we see we have explored all the vertices. We're done. Here we see that this is a valid BFS traversal. Now let's pick different vertices and let's see the BFS traversal. If we pick one as source vertex, the BFS traversal 0, then 2, then 3, then 4. This is a BFS traversal. If we pick 2 as source vertex, then the BFS traversal is 3, 1, 4, 0. If we pick 3 as source vertex then the BFS traversal is 1 2 4 0 if we pick here 4 as source vertex we'll visit 1 0 2 3 here we see that we have five different BFS traversal now let's talk about DFS traversal now let's pick 0 as source vertex from here we can explore 2 or 3 let's explore here 3 from 3 we can explore 
2 over 4 let's explore 4 then let's explore 1 there is no need to visit so let's backtrack let's backtrack here we see this is unvisited so let's visit we're done this is a valid dfs tower cell if we figure different nodes and let's see the dfs tower cell here i'm not going to go through different path by taking different vertex as source vertex if we take one as source vertex then this is a dfs tower cell if we take two as source vertex this is a valid dfs tower cell if we take three as source vertex this is a valid dfs tower cell if we take four as source vertex then this is a valid dfs tower cell now we come to the end of this video we have explained dfs and bfs algorithms in very detailed hope you have understood what is bfs algorithm what is dfs algorithm and how they works thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about graph table cell techniques breadth first search so let's talk about bfs algorithm vfs is an algorithm for traversing graph data structure it starts at some arbitrary node of a graph and explores the neighbor nodes let's see how this algorithm works we'll take this graph as an example now let's see how it works this is your algorithms this algorithm takes source vertex as input here we have an array of boolean then we have here q data structure for solving bfs problem we use q data structure and here we are marking the source vertex as true and then we're adding the source vertex into the queue and here we're checking if the size of queue is not zero then we're pulling the first item that means the item from front and then we're printing the first item here s and then here we have iterator how this works we'll see and we're getting the list from our graph data structure from index h and we're exploring all the connected vertices to the vertices s and here we're exploring all the connected vertices that connects that's connected to this source vertex and let's see how this actually works let's assume this is our graph data structure and this is the graph data structures and we're representing this graph using adjacency list this is adjacency list and this adjacency list will be stored in computer memory and this is just a logical representation here we have q data structure we have front and back and we have an array of length 5 because we have here five vertices from 0 to 4 now let's see how it works now I'm gonna take 0 as the source vertex so here visited s equals to 2 here we are inserting 2 at index 0 let's insert here true t for true now we're adding this source vertex in our queue data structure so we added this value here now we're gonna check this queue data structure while the size of queue is not equals to 0 we're pulling the first item from front and the first item is zero here let's pull it if we pull it will be removed from here so we pulled zero now we're gonna print zero so let's print zero here now we have an iterator here from s index we're gonna find out the list here we have this list one four three let's explore now here let's explore all the adjacent vertices of zero one four three first we'll explore one then four then three let's see how so in the next iteration of this while loop we have the value one here okay so here i'm gonna insert one and i'm going to insert two here as visited when you insert the the node value here that means we visited that node we'll pull from the front of q and we'll print then next is four so let's insert here four and here let's add two at index four so it means that we visited one and we visited four and we have the adjacent of zero is one four and three so now let's add here three and here we have visited this three so let's mark it true so we visited here we see that zero one three four so we're done we reached at the end so using this while loop we will add here this three value one four three and here we'll mark this tree is visited so here i'm gonna pull from here and let's let's print it okay we have iterator at index one the adjacent of one is three vertices 
the adjacent of 1 is 0, 2 and 3 and we see that 0 and 3 already visited. So here what I'm going to do, I'm going to insert this node 2 right here and we're going to insert here true. So it marks 2 is visited. Now we're done. So after this while loop we'll have here true and here this value 2. Now let's pull this value 4 and let's print it here. At index 4 we'll not add anything in this, we'll not add anything in the queue and we'll not modify this visited array because all the vertices already visited. We see that. So here let's pick this value 3, let's print here vertex 3 we have four node connected and all are visited so this condition will be evaluated always as false then next node is 2 so let's print here 2 now we see that queue is empty so we're done and this is a valid bfs traversal so we find out this traversal 0 1 4 3 2 this is how this algorithm works the time complexity of this algorithm is o of v plus e where v is the number of vertices and e is the number of edges. And the space complexity is O of v, where v is the number of vertices for this key data structure and for this array. Hope you've understood this BFS algorithm. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. In the next video, we're going to talk about DFS algorithm. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about depth first search algorithms. What is DFS algorithm? DFS is an algorithm for traversing graph data structure. It starts at some arbitrary node of a graph and explores as far as possible along each edge before backtracking. Let's see how this algorithm works with pseudo code. And we will take this graph as an example. This is the algorithm for this depth first search. This function takes one parameter the source vertex as input we have here visited array to mark the visited vertices here we have stack data structure for dfs algorithm we use stack data structure for bfs we use queue data structure here first we push the source to stack and here we're checking if stack is not empty we are picking the top element and we are removing the top element here we're checking if current vertex is not visited we are printing the vertex and we're marking it as visited and then here we have the list at index s and here we're running a loop well we have a adjacent vertex we'll check if that vertex is not visited we'll add that onto the stack let's see how it works let's assume this is our given graph and this is the representation of this graph this is an array this is visited array this array will keep track the visited vertices and this is our stack data structure. First, we inserted the source vertex. Let's take 0 as source vertex. So let's insert here 0. Now let's pick this 0 from this stack. Since stack is not empty, and let's remove it. And we're going to check does this vertex is visited? At index, we have value false. The default value is false, okay? So let's mark it as true. And let's print. Let's print here the value 0. Here is equals to 0. Now we have this a is a list and here we are getting this list 1, 4, 3. Now what are going to do? We are going to check does 1 is visited? No. So let's add here. Does 4 is visited? No. Let's add here. Does 3 is visited? No. Let's add here. Now what I am going to do? I am going to puff this 3. Let's puff and let's store it in this variable s. Now we see 3 is not visited. So let's print 3 and let's mark it at index 3 as true. Now at index 3, we see that we have 0, 1, 2, 4. And here we see 0 is visited. So here we're gonna push 1. Let's push here 1. 1 is already on our stack. Don't worry about that. Then let's push here 2. Then let's push here 4. Don't worry. We have here duplicates element on this stack. Don't worry about that. Now what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to pick the top and pop. So let's pick 4 and let's pop 4. 4 is not visited. Let's mark it as 2 and let's print it. At index 4 we have 0 and 3. 0 is already visited, 3 is already visited. So nothing need to be added on the stack using this while loop. Now let's pop 2 and let's add to this variable s. We see 2 is not visited. So let's print 2 and let's add here true. At index 2 we have 1 and 3. We see 1 is not visited. So let's add here 1. And we have 3, 3 is visited. So we'll not push three onto the stack in the next iteration i'm going to pick one and i'm gonna pop it okay and let's store it in this variable s and we see one is not visited 
let's insert here 2 and let's print here 1. And we're done. For 1, we see the connected node is 0, 3 and 2. And they're visited. So, nothing need to be done here. Let's pop 1 here, okay? For 1, if we pop 1 here, we see it's already visited. So, we'll not print. And here, we'll iterate here. If we iterate here, we see that this will always just evaluate false. And again, for 4, again for 1. So, we're done. We get this list. And this is the DFS traversal of this graph data structure. Hope you've understood how DFS algorithm works. For a better understanding, I would highly encourage you to go through with your own examples and try to work with by picking different verdicts as source verdicts. This algorithm will take big of V plus E time complexity and big of V space complexity for this visited array and also for this stack. So it will take big of V. It might take big of 2V but that's equivalent to big of V. And here it will take big of V plus E time complexity where V is the number of vertices that means number of nodes is the number of edges in the graph. Hope you've understood this algorithms. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about topological sort algorithm. Many real world situations can be modeled as a graph with directed edges where some events must occur before others. For example, class prerequisite. Let's say you are a student at a university. If you want to take a class B, then you have to Take a class A. Here A is the prerequisite. We can solve this type of problems using topological sort. For program dependencies, one program will be executed if all the dependencies program is executed. Program dependencies uses topological sort. If a program has some dependencies, then the dependencies must be executed to execute that program. Program dependencies uses topological sort. Event scheduling. For event scheduling, we can use topological sort. In order to happen one event, some event must occur before others. If one event is different on other event, then we can use topological sort for this type of problems. Support you are a student at a university and you want to take class H, then you must take classes E and F as prerequisites. This is a graph data structure. Here, let's assume A is a class, B is a class, C is a class, and so on. Here, let's assume we want to take this class H. If we want to take this class H, then we have to take class F, D, and E. In order to take this class D, we have to take this class A. In order to take this class E, we have to take this class D and B. In order to take this class B, we have to take this class A. Here, in order to take this class F, we have to take this class C and D. In order to take this class C, we have to take this class A. So here we see that we have dependencies. Here we see that we have prerequisites. So before we take this class, we have to take the prerequisite classes. This is an example of topological sort. For program building, a program cannot be built unless its dependencies are first built. Let's say here we want to build this program H. In order to build this program, we have to build the dependencies program of H. The dependencies of H is, is E, D, F. Dependencies of F is D, C. Dependencies of E is B, D, dependencies of D is A, dependencies of B is A, and dependencies of C is A. So in order to build this program, we have to build all the dependencies first. This is an example of topological sorts. Topological sort works only for directed acyclic graph. The word DAG, directed acyclic graph. If the graph has a cycle in it, then topological sort will not work. Now let's see the formal definition of topological sort. A topological sorting is an ordering of the nodes in a directed acyclic graph where is directed as from node A to node B. Node A appears before node B in the ordering. This is a formal definition of topological sort. 
let's say we are given this graph. In this graph, we see that we have a cycle in it. From this node 2, we can move to this node 4, from 4 to 6, from 6 to 3, from 6 to 2. So we find here a loop. This is not a cyclic graph, this is a cyclic graph. So topological sort cannot be applied to this graph. Topological, topological sort works only for acyclic directed. Topological sort works only for directed acyclic graph. If you are given this graph, here we can apply topological sort. Here we have no cycle. Now let's see how topological sort actually works. For that, I'm going to take some examples. For examples, if you're given this graph, then we have to find out the topological sort from this graph. First, we have to understand how this graph are built. This graph are built by adding edges. Here we have the add edge method, okay? Here we're just showing you how this graph is built. Add edge 5 to 5 to 2, then 5 to 0, 4 to 0, then 4 to 1, then 2 to 3, and then 3 to 1. Now let's assume we have here 5 classes. Let's assume we have here 5 classes 0 is a class, 1 is a class, 2 is a class, and so on. Here we have 0, 1, 2, 3 as a class, okay? For sake of understanding, we're assuming 0 is a class, 1 is a class, 3 is a class, and so on. So here we have total 6 classes. Here we have to take one class before another class as a prerequisite. Here we have 5, 2. It means that in order to take the class 2, we have to take the class 5. Here we have a list. In order to enroll this class 2, we have to enroll this class 5 first. Only then we can enroll this class 2. In order to enroll this class 0, first we have to enroll the class 5. Only then we can enroll the class 0. For enrolling this class 0, first we have to enroll 4. Here, in order to enroll this class 1, we have to enroll the class 4. In order to enroll this class 3, we have to enroll the class 2 first. In order to enroll this class 1, we have to enroll the class 3 first. So here we have some prerequisites. And here by graph, we see that in order to take this class, we have no prerequisites, okay? So we can take this class without any prerequisites. Here also we have this class 4, we have no prerequisites. In order to take this class, we have two prerequisites, 5 and 4. So in order to take this class 0, we have to take the class 5 and the class 4. In order to take this class 2, we have to take this class 5. In order to take this class 3, we have to take this class 2. In order to take this class 1, we have to take this class 3 and 4. Now we have to find out a topological order of this graph data structure. This is a directed acyclic graph. We have no cycle in this graph. So we can apply here topological sort. The first vertex in topological sorting is always a vertex with no incoming edges. Here we see for 5, we have no incoming edges and for 4, we have no incoming edges. So 5 can be the first vertex in the topological order. Also 4 can be the first vertex in the topological order. This is a valid topological order 5, 4, 2, 3, 1, 0 and 4, 5, 2, 3, 1, 0. These two are valid topological ordering. Now let's see how this topological ordering works. First we have 5, then we have 4. Here we see for 5 we have no prerequisites. For 4 we have no prerequisites. So we can have 4 and 5 here in any order because they don't have any prerequisites. Then we have here 2. For 2, we see we have prerequisite 5. In order to take this class, we have to take the class 5 first. Then we have here 3. In order to take this class first, we have to take the class 2. Then 1. In order to take this class 1, we have to take the class 4 and 3. And 4 and 3 appears on the left. That means 4 and 3 appears before 1. Now for 0, we see for 0, we have 2 prerequisites. 
5 and 4 and we see here 5 and 4 appears before 0 so this is a valid topological order now let's see this topological order first we have 4 and then we have 5 since we have no prerequisites for 5 and 4 we can have we can have 4 and 5 in any order so here we choose first 4 then 5 it's different on the implementation of data structures and implementation of the algorithm now we have here 2 in order to take this class 2 we have to take the class 5 5 appears on the left then for 3 we have prerequisites 2 we see 2 on the left then 1 for 1 we have 2 prerequisites 4 and 3 so 4 and 3 appears on the left so 4 and 3 appears before 1 then for 0 we have 2 prerequisites and we see 4 and 5 appears before 0 so this is a valid topological order hope you've understood what is a topological order in the next video we'll see how to find a topological ordering of a directed acyclic graph now let's take another example for example if you're given this graph and here we have total five edges let's assume we have here four classes 0 1 2 3 and we have here some conditions in order to take class 1 up to first take the class 0 in order to take the class 3 we have to take the class 0 in order to take the class 1 up to take the class 2 first in order to take the class 1 up to we have to take the class 3 first in order to take the class 2 we have to take the class 3 first this is this is a directed acyclic graph the valid topological ordering of this graph is this two topological ordering okay now let's see how this works first we have zero for zero we have no prerequisites and for three we have no prerequisites so we can have zero and three in any order we can take first zero or we can take first three but it's different on the implementation of your data structures and the algorithms first we have here zero then we have three now we have here two here we see the prerequisites up to is zero and three and on the left up to we have zero and three so zero and three appears before two now we have here one here we see the prerequisites of one is zero two three and zero three two appears on the left of one so zero three two appears before one so this is a valid topological ordering now let's see how this ordering works first we have three and zero for three and zero we have no prerequisites we can take the class in any order three zero or zero three here we choose three then zero then we have here two here we see two has two prerequisites zero and three zero and three appears before two then one for one we have three prerequisites and we see that three zero two appears before one so this is a valid topological ordering hope you've understood what is the topological sort in the next video we'll see how to find out topological ordering of a directed acyclic graph see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about how to find out topological ordering of a directed acyclic graph first let's see the algorithm then we'll see how this algorithm works this is the algorithm for topological sort this algorithm works in DFS fashion first we'll explore as depth as possible we know how DFS works we have talked about DFS in details in this section of this course now let's review this algorithm first then we'll see how this actually works first we have this function topological sort this function takes no parameter inside here we're creating a stack in the stack we will have the topological ordering then we have here this variable then we have here this array of true or false in this array we will keep track visited vertices then here we have this loop this loop will run from 0 to from 0 to the vertices minus 1 i less than vertices here we have this if statement if visited i equals to false then we will call this top sort util in this utility function we're calling with the current vertex 0 with the visited array and with the stack this function will construct the stack when we're done with this for loop we'll have the topological order in our stack we'll pop element from the top of our stack and we'll print this is the util function this function takes three parameter the current vertex the visited 
array and and stack here we're marking the current vertex as visited visited v equals to true then we have here this variable integer current then we have here this iterator here we will have all the adjacent vertices for our current vertex here we have this while loop in this while loop we will check if we have next that means if we have adjacent then we will check if the adjacent is not visited then we will call this stop sort util recursively with the adjacent node when we will find out the defaced node we will insert the current vertex to this stack this will works in dfs manner first we'll move as far as you can okay now let's see how this algorithm works let's say we're given this graph data structure this is represented using adjacency list something like this zero connected to one zero connected to two we can move from zero to one from zero to two then from one we cannot move anywhere then we have here two from two we can move to one then we have three from three we can move to one from three we can move to two so this is the logical representation of this adjacency list for solving this problem using dfs we will use a stack data structure for dfs problem we all just use a stack and this is the array to keep track of visited vertices let's assume we have this four classes here we are assuming here the vertices as classes and we have some prerequisites in order to take the class or in order to enroll the class we have to enroll the class zero first and so on now let's see how to find out the topological ordering from this given graph this is a this is a directed acyclic graph we have a no cycle and we have direction associated with is ages first we'll take the node zero here we have this for all of int i equals to zero we'll have the first node zero so we see this node is not visited at index zero we have false initially this array is filled with false here we're not showing you the false value by default we have here false so at index zero we have false so we'll call this top sort util with the current vertex zero with the visited array and with this stack the stack is empty initially now let's see how this algorithm works first what i'm going to do i'm going to move in any one directions we can move to two and we can move to one because two and one is the adjacent of this node zero but you cannot move in any directions it's different on your algorithms and it's different on the implementation of your graph data structure here for this algorithm and for this implementation i will move to one so from zero i moved to one from one we see we cannot move to any nodes so here first let's backtrack we we have visited zero so let's insert here true okay we have visited zero now this is our current node we see from this node we cannot go anywhere we're stuck here so we find it here deepest node because here we're doing depth first traversal now here what i'm going to do i'm going to insert this node into this stack here what does this means it means that we have no adjacent for one and here we see for this node one we have no adjacent and here we're calling recursively okay we're calling recursively so for one we have no adjacent it means that this node is not prerequisites of any other nodes so what i'm going to do i'm going to insert this node into the stack now let's backtrack here we see we are at zero now here okay we backtrack here so we moved to the previous recursive function call when you call with this vertex zero now we see that we have a way to move so we're going to move to this node here to two so we moved to this node two here we have this two okay the adjacent of zero is two so we moved here now for two we have one and we see one is already visited when you visited one we have to mark this indices with true now we're going to backtrack and from here we'll move to this node two here adjacent is two of zero now for two we see that we have adjacent one so from here we can move to one but one is already visited so we cannot 
move to one. Now here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to mark this two as visited because we have visited two. Now there is no way to go from this node two. So let's insert this node to this stack. Here it means that we have a adjacent nodes of this node two. Here by adjacent I means we can move to that node here so we can move from two to one but one is already visited so we have visited this node two and we have marked and we have marked this indices with true so from here we can't move to any direction so let's backtrack now this is our current now here what i'm going to do i'm going to process this node okay this is already visited so let's process this node and let's insert here zero in the stack we have one two zero here in the bottom of this stack we have one what does this mean it means that one is not a prerequisite for any other nodes and in order to take this clutch we have to take the clutch we have on the top of this stack okay here two means in order to take this clutch we have to take the clutch we have on the top of this stack here in order to take this class zero we have to take the class whatever class we have on the top of this stack till now we have no class on the top now we have processed zero now we're going to move to the next vertices the next vertices is one first we have traversed the graph by taking zero as the source vertex we have traversed the graph for vertex zero using dfsrs now let's take the next vertex one we see one is already visited now let's move to the next that is two two is already visited now let's take the next vertex that is three three is not visited okay so let's call this util function here we call this util function and we'll insert here true now for three we see we have one one is already visited we have two two already visited first we'll move to this direction we see one is visited so let's backtrack let's move to this direction two is already visited so let's process this node let's insert this node to the stack so we inserted here three so we have traversed the graph data structure for the next iteration i equals to four and vertex is equals to four so four less than four evaluated false so this so this for loop will stop and we have here this while loop using this while loop we will pop the top element from stack and we'll print so first we'll pop three let's print three then let's pop zero let's print zero now let's pop two let's print two let's pop one let's print here one so we'll remove here pop method will remove the element from the stack so we get this topological ordering so this is a valid topological ordering in order to take the class one we have to take the class three two and zero here we see that in order to take the class one we have to take the class zero two and three in order to take the class two we have to take the class three and zero in order to take the class zero we have no prerequisites in order to take the class three we have no prerequisites so this is a valid topological ordering this is how topological sorting works hope you have understood these algorithms in a very high level now let's take another example for better understanding let's say we're given this graph data structure this is a directed acyclic graph and this is the representation of this graph data structure let's use a stack and a boolean array to solve this problem so first we'll start from the index 0 from index 0 we cannot move to any directions from 0 we cannot move to any vertex so let's mark 0 with true so let's mark 0 with true from this vertex 0 we cannot explore any vertex we have no direction from this vertex to another vertex so let's insert here true and let's process this node 0 because we cannot move to any vertex now let's take the next vertex 1 here okay 1 we see for 1 we cannot move to any vertex so let's mark it as true and let's insert here 1 from this vertex 1 we cannot move to any vertex so we processed it now let's move to 2 using this for loop okay from 2 we can move to 3 okay so let's mark 2 as visited now let's mark 3 as visited here true now we see from 3 we can go to 1 but 1 is already visited so let's insert 3 onto the stack now let's backtrack here 
we have 2. Now here we see there is no way to go from 2 because 3 is already visited. So let's insert here 2. Now let's move to the next vertex. The next vertex is 3. Here we see from 3 we can move to 1 but 1 is already visited. For 3 we see that 3 is already visited. Let's move to the next vertex that is 4. From 4 we see that we can move to 0 and we can move to 1. First let's move to 0. Move to 0 and we see 0 is already visited. So let's backtrack. From here we see that 1 is already visited. From here we see that we have 1. 1 is already visited. So let's process this node 4. We have visited this node so let's mark it as true. We have to mark it as true when you visit this node 4 for the first time. Let's insert 4 to the stack. So we're done. Now let's move to the next vertex that is 5. Okay, here we see from 5 we can move to 2 and we can move to 0. Here we see 0 is already visited and 2 is already visited. Let's mark 5 as 2 here when we visit for the first time. So from 5 we cannot move to 0 and we cannot move to 2 because 0 and 2 already visited. So let's insert 5 here on this stack. Now we're done. Now what are we going to do? We're going to pop the element from the top of stack. First 5. Let's pop out. Then 4. Let's pop out. Then 2. Let's pop out 2. Then 3. Let's pop out 3. Then 1. Then 1. Let's pop out 1 from here and and finally 0. So let's print here 0. So we get this topological ordering. We have here total 6 classes and we have here conditions. In order to take the class 2, we have to take the class 5 and 4. In order to take the class 0, we see we have 5 on the left. In order to take class 0, we have to take the class 4, 4 on the left of 0. In order to take class 0, we have to take the class 4 as well. In order to take class 1, we have to take the class 4. In order to take the class 3, we have to take the class 2, we have 2 on the left. And in order to take the class 1, we have to take the class 3, we have 1 on the left, okay? So we see this is a valid topological ordering of this directed acyclic graph data structure. Hope you have understood how topological sort works. The time complexity for this solution is big of v plus e and the space complexity is big of v where v is the number of vertices and e is the number of edges in the given directed acyclic graph. So the time complexity is big of v plus e and the space complexity is big of v. Hope you have understood this video explanation. If you are not understanding, I will highly encourage you to try to draw everything on a piece of paper. Hope you have understood how topological sort works in a very high level. If you have any question, if you have any doubt, let us know. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we are going to talk about single source shortest path problem. So what is the single source shortest path problem. Single source shortest path problem is about finding a path between a given vertex called source to all other vertices in a graph such that total distance between them that means source and destination is minimum. So we're given a source vertex we have to find out the minimum distance for all other vertices from source vertex. This is called single source shortest path problem. Let's say you're given this graph data structure. Here we have some weight. We see this graph is a weighted undirected graph. Weight is associated with each edges. So this is a weighted undirected graph. Let's assume A is the source vertex. From this vertex A, we have to find out the minimum distance to all other vertex. So from A to A, the minimum distance is 0, okay? From A to A, we have no path. So we have here 0. Now from A to E, we see the minimum distance is this weight 1. If we go in this direction, first 6, then 2, okay? A, V, B, E. And we see the cost here, 6 plus 2 is 8. So here the minimum distance is 1. So from this vertex A, we can reach this vertex E in cost 1. Now from this vertex A to this vertex B, we see that distance is 6. If we move from A to B, if we move first here to E, 
then from e to b we see 1 plus 2 that is 3 and if we move in this direction first 1 then 1 then 2 and that is 4 1 plus 1 plus 2 equals to 4 so here we see we can reach this vertex from the source vertex in this path and the cost in this path is 3 now let's find the minimum distance to visit this vertex from this vertex A. We clearly see that the minimum distance to reach this vertex is 1 plus 1. So this is the direction. So here we'll have the distance, the minimum distance 2. Now let's find the minimum distance to this vertex and that is 1 plus 1 plus 5 and that is 7. So here we can reach this vertex C from A. So if we want to visit this vertex C from this vertex A, the cost is 7. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 5 is 7. Okay, this is called single source shortest path problem. We can solve this single source shortest path problem using this extra algorithm and using Bailman Ford algorithm. But here, this extra algorithm does not work for negative cycle. If we have a negative cycle in the given graph, then this extra algorithm will not work. So what is a negative cycle? Here we see this is an undirected graph. So in this graph we have cycle. If we have minus 7 instead 2 if the weight is minus 7 and if we add the weight in this cycle we get 0. So we do not have here a negative cycle. The condition for having a negative cycle in a loop we should have the summation of weights is less than 0. But here we see we have a loop. In this loop we see 7 minus 7 plus 1 plus 2 and that is minus 4. So we see the weight in this cycle is minus 4 that is negative. So this is a negative cycle. The another condition for negative cycle is that we have to a path to visit the negative cycle from the source vertex. The source vertex here is A. From here A we can visit this cycle, okay? So this is a negative cycle in this graph. So for negative cycle, this extra algorithm will not work. For negative cycle, Billman Ford algorithm works. In the next video, we'll see how this extra algorithm works. Then in the next video, we'll see how Billman Ford algorithm works. See you in the next video video before move to this extra algorithm first let's talk about why vfs and dfs does not works for single source shortest path problem here ss sp for single source shortest path first let's talk about why bfs does not works for single source shortest path problem we know that bfs explores a given graph only in red way but there can always just be a better route which is not a breadth way. This is the way BFS works. This is how BFS traversal works. Let's assume we're given this graph data structure. This is kind of tree data structure. We know that tree is a special types of graph data structure. In this graph data structure, let's assume we're given this vertex zero. We have to find out the shortest path we have to find out the shortest path from this vertex 0 to all other vertex. If we do here BFS, first we will traverse this level, then this level. Here we see that the distance between this node 0 and 1 is 10. And here, when we move to this level, we see that the distance between from this vertex to this vertex 3 is 10 plus 30, that is 40. But we see that the minimum distance from this vertex to this vertex 3 is 10 plus 5 plus 6 that is not 40 that is 21 so we see that here we find out a wrong answer for the problem single source shortest path so we cannot do here bfs if we do bfs then we'll get a wrong answer now let's talk about why DFS does not work for single source shortest path problem. We know that DFS has the tendency to go as far as possible from source. Hence it can never find shortest path. Let's see why. Let's assume we're given this graph data structure. And let's assume this is our source vertex. Okay. So let's find out the distance from this vertex to this vertex. F okay so what is the minimum distance from this vertex A to this vertex F 
for that if we do here dfs then first we will explore b then c then backtrack d then e then f here we see that if we do dfs traversal from this vertex a to this vertex f we see that this is not the minimum distance we clearly see that the minimum distance is this path okay but we get this path and we find out here wrong answer and this is why dfs doesn't work for single source shortest path problem hope you've understood why bfs and dfs does not work for single source shortest path in the next video we'll talk about this extra algorithm see you in the next video hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about this extra algorithm let's assume we're given this graph data structure and the source vertex is this vertex is zero now we have to find out the minimum distance from this source vertex to all vertex in this graph so let's see how to find out the minimum distance from this vertex zero to all other vertex in this graph let's see how this extra algorithm works first what it does it assume that to visit any vertex the cost is infinity so let's assume to visit this vertex from this vertex zero the cost is infinity so the initial cost is infinity so let's add here infinity infinity and infinity here zero is the source vertex so from this vertex zero to this vertex zero visit this vertex zero from this vertex zero the minimum cost is zero because we have here no weight associated we have no loop in this vertex okay so the cost here is zero and zero is less than infinity so let's replace infinity with zero now what are going to do we're going to find out the vertex with minimum cost okay so here we see that we have this vertex and this vertex has minimum cost now what i'm going to do i'm going to find out the minimum distance from this vertex to this vertex one the minimum distance or you can say minimum cost let's assume here distance okay the minimum distance from this vertex to this vertex one is zero plus six that is six and we see six is less than infinity so let's update this infinity with six now let's explore the next adjacent we have processed this adjacent now let's explore this adjacent now for this vertex we see that the weight in between these two vertex is one the cost to visit this vertex is zero plus one so let's update this value infinity with one because one is less than infinity so the minimum distance here is one so from this vertex zero the minimum distance to this vertex four is one so we processed this vertex zero will not visit this vertex zero anyway we have processed this vertex now let's find out the minimum distance for the vertex okay so we see that the minimum distance here is for this vertex okay that is one here we have minimum distance one here we have six here we have infinity and here we have infinity so this is the vertex where we have the minimum cost or minimum distance from source vertex now what i'm going to do i'm going to update the value for the adjacents if we consider this is u and let's assume this is v okay so let's find out the minimum cost here if we move in this direction so we see that one plus two equals to three three is less than six so let's update six with three now for this adjacent now v is this now v is this vertex here we see the minimum cost or the minimum distance to visit this vertex is one plus one that is two two is less than eight so let's update this value with two so we have processed this vertex now let's find out the minimum vertex okay so here we see four is already visited and zero is already visited now let's find out the minimum distance here we see the minimum distance we have for this vertex two 
here we see that the minimum distance we have for this vertex 3 that is 2 from this uh, vertex let's try to find out the minimum distance for this vertex if we consider this is u and this is v then from u to v the minimum cost is here we have already 3 but the cost from this vertex to this vertex is 2 plus 2 that is 4 4 is not less than 3 so we'll not update this value 3 now let's update the minimum distance for this vertex and that is 2 plus 5 7 and 7 is less than infinity so let's update this vertex with 7 so we have processed this vertex now let's find out the minimum here we see the minimum is 3 the minimum distance for this vertex is 3 now from this vertex we have only one adjacent and visited vertex and we have here 0 4 3 and they're adjacent but they're visited now what I'm going to do I'm going to find out the distance from this vertex to this vertex okay here you have 3 3 plus 5 is 8 but here we have 7 so we're not updating this value 7 with 8 because 8 is not less than 7 so this vertex is visited now let's find out the minimum vertex for the unvisited we see this is the vertex in this vertex we see the minimum distance is 7 but here we have no unvisited adjacent so nothing need to be done here we're done there is no unvisited adjacent for this vertex too so we'll do nothing here we're done we find out the minimum distance from this node 0 to all other nodes this is the this extra algorithm this is how this extra algorithm works so from 0 to this node 1 the minimum distance is 3 from 0 to 4 minimum distance is 1 from 0 to 3 minimum distance is 2 from 0 to 2 the minimum distance is 7 hope you've understood how this extra algorithm works now let's see the this extra algorithm this is the this extra algorithm this function takes source vertex as input here we have visited array here we'll keep track the visited vertices here we have distance in this array we'll keep track the minimum distance then we're running a loop here from index 0 to vertex minus 1 and here we're inserting the maximum value and we're assuming that this value is infinity here we're assigning the maximum value we can store in 32 bits and the maximum value we can store in 32 bit we're considering infinity then we are inserting a source vertex 0 because from vertex from source vertex to source vertex there is no distance okay the minimum distance is 0 now we have here this loop we're running this loop from i and i less than vertices i plus plus here we have u e equals to find minimum distance find out the minimum distance in the graph if we find out minimum distance we will set that as true because that vertex will be the vertex and that vertex will not revisit anyway here we have this fall of int v equals to 0 v less than vertices and here we're checking if the adjacent vertex is not visited and if we have a connections if that is adjacent here we're checking using this condition here adjacent matrix uv not equals to 0 if we have value equals to 0 that means the vertex is not the adjacent of the vertex u here we have this code okay this is for relaxation condition okay here we're adding distance u and and the weight at edge in between these two vertices u and v and you're checking if it's less than the distance at v we're updating the distance at v and then here we're just printing the value from this distance array okay at index 0 we'll have the distance from 0 to 0 at index 1 we'll have distance from 0 to 1 and the distance will store in this distance array and those are minimum distance now let's review this function find mean distance in this function we call with distance and visit it and we are assuming mean distance equals to integer dot max value and then we're assuming mean distance vertex equals to minus one this variable will have a value always is okay so we can have here minus one we don't have to worry about the index out of bound now we have here this for loop for i equals to zero i less than vertex and here we're checking if the current vertex is not visited then we will check this condition if we see distance i is less than mean distance we will update this value and we will return the mean distance vertex okay here this function will return the vertex where we have the minimum distance why are you returning that because we will not revisit the vertex anymore let's assume we're given this 
graph data structure. In order to solve this problem, we'll use two array, visited and distance of length vertices. So we're representing this graph data structure using this adjacency matrix. Now let's see how this algorithm works. In this distance array, we'll fill with infinity value. Here we're assuming maximum value we can store in 32 bits at infinity. So let's insert here infinity, here infinity. So let's insert infinity here as well. Here, here, infinity, infinity, infinity. So in this extra algorithm, first what it does, it assume that to visit any vertex in the graph from source vertex, the cost is or the minimum distance is infinity. Now we're going to set the source vertex to zero because the distance between this vertex zero to this vertex zero is zero. So let's update this value with zero. Let's change this value to zero. Now we'll run this for loop. Here we'll find the minimum distance. The minimum distance here zero. So we'll return, we'll return here the mean distance vertex. So in this graph we see that the mean distance vertex is zero. So we'll return zero and we'll insert here true by this statement. Okay. Now we have this loop here. Now let's find it all the adjacent of this vertex. Adjacent is four and one. We're checking the adjacent for zero. We're checking the adjacent vertex here using this formula. If we see a DJ matrix UV not equals to zero, it means that the vertex U and V are adjacent. So from this vertex zero to this vertex one, we can raise in cost six. We see that here, okay? If we visit in this direction and we will check this condition here distance u plus adjacent matrix uv less than distance v this is the condition for relaxation so let's update this value with 6 because this condition is true 0 plus 6 is less than infinity 0 plus 6 is less than infinity here adjacent matrix uv is the weight in between u and v vertex here u is 0 and v is 1 so let's update this value with 6. So here at index 1, we'll update the value with 6. Now from 0 to 4. Here we'll check from 0 to 2. We see from 0 to 2, we have value 0. So we have no edge. From 0 to 3, we have no edge. From 0 to 4, we have an edge. And we see that this is adjacent. So here we're going to add 1 and 0. 1 and 0 is 1. 1 is less than infinity. So let's update the value at index 4 with 1. We're done. We have processed this node. Now let's move to the next iteration of this loop and let's find out the mean distance vertex for the unvisited vertex. We have unvisited vertex 1, 4, 3, 2. Here we have the mean distance vertex is 4. So this function will return 4 and for 4 the adjacent is we see here 0, 1 and 3. 0, 1 and 3. 0 is already visited. So we will not revisit 0. Here we are finding out the mean distance vertex because because we want to find out the minimum distance. So here we see 4. Since we written this vertex 4, we'll insert at index 4 true. Now here 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 is less than 6. So we're going to update here 6 with 3. Now from 4 to 3, we see 1 and 1, that is 2. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 is less than infinity. So let's update at index 3 with value 2. So here 2 and here 2. Now we see that 4 and 0 is visited. The unvisited is 1, 2, and 3. Now let's find out the minimum in this unvisited part for the next iteration. The minimum vertex, the minimum distance vertex is 3. Here we have 2, here we have 3, and here we have infinity. So 2 is the minimum. So the vertex 3 is the mean distance vertex. We're carrying here mean distance vertex because we want to find out the minimum distance. If we find out the minimum distance, from minimum distance, we will try to find out the minimum distance to other vertex. So we will have a minimum distance. This is the concept of this extra algorithm. We will not revisit this anyway. If we have negative cycles, then we might find it incorrect answer. So from 3 to 1, we see 2 plus 2 is 4. 4 is not less than 3. So we will not update this value 3. We did on this vertex 3, so we will mark it as visited. Now here from 3 to 2, 2 plus 5 is 7, 7 is less than infinity, so let's update this value with 7. And here we'll update this value infinity with 7 as well. So I've visited all the adjacent vertex. Here 4 is already visited. Now let's find out the minimum distance vertex for 
the unvisited the unvisited vertex is one and two here we have the minimum distance vertex is this vertex from this vertex this vertex the minimum distance is five plus three that is eight eight is not less than seven so we'll not update the value we'll mark this one as visited this is because this is a mean distance vertex so let's mark it as visited now let's find out the minimum distance vertex we have here only one vertex and we are left with only one vertex so this is the mean distance vertex we'll return 2 at index 2 will mark as true so here it's visited and we see there is no unvisited adjacent of 2 so we're done for 2 we see that the adjacent is 1 and here 3 and they're already visited so we're done this is the this extra algorithms this is how this extra algorithm works the minimum distance from this vertex 0 to this vertex 0 is 0 the minimum distance from this vertex 0 to 1 is 3 the minimum distance from this vertex 0 to 4 is 1 from 0 to 3 is 2 from 0 to 2 is 7 this is how this extra algorithm works this extra algorithm will not work for negative cycle the time complexity for this algorithm is big of v square where v is the number of vertices in the given graph data structure and it will take big of v space complexity for the distance and visited array it will take actually big of 2v time complexity and that's equivalent to big of v because we ignore the constant part for time complexity analyze it here v is the number of vertices in the given graph data structure hope you have understood this extra algorithm thanks for watching this video in the next video we'll talk about bellman ford algorithm see you in the next video hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about why this extra algorithm will not works for negative cycle if a given graph contains a negative cycle then this extra algorithm will not run it will return incorrect results now first let's see how the extra algorithm works for this graph let's assume this zero is our source vertex in the previous video we talked about these extra algorithms in details in this video we're going to talk about why this extra algorithm does not works for negative cycle for that first let's take this example in this graph we have no negative cycle first let's solve this initially the minimum distance to visit any vertex is infinite from source vertex so infinite 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 and infinite this is your source vertex the distance from this vertex 0 to this vertex 0 is 0 so let's update this value with 0 now we see the adjacent of 0 is 1 and this vertex 2 so let's find out the distance the minimum distance to visit this vertex and that is 0 plus 5 0 plus 5 is 5 5 is less than infinity so let's update infinity with 5 now from 0 to 2 okay here we see the distance is 0 plus 4 that is less than infinite so let's update this well with 4 so we have processed this node 0 now let's find out the minimum distance vertex the minimum distance vertex is this vertex so from here we see we can visit this vertex with minimum cost 4 plus 6 that is 10 10 is greater than 5 so we will not update and we cannot go to this direction and to this direction so we're done we have processed this vertex too now let's find out the mean distance vertex the mean distance vertex is 1 we can visit this vertex 3 from this vertex 1 and the minimum distance is 5 plus 3 8 so let's update this infinity with 8 so so we have processed this node 1 now the mean distance vertex is this vertex because this is unvisited the mean distance vertex is 3 excluding the visited vertex and we see from here we can move only to this direction but here we see this vertex already been processed but here we see this vertex already been processed we'll do nothing here 
so we find out the minimum distance here the minimum distance to visit this vertex is 5 to visit this vertex is 2 to visit this vertex is 4 to visit this vertex is 8 this is how this extra algorithm works now let's see if we have a negative cycles here we see we have a negative cycles the sum of the weight of this cycle is negative okay minus 6 plus 3 plus 2 equals to minus 1 so we find out here a negative cycle if we have negative cycle in a given graph then single source shortest path problem will not work now let's see why this extra will not works for this graph this graph contains negative cycle initially the minimum cost to visit any vertex is infinity this is our source vertex okay let's assume 0 is our source vertex so let's update this value with 0 because from this vertex 0 to this vertex 0 the distance is 0 now the adjacent here we have this node 1 and this node 2 sometimes we're saying vertex sometimes we're saying node node and vertex are the same thing the minimum distance to visit this vertex 5 plus 0 so 5 here the minimum distance to visit this vertex 4 plus 0 4 so we have processed this vertex now the mean distance vertex is this vertex from this vertex we can visit this vertex with minimum cost 4 minus 6 that is minus 2 minus 2 is less than 5 so let's update this value with minus 2 so we can reach this vertex from the source vertex 0 with minimum distance minus 2 so we have processed this node 2 we cannot move to this direction and to this direction we can move only in this direction now let's find out the mean distance vertex for the unvisited vertex we have here two unvisited vertex and the minimum distance vertex is this vertex 1 from this vertex we can raise this vertex 3 in minimum distance minus 2 plus 3 that is 1 so let's update this infinity with 1 because because infinity is greater than 1 so we have processed this node now for this node we see that from this node we see that we cannot visit this node 2 because this node is already visited but we see that 2 plus 1 is 3 we will have the minimum distance for this path okay but here we see that we have 4 and the minimum distance should be 2 plus 1 that is 3 but we have here 4 since this is visited so we cannot find out the actual distance here okay so we find out the minimum distance from 0 to 1 is minus 2 from 0 to 3 is 1 and from 0 to 2 is 4 if we move in this cycle multiple times then we see the value will be changed the value will be decreased the value will be decreased and here we find out the answer 3 the minimum distance from 0 to this vertex is 3 and already this vertex is visited so here we find out a negative cycle if we find out a negative cycle the this extra algorithm will not work actually when we find out a negative cycle the single source shortest path problem will not work in that case we will print or written null or we can print to the console the graph contains a negative cycle so we cannot find out the shortest path but this extra algorithm does not have that mechanism to detect a negative cycle in a given graph for that we have to learn a new algorithm that is called billman ford algorithm and we'll be talking about billman ford algorithm in the next video see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about relaxation let's talk about as relaxation let's say you are given this graph in this graph we have total five edges we'll relax all of the edges once let's see how is relaxation works and this is the condition for is relaxation distance u plus the weight of current edge if the distance plus weight of current edge is less than distance of v then we will change the minimum distance for node v by adding the distance of u plus the weight let's see how is relaxation works now we're going to walk through these graphs using these extra algorithms 
initially the minimum distance to visit any vertex from source vertex is infinity let's assume 0 is our source vertex now the minimum distance to visit this vertex from this vertex is 0 let's change this value to 0 now from this vertex 0 to this vertex 1 the minimum distance is 0 plus 5 that is 5 let's update this infinity with 5 now we see that we applied this formula here so this is our current edge we have applied this formula to this edge so this edge is now relaxed this is called edge relaxation now this edge is relaxing we will not visit this edges anymore okay this is called edge relaxation now let's move to this direction 0 plus 4 is 4 let's update this value with 4 now we applied here this formula so this is now relaxing okay now this is relaxed this is called is relaxation now the minimum is this vertex 2 here the minimum distance is 4 to visit from this vertex to this vertex the distance is 4 plus 1 is 5 and this value is 5 so nothing need to be done here we cannot go to this direction and we cannot go to this direction because this is is now relaxing we will not revisit the relax edges now here this is is now relaxing okay we're checking this condition this condition is evaluated false here now we can say this is is now relaxed here minimum vertex is 1 to visit this vertex 3 from 1 the minimum distance is 5 plus 3 is 8 so let's update this value with 8 now we can say this is is now relaxed now from 3 to 2 the minimum distance is 8 plus 2 that is 10 but we see that this vertex is already visited so we cannot move from this vertex to this vertex so finally we can say this is is now relaxing this is called is relaxation so we relaxed all the edges once this is called is relaxation hope you've understood what is is relaxation let's take another example let's say you're given this graph let's apply here this extra algorithm to find out the shortest path so initially the cost or the minimum distance to visit any vertex from source vertex is infinity let's assume this is source vertex so here let's update this value with 0 from 0 to 0 the distance is 0 now from 0 to 1 pi plus 0 is 5 let's update this value with 5 so we applied this formula so this is is now relaxing now from 1 to 2 the minimum distance is 5 plus 1 that is 6 let's apply here let's update this value with 6 now this edge is relaxing we will not revisit this edge anymore now from 1 to 3 5 plus 2 is 7 let's update this edge with 7 okay this edge is now relaxing now the minimum is 6 this edge so from 6 to from this edge to this edge we can visit in cost 9 okay let's update this value with 9 so this edge is now relaxing we will not revisit this edge anymore now the minimum is 7 here so from 7 we can visit this node 7 plus 1 is 8 but it, this is less than so this is relaxed finally we have this vertex and there is no way to go from this vertex so we're done this is called edge relaxation hope you've understood what is edge relaxation thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about bellman ford algorithm in the previous video we talked about this extra algorithm in details we know that this extra me or minute works for negative weights and this extra cannot detect negative cycles we know for negative cycle single source shortest path problem will not work now let's talk about Bellman for algorithms in this video in details let's add in we're given this graph and we see that in this graph we have total five edges and four vertices for Bellman for algorithms we will relax all the edges v minus one times or v is the vertices F for this graph v equals to four four minus one equals to three so we'll relax all the edges three times for this extra algorithm we relaxed all the edges once first let's see the this extra algorithm this extra algorithm will fail on this graph let's see how so here we have distance infinity 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 and infinity initially let's assume this is our source vertex so let's update this value with zero now zero plus one equals to one let's update this value with one because one is less than infinity so relax this edge now zero two 
For 0 2, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 is less than infinite, let's update this value with 1. Then here we will text the minimum vertex, let's add them. Hey you what's up guys, welcome back to this video, in this video we're going to let's add them, we're given this graph. In this graph we saw that we have total 5 edges and 4 vertices. For this extra algorithm, we'll relax all the edges once, but for Bellman Ford, we'll relax all the edges v minus one times, where v is the number of vertices in the given graph. In this graph, we have total four vertices, so we'll relax all the edges three times. First, let's see how this extra fail on this graph. Okay, so here let's insert infinity, infinity, and infinity. Here we will have 0. 0 plus 1 equals to 1. Let's update this infinity with 1. 0 plus 0 is 0. So let's update this with 0. Now here we see that we processed this node and this is and this is is now relaxing. Now the minimum here 0, 1, infinity is 0. So 0 plus 2 equals to 2. Let's update this value with 2. And there is no way to go to this direction. So this edge is now relaxing. The minimum of 1 and 2 is 1. So this vertex 1. From 1 to 2, the minimum distance 1 plus 1 is 2, but here we have 0. 0 is not greater than 2. So we'll not update it. We're done. This vertex is now relaxing. Now from this vertex to this vertex 1, we see 2 minus 3 equals to minus 1. But here we found 1. For this extra algorithm, we cannot move to the visited vertex, okay, from the unvisited vertex. We see that this extra algorithm is not working for this graph. Here we see that we'll have the minimum distance from source vertex is minus 1, but here we have 1. So we see that, we clearly see that this extra fail on this graph. Let's see how Bellman Ford works for this graph. For Bellman Ford, we'll add you to visit any vertex from source vertex, the initial distance is infinity. This is your source vertex. Let's update this value with 0. For source vertex, we'll update the value with 0 because from source to source, there is no distance. Now from 0 to 1, 1. 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 is less than infinity. Let's update it with 1. Now from 0 to 2, 0 plus 0 is 0. So let's update this with 0. Now from 1 to 2. 1 to 2, 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 is not less than 0, so we'll not update it. Here we see that we relax this edge, this edge, and this edge. Here, this edge, this edge, and this edge. Now from 2 to 3, 0 plus 2 equals to 2. Let's update this infinity because 2 is less than infinity. Now from 3 to 1, 2 minus 3 equals to minus 1. So let's update this value with minus 1. So we relaxed all the edges once. Let's count the value here, okay? 1. Now let's relax all the edges again because we have to relax all the edges three times. Now from 0 to 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 is not less than minus 1. So we'll not change it. 0 to 2, 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 is not less than 0. Then from 1 to 2, minus 1 plus 1 is 0, 0 is not less than 0. Then from 2 to 3, 0 plus 2 equals to 2. We'll not change it. From 3 to 1, 2 minus 3 equals to minus 1. So we'll not update. So we relax all the edges. Now let's relax all the edges again, okay? So we relaxed all the edges two times. Now let's relax this edge. 0 plus 1 is 1, so we'll not change. 0 plus 0 is 0. Then for minus 1 plus 1, here we have 0. We'll not change it from 2 to 3, 2. From 3 to 1 is minus 1, so it will not change. So we have relaxed all the edges three times, so we're done. Now we see that we find out the shortest path from source vertex to all other vertex, okay? This is called Bellman Ford algorithms. This is how we can solve single source shortest path problem using Bellman Ford algorithms. If we take here any node here, let's assume we will start from three. We can first relax this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, and so on, okay? We can do back and forth. We can go forward or we can go backward. If we move backward, let's see how this look like, okay? Now let's assume this is source vertex, infinity, 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 okay? Let's assume we'll start relaxing from this side, 3, 1. Infinity minus 3 equals to infinity because if we subtract 3 from infinity and that's also infinity because it's a huge number. So nothing changes here. 
now from 2 3 so this s is now relaxing from 2 3 we see we see infinity plus 2 is also infinity so we'll not change it then from 1 to 2 infinity plus 1 that's also infinity so we'll not change it then 0 2 0 plus 1 is 1 so let's update this value with 1 now from 0 to 2 0 so let's update this value so we relaxed all the edges once now let's relax them again 3 to 1 so it will not change infinity minus 3 equals to infinity 2 to 3 0 plus 2 equals to 2 let's update this value with 2 now from 1 to 2 1 plus 1 is 2 here we have 0 so it will not change 0 to 1 it's okay 0 to 2 here we have 0 so it will not change it here 0 to here 0 to 1 1 plus 0 is 1 here we have 1 we will not change it 0 plus 0 0 so it will not change it so we relaxed all the edges twice 1 plus 1 is 2 now let's relax them again 3 to 1 is minus 1 okay 2 minus 3 equals to minus 1 now from 2 to 3 we see here 2 so we'll not change it from 1 to 2 minus 1 1 0 and here we have 0 we'll not change it 0 to 1 will not change it 0 to 0 will not change it okay so we're done we relaxed all the edges three times we can we can relax all the edges in any order okay we can relax all the edges in any order but if we follow a certain order then we have to follow that order for the rest because we have to relax all the edges v minus one times this is called Bellman for algorithms this is how Bellman for algorithm works so we can relax this edges in any orders it's different on the implementation of your graph data structure we can take first this then this then this then this one then this one but we have to follow the pattern or the order for the rest because we have to relax v minus one times where v is the number of vertices hope you understand this bellman for algorithm now let's talk about how bellman for algorithm detect negative cycles and how it handles negative cycle hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about a bellman ford algorithm let's assume we're given this graph data structure here we have total five edges these are the edges 0 1 0 2 1 2 2 3 and 3 1 in this extra algorithm we relaxed all the edges just once but for bellman ford algorithms we will relax all the edges b minus one times where v is the number of vertices in the given graph in this graph the number of vertices is 4 so 4 minus 1 equals to 3 so we'll relax all the edges 3 times let's see how it works first let's talk about the this extra algorithm for better understanding so initially we have infinity for all the vertices the initial minimum distance to visit all the vertices from source vertices is from source vertex is infinity now this is our source vertex okay we're going to assume this is our source vertex so the distance from source vertex to source vertex is zero from this vertex to this vertex the distance zero plus one that is one so we have relaxed this edge now from zero to two the minimum distance is zero plus two that is two so let's update this value with two so now this edge is now relaxing we'll not revisit this edge anymore we're trying to we're trying to move to the adjacent vertices okay from this vertices where we have minimum distance that's why we will not revisit this vertex now these two edges are relaxing now the minimum is here one from one to two the minimum distance one plus one that is two here we have two nothing to be done here one two three we can't move from one to three because we have direction from three to one so here we're done this edge is now relaxing okay now for two to three here we see this is the minimum distance vertex two plus three equals to five let's update this value with five now this edge is now relaxing okay now five minus four equals to one and here we have the value one here we see that this extra algorithm works but sometimes this extra algorithm will not works now let's talk about the Bellman for algorithm okay now let's talk about the Bellman for algorithm 
initially we're going to mark all the vertex as infinity okay so here we're going to assume that to visit all the vertex from source vertex initially infinity we're just mark it as infinity now let's assume zero is our source vertex in Bellman for algorithm we will relax all the edges p minus one times p equals to four four minus one is three so we will relax all the edges three times first zero one okay so the distance from source vertex to this vertex zero is zero because this is our source vertex from zero to one is one so let's update this value with one because infinity is greater than one so we relaxed this eight zero one now zero two 0 plus 2 is 2. 2 is less than infinity. Let's update this infinity with 2. So we relaxed this h. Now 1 and 2. Here we see 1 and 1 is 2. And here we have value 2. So we relaxed this h. Then 2, 3. 2 plus 3 is 5. 5 is less than infinity. So let's update this infinity with 5. So this h is not relaxed. Now from 3 to 1, 5 minus 4 equals to 1 so here we have the value 1 now we see that we relaxed all the edges once let's count it we relaxed once now let's relax them again now 0 1 0 plus 1 is 1 so nothing need to be done here because 1 is not less than 1 0 2 2 so we relax this 1 2 1 2 is 2 that's okay then 2 3 here we have 2 plus 3 is 5 then 3 1 for 3 1 5 minus 4 equals to here 1 okay that's okay so we relaxed twice all the edges twice now let's relax them now let's relax them again now let's relax this edge 0 1 0 plus 1 is 1 then let's relax this edge 0 2 0 plus 2 is 2 then this edge then 1 2 1 plus 1 is 2 then 2 3 here 5 then here 3 1 3 1 here 5 minus 4 that is 1 so we're done we relaxed all the edges we relaxed all the edges b minus 1 times here we see we relaxed all the edges 3 times so we're done now we see that we have the shortest path from this vertex the source vertex to all other vertex the shortest path here is 1 the shortest path here is 2 here is 2 plus 3 is 5 2 plus 3 minus 4 equals to 1 so the shortest path from this vertex 4 to this vertex is 1 hope you've understood how Bellman for algorithm works for better understanding let's take another example let's assume we're given this graph data structure here we see that we have a negative cycle let's see how it handles negative cycle and how it detect negative cycle if if the graph contains a negative cycle so let's mark all the vertex as infinity the minimum distance to visit any vertex from source vertex is in is infinity initially let's change this value to zero because this is our source vertex now from source to this vertex let's relax this edge 0 plus 1 is 1 let's update this value with 1 now 0 plus 2 equals to 2 let's update this value with 2 okay so we relax this two edges now 1 2 from 1 and from 1 to 2 1 plus 1 is 2 so we relaxed this edge then 2 3 2 plus 3 is 5 let's update this value because 5 is less than infinity then let's relax this h 3 1 here 5 minus 6 equals to minus 1 so let's relax this h so we get here minus 1 so we relaxed all the edges once let's count it now let's relax them again now 0 1 0 plus 1 is 1 1 is not less than minus 1 we relaxed this h then 0 2 0 plus 2 is 2 that's okay then 1 minus 1 is 1 minus 1 is 0 so let's update this value with 0 because 0 is less than 2 then here 2 3 0 plus 3 is 3 let's update this value with 3 then 3 minus 6 equals to minus 3 let's update this value with minus 3 so we relaxed all the edges twice now let's relax them again let's relax this edge 0 plus 1 is 1 that is not less than minus 3 0 plus 2 equals to 2 2 is not less than 0 minus 3 plus 1 is minus 2 minus 2 is not minus 2 is less than 0 minus 2 is less than 0 so let's update 0 with minus 2 then minus 2 3 
here one let's update this value with one because one is less than three now one and minus six is minus five let's update this value with minus five so we relaxed all the edges three times and here we have the vertex four the four vertex here okay so we have to relax all the edges v minus one times here three times and we relaxed all the edges three times so we're done now how to detect negative cycle here we see we have a negative cycle in order to detect negative cycle we're going to run a loop we're going to check if u plus the weight is let's assume this is u and this is v if we saw 0 plus 1 is less than minus 5 then what I will do I will just print the graph contains negative cycle why is that here we have the minimum distance so from here to here the minimum cost is 0 plus 1 that is 1 okay and here we will have the value less than or equals to this value okay here we will have the minimum distance less than or equals to this value if we saw this value is greater than this value 1 that means we have a negative cycle here we see that 0 plus 1 is 1 1 is not less than minus 5 now let's apply this formula here as well 0 plus 2 0 plus 2 is not less than minus 2 it's okay it's completely fine now minus 5 1 equals to minus 4 we see minus 4 is less than minus 2 here we should have a value here we should have a value that is equals to or less than minus 4 but here we have minus 2 minus 2 is greater than minus 4 so we can say this graph contains a negative cycle if this graph does not contains a negative cycle then we'll have here value at most minus 4 or less than minus 4 okay since we're routing here because here we have a negative cycle so the value are decreasing okay so if we move here to here by one route then this value will be decreased to minus 4 since we have calculated the value already so we can say here this graph contains a negative cycle because because minus 5 plus 1 equals to minus 4 minus 4 is not greater than or equals to minus 2 here we will have the maximum value minus 4 so this graph contains a negative cycle so we'll print this graph contains a negative cycle for negative cycle we will not have any answer for the all pair shortest path problem or also we know for the single source shortest path problem hope you have understood Bellman fraud algorithms now let's see the pseudocode this is the pseudocode to solve this problem we have this function it takes two parameter graph and source here we are calculating vertices and edges here we are creating a distance array for the vertices we track the minimum distance from source to all other vertex and here we are inserting the infinity here we are assuming the maximum value we can store in 32 bit as infinity we are inserting 0 to the source vertex because the minimum distance from source to source vertex is 0 now we are running a loop here we are running this outer loop for v minus 1 times because we have to relax for v minus 1 times and inside here we are running this loop from 0 to the is minus 1 here we are getting source destination and weight and we are storing it we are storing at uv and w here we are checking if distance u is not equal to integer dot max value and the distance u plus w is less than distance v then we are updating the value okay and here we are detecting the negative cycle uvw and here we are checking if distance is not equal to max value and if we saw distance u plus distance w is less than distance v then we can simply say the graph contains negative cycle and just return from the function we'll have no answer in that case otherwise we'll print the distance array we'll have the answer in our distance array and this is the function to print the distance okay from source vertex to all other vertex let's assume this is your distance array and this is your given graph and here we have vertices now let's relax all the vertices v minus one time here v minus one equals to three initially we have infinity 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 and infinity 
the minimum distance to visit all vertex on swords vertex is infinity here as well let's insert infinity okay the length of this distance array must be 4 okay the length of the distance array is 4 we will not have this cell here we'll have index from 0 to 3 because we have here total 4 vertices now let's update the first distance here let's update this distance with 0 and it's just a representation here we're just showing you let's update this with 0 okay now from 0 to 1 1 plus 0 is 1 that is less than infinity so let's update this value with 1 let's update this value at index 1 with 1 now from 0 to 2 so we relaxed here 0 1 from 0 to 2 2 plus 0 is 2 2 is less than infinity so let's update this value with 2 and here as well let's update this value with 2 so we relaxed this 8 now from 1 to 2 from 1 to 2 1 plus 1 is 2 so we, here 1 plus 1 is 2 2 is not less than 2 so nothing need to be done here this is relaxed now 2 3 from 2 to 3 2 plus 3 is 5 let's update this value with 5 because 5 is less than infinity let's update this value with 5 as well now from 3 to 1 this a is now relaxed 3 to 1 minus 1 let's use here minus 1 and we see at index 1 at index 1 we'll have value minus 1 here let's update this value with minus 1 so we relaxed all the edges once so let's keep track the value here okay so we relaxed once now let's relax them again 0 plus 2 is 2 0 plus 1 is 1 but 1 is not less than minus so nothing need to be done here 0 plus 2 is 2 2 is not less than 2 nothing need to be done here now 1 and 2 minus 1 1 is 0 let's update this value with 0 now 2 3 0 plus 3 is 3 let's update this value with 3 now 3 1 3 minus 6 is minus 3 let's update this value with minus 3 here we have to also update the value here here first we have no changes for 0 1 and 0 2 we have changed 0 let's update this value with 0 now from 0 to 3 we see that from 0 to 3 we have the value 3 so we updated this value with 3 and from 3 to 1 minus 3 let's update this value with minus 3 we're showing you here later so we relaxed all the edges 1 plus 1 that means twice now let's relax them again 0 1 1 1 is not less than minus 3 0 2 2 is not less than 0 minus 3 1 minus 2 minus 2 is less than 0 so let's update this value with minus 2 here at index 2 let's update this value with minus 2 now from 2 to 3 minus 2 plus 3 1 let's update this value with 1 so here we'll update the value here with 1 now from 3 to 1 let's update this value minus 3 with minus 5 because 1 minus 6 is minus 5 let's update this value with minus 5 here here we'll update this value with minus 5 so we're done we relaxed all the edges three times that means v minus one times so we're done here now what i'm going to do i'm going to check if the graph contains a negative cycle we're going to use this formula here when you move to these directions when this is u and this is v and what equals to one weight plus minus 5 equals to minus 4 here we have minus 2 minus 2 is greater than minus 4 so this graph contains a negative cycle because here we can have maximum minus 4 but we see here minus 2 this value already calculated so we don't have to worry about that so we can see here this graph contains a negative cycle so we're done this is called Bellman Ford algorithms hope you've understood how to solve this problem when it has a negative cycle we'll have no answer here we'll just print contains negative cycle and we'll return if the graph do not contains a negative cycle we'll have in this distance array and we will print this distance array using this print functions here okay simple print function this is called Bellman Ford algorithms this algorithm will take ve time complexity v is the number of vertices is the number of edges okay and it will take big of v space complexity hope you've understood bellman ford algorithms if you have any questions if you have any doubt understanding this bellman ford algorithms let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video 
hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about all pair shortest path problem the all pair shortest path problem is the determination of the shortest graph distances between every pair of vertices in a given graph this is called all pair shortest path problem let's assume we're given this graph data structure in this graph data structure we have to find out the minimum distance from this vertex to all other vertices First, we have to consider this is our source vertex. Then, we have to consider this is our source vertex from this vertex, the minimum distance to all other vertices. Then, we have to consider this is our source vertex. Then, this is our source vertex. Okay. So, if we are given this graph data structure, if we assume 0 is our source vertex initially, then we can move from 0 to 0 and there is no path. Okay. Then, from 0 to 1, we have path 0 1 this is the shortest path then from 0 to 2 0 2 then from 0 to 3 this two path 0 2 1 or 0 1 3 if we consider one is our source vertex then we can we can't move from 1 to 0 because from 1 to 0 there is no direction that's why we have here this in a now from 1 to 1 there is no loop here there is no self loop so we have no direction here so we have no shortest path here now from 1 to 2 we have shortest path 1 3 2 then for 3 from 1 to 3 the shortest path is 1 to 3 if we consider 2 is our source vertex from 2 to 0 there is no path from 2 to 1 the path is to 1 which path having the minimum distance 2 to 2 there is no self loop 2 to 3 we have this path to 1 and 3. If we consider 3 is our source vertex from 3 to 0, there is no there is no connections or there is no edges. From 1 to from 3 to 1, this is the path who is having the minimum distance. Then from 3 to 2, this is the path from 3 to 3. The shortest path does not exist. So we're just representing that using this triple dot. So, if we're given this graph, we have to find out the shortest distance from every vertices to all other vertices. Okay, this is the all pair shortest path problem. Hope you have understood this problem. Now, let's see how we can solve this problem. In the next video, we will talk about how to solve this problem using this extra algorithm and using Bill Manford algorithm. See you in the next video. In this video, we're going to talk about how to solve all pair shortest path problem using this extra algorithm we have talked about this extra algorithm in a lot of details in this video we're going to overview the way to solve all pair shortest path problem using this extra algorithm let's say we're given this graph first we'll consider here is the source vertex from zero we have to find out the shortest path to all other vertices here we have the source vertex and from source vertex to all other vertices okay from source to zero the shortest path is the minimum so the minimum distance is zero from zero to one the shortest path is zero one the minimum distance is five from zero to two this is the shortest path the minimum distance is four and from zero to three this is the shortest path the minimum distance is eight if we apply here this extra algorithm then we will find out this shortest path from this source vertex then if we consider one is our source vertex then we'll get the shortest path listed here okay then if we consider this is our source vertex then we'll have the shortest path listed here then if we consider three is our source vertex then we'll get this shortest path okay here we have vertex and from vertex to all other vertices okay the distance from this vertex to all other vertices and here we have path and the shortest distance this extra algorithm we'll take here bigger of in q time complexity we'll add the source code to this video you can check that out now let's talk about bill for algorithm for all pair shortest path problem the process are the same if we consider zero is the source vertex we'll get the shortest path listed here if we consider one is our source vertex then we'll get the shortest path listed here then if we consider two is our source vertex then we'll get this shortest path then if we consider three is our source vertex then we'll get this shortest path the main difference between 
Dijkstra and Bellman Ford algorithm is that if a given graph contains a negative cycle, Bellman Ford can detect the negative cycle, but Dijkstra cannot detect a negative cycle. Bellman Ford algorithm will work for negative weight, but it will not work for negative cycle. But Dijkstra may works or may not works for negative edges. But for negative cycles, Dijkstra will not work. Bellman Ford will not works as well, but Bellman Ford can detect the negative cycle. Hope you have understood how to solve all pair shortest path problem using Dijkstra and Bellman Ford algorithm. Bellman Ford algorithm will take big of n q time complexity, where n is the number of vertices in the given graph. We have attached the source code of Bellman Ford algorithm for all pair shortest path problem. We are not going to go through the source code, pseudocode, and the explanations we have already talked about in a lot of details. Thanks for watching this video. In the next video, we're going to talk about Floyd Warshall algorithm. See you in the next video. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about Floyd Warshall algorithm. Now, let's talk about how Floyd Warshall algorithm works for all pair shortest path problem. Let's assume we're given this graph. This is our graph data structure this graph is a weighted directed graph this is the representation of this graph here we have zero in this diagonal zero 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 one one zero two two zero three three zero because if the source node is zero and the destination node is zero then the distance in between 0 and 0 is 0 because we have here no self loop 0 1 for 0 1 we have 8 for 0 2 we have infinity because we do not have any directed edge that goes from 0 to 2 that's why we have here infinity we're representing infinity as maximum integer we can store in 32 bits here we have 1 0 to 3 we have the weight 1 then from 1 to 0 infinity because we do not have any edge from 1 to 0 there is no outgoing edge from 1 to 0 that's what we have here infinity and so on hope you have understood the representation of this graph data structure using this adjacency matrix now let's talk about how floyd orschel algorithm works floyd orschel algorithms uses the concept of dynamic programming now let's review the algorithm then we will see how this algorithm actually works we'll go through line by line and we'll explain every bit of information that we need to understand floyd Warshall algorithm we have here this clutch floyd Warshall. inside here we have two methods floyd Warshall and print matrix this algorithm this function floyd underscore Warshall takes the given graph as input the given graph as a adjacency matrix here we're creating matrix new end vertices vertices then we're running this nested for loop to copy the value from our graph data structure to this new adjacency matrix then we're running this nested for loop to copy the value to matrix we're running your algorithm here we have three nested for loop and inside here we're checking if i k plus matrix k j is less than matrix i j then we're applying this formula and at the end we're printing the matrix here we have the code for printing the matrix now let's see how this algorithm actually works don't be confused about it we're going to explain every single information of this algorithm let's assume we're given this graph and this graph is represented using an adjacency matrix this is the adjacency matrix let's copy this graph to this matrix so if we copy we get this matrix now first thing what we're going to do we're going to find out a path that goes via the vertex zero so here what we're going to do we're going to find it all pairs okay every pair first zero three zero one 0 2 then 1 2 1 0 1 3 and so on we're going to generate every single pair from this graph and we will find out the 
minimum distance between two pairs that goes via the vertex zero. After finding out all possible pairs and calculating minimum distance, we will we will see the minimum distance for the pair that goes via one, two, and three. Now let's find out the minimum distance for all pairs that goes via the vertex zero. Let's see how to find out that. Here we have the iteration, okay? K equals to zero. And here we have ij. We have here two nested for loop inside. So this two nested for loop will execute 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 1, 0, 1, 1, and so on until 3, 3. Let's see how to find out minimum distance path that goes via 0. Here, 0 means k. So we can say the minimum distance path that goes via 0. First, we have 0, 0. Now we're going to check does this pair goes via the vertex 0. Here we have 0 and 0. And we see this value is 0 also. Here we're going to apply this formula, the distance from 0 to 0. That means from i to k and from k to j. From 0 to 0 and 0 to 0. We see for 0 to 0 and 0 to 0, we have value 0. The path from 0 to 0 and from 0 to 0 is 0 plus 0, that is 0. And we see that the current value here, 0, 0 is not less than 0. So this value is evaluated false. So we will not update this value. Okay. Now let's move to the next pair, 0, 1. Does this pair go through the vertex 0? We're going to find out the distance from 0 to 0, that is 0, and from 0 to 1, and that is 8. 0 plus 8 is 8. 8 is not less than 8. So we will not update this current value. Here we are generating all possible pair that go through k. So we will have minimum distance. Okay. This is kind of a dynamic programming because we are using the previously calculated result to find out our current result. Now for 0 to 0 to 0, 0 and 0 to 2. 0 to 2 is infinity. Infinity plus 0 is infinity. Infinity is not less than infinity. So we'll skip this value. We'll not update this value. Let's move forward. Now here we have this current value 1 and we have pair 0, 3. 0 and 3. We see 0 and 0. So from 0 to 0 the value is 0 and from 0 to 3 the value is 1. 1 plus 0 is 1. So 1 is not greater than 1. So we will not update this value. Let's move forward. Now we have this pair 1 0. For 1 0, 1 to 0 that means from i to k 1 to 0 we see that there is no direct path. The value is infinity. Infinity plus 0 to 0. Infinity plus 0 is not less than infinity. So let's move forward. Here we see that we have the value 0 and we have here two pair 1 and 1. For 1 and 1, we have the value 0. 1 0 infinity, 0 1 8. Infinity plus 8 is infinity, infinity is not less than 0. So we will not update this current value. Let's move forward. Now we have this pair 1 2. For 1 2, we see that from 1 to 0, from 1 to 0 value is infinity. Infinity plus 0 to 2. 0 to 2. We see that the value is infinity. We see that we cannot find out shortest path for this pair that go through 0. So we will not update this value. Let's move forward. Now we have here infinity. And we have these two vertex 1 and 3. From 1 to 0, from 1 to 0, value is infinity. So if we find out infinity, nothing need to be done here. Let's move forward. Here we see that 2, 0. For 2, 0, we see it go through 0. So 2 to 0 is 4 and 0 to 0 is 0. 4 plus 0 is 4 and we see 4 is not greater than 4. So let's move forward. Now we have here infinity. Now we have this pair to 1. 
here we can consider i as source and j as destination can we go from this source to destination via k let's see 2 to 0 2 to 0 is 4 4 plus 0 to 1 0 to 1 is 8 4 plus 8 is 12 we can right so 12 is less than infinity so let's update this value here with a 12 now let's move forward we see we have here 2 2 now for 2 2 we have no loop here to visit the vertex 2 from the vertex 2 the minimum distance is 0 because it refers the same node now 2 3 from 2 to 0 we see 4 plus 0 to 3 0 to 3 that is 1 so we get here 4 plus 1 that is 5 let's update this value with 5 so here we see 2 is source and 3 is destination 2 is source 3 is destination and we can visit this destination from this source 2 via the vertex 0 so we find out a value here now let's move forward now we have 3 0 for 3 0 now from 3 to 0 is infinity so nothing need to be done here let's move forward now 3 to 0 3 to 0 is infinity nothing need to be done here 3 to 0 3 to 0 is infinity we have no outgoing direct as here now from 3 to 0 it's again infinity so nothing need to be done here so we have processed all pair that can go via the path 0 so we have processed all pair in this graph that might visit the destination from the source here j is destination i is source so in this graph we saw that in this graph we saw that we can move from source to destination except 0 to 2 1 to 0 1 to 3 and 3 to 0 now let's choose the vertex one here now we're gonna find out all pair that might go via the path one now we have k equals to one first we have zero zero for zero 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 to one is eight and one to zero one to zero is infinity so let's move forward here because infinity plus eight is not less than zero now we have here eight we have to visit the vertex one destination from zero so here zero to one is eight and one to one is zero so we see that we have here eight so we'll not change this value let's move forward zero to one is eight and one to two is infinity so we'll not change this because infinity is not less than infinity plus eight let's move now we have zero two from zero to two we have to visit this eight plus one is nine nine is less than infinity so let's update this value with nine now now we have zero three so here we see that we cannot go from zero to three via one so we'll not update this value here now now from one to one one to one is zero and from one to zero is infinity so we'll not update this value now from one to one is zero one to one is zero so we'll not update this value here we have one to one is zero and one to two is one and for this value let's move forward now we have here four two to one two to one we see that here we have 12 and from 1 to 0 from 1 to 0 infinity so we'll not update this value now we have here 12 from 2 to 1 from 2 to 1 is 12 and from 1 to 1 is 0 so we'll not update this value now for 0 this is diagonal so we'll not find out the value here this is diagonal so we'll not have any value here that less than 0 now for 5 2 to 1 2 to 1 is 12 we see 12 is greater than 5 so nothing need to be compared here now we have 2 and 1 now from 2 1 we see for 2 1 we have 12 12 is greater than 5 
Now for infinity, we see 3 to 1, 3 to 1 is 2, and 1 to 0, 1 to 0 is infinity, so we'll not change this value. Now for 2, 3 to 1 is 2, so we'll not change this value. Now from 3 to 1, we see from 3 to 1 is 2, and from 1 to 2, from 1 to 2 is 1. 3 to 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 to 2. 1 to 2 is 1, 2 plus 1 is 3, so let's update this value 9 with 3. Let's move forward, this is diagonal value, so there is no value that less than 0. Now let's move to the vertex 2. For vertex 2, we have to find out a path from this source, that means from i to z, that, that go via 2. From 0 to 0, we have 0 here, so nothing need to be done here. Now from 0 to 2, from 0 to 2 is 9. We have here value 8. Let's move forward. Now 0 to 2. 0 to 2 is 9. So we will not update 0 to 2. The value is 9, so we will not update this. Now from 1 to 2. From 1 to 2, we see we have value 1. 1 plus 2 to 0. 2 to 0. 5. So 1 plus 4 is 5. Here we see that we can visit this vertex 0 from this vertex 1 via 2 who is having the minimum distance here okay 1 plus 4 is 5 so let's update this value with 5 let's move forward we have here 0 nothing need to be done here now we have here 1 1 to 2 now from 1 to 2 we see that for 1 to 2 we have value here 1 so nothing need to be done here now for this cell 1 to 2 value 1 1 plus 2 to 3. 2 to 3 is 5. 1 plus 5 is 6. So let's update this value with 6. We see that from 1 to 3, we can visit from 1 to 3 via this path. 1 plus 4 plus 1, that is 6. And we have here 6. Hope you've understood how this actually works. Let me go through these examples till the end. Now let's move forward. Here we have 4. From 2 to 0, we see we have a path that goes via 2. So let's update this value with 4. We see that from 2 to 2, from 2 to 2 is 0. 0 plus 2 to 0. 2 to 0 is 4. So nothing need to be done here. Now from 2 to 2 is 0. 0 plus 2 to 1. 2 to 1 is 12. Nothing need to be done here. And same for the rest. And same for the rest for this row. Okay. Now let's move forward. Here we have infinity. We have 3, 0. From 3 to 2. From 3 to 2 we have 3. 3 plus 2 to 0. 2 to 0 is 4. 3 plus 4 is 7. Let's update this value with 7. Okay. From 3 to 0. We see we can go from 3 to 0 in this path. We see that. We can go from 3 to 0 via 2 in this path. 3 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 0. Okay? And this is the summation of the path distance. Okay? 2, 1, 4. That is 7. We have already calculated for 0 and 1. Now we're calculating for 2. Okay? We're using pre calculated result to generate this value 7. So this is a dynamic programming. Try to relate this. With the previous result of dynamic programming table this is a little bit intuitive now let's move forward now from 3 to 1 via 2 3 to 2 3 to 2 is 3 3 is greater than 2 let's move forward now from 3 to 2 that is 3 3 to 2 3 to 2 that is 3 let's move forward now from 3 to 2 that is 3 so here we have 0 will not change it let's move to the next vertex 3 now we're gonna find out the minimum shortest path from all pair that goes via the vertex 3 let's see first 0 0 we have here value 0 so nothing need to be done here now we have value 0 1 0 to 3 0 to 3 is 1 and 3 to 1 2 so 2 plus 1 equals to 3. Let's update this value with 3 because 3 is less than 8. 
Let's move forward. 0 to 3. That is 1 and 3 to 2. 3 to 2. That is 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. Let's update this value with 4. And here we see that from 0 to 2, from 0 to 2, that goes via 3. The path is 1 plus 2 plus 1. That is 4. Let's move forward. 0 to 3, that is 1. So we will not change it. Now 1 to 0. Here from 1 to 3. From 1 to 3 is 6. 6 is greater than 5. Let's move forward. Here again 6 is greater than 0. Let's move forward. Let's move forward. Let's move forward. Now for this value, okay. 2 to 3. 2 to 3 is 5. 5 is greater than 4. Let's move forward. Now 2 to 3, 5. 5 plus 3 to 1, 3 to 1, 2, 5 plus 3 is 7, let's update this value with 7. Let's move forward, it's 0, so it will not change. Let's move forward, 5, 2 to 3, 5, so it will not change it. Let's move forward, 7, 3 to 3, that is 0, 0 plus 3 to 0, 3 to 0 is 7, so it will not change it. 3 to 3, 0. 3 to 1 is this value, so we will not change for the rest. We are done. We find out this, we find out this matrix, okay? And this matrix contains the minimum distance from the vertex 0 to all other vertex, from vertex 1 to all other vertex, from vertex 2 to all other vertex, and from vertex 3 to all other vertex. This is called Floyd Warshall algorithms. We are generating all possible pair that might go through K and we are calculating the minimum path and this is called the Floyd algorithm since we are generating all pair for all vertex so we will have the minimum path. This solution will take big of NQ time complexity and this solution will take big of N square space complexity to create this matrix okay and here we are printing this matrix using this function print matrix hope you have understood how floyd virtual algorithm works if you have any question if you have any suggestion let us know if you have any question understanding this video explanation post your question on the q a forum i'll be glad to help thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about minimum spanning tree. Minimum spanning tree is also called minimum what? Spanning tree. A minimum spanning tree or minimum weight spanning tree is a subset of the edges of a connected weighted undirected graph that connects all the vertices together without any cycles with the minimum possible total edge weight. If you are given a connected weighted undirected graph, you have to find out a minimum spanning tree. The properties of minimum spanning tree is that the minimum spanning tree will have no cycle. We have to include all the vertices to the spanning tree. Also, we can say a minimum spanning tree is a spanning tree in which the sum of the weight of the edges is as minimum as possible. The total weight of edges need to be minimum, okay? So, in the spanning tree, we should include all the vertices and we'll have no cycles and we'll have total weight of the edges. As minimum as possible for example if you're given this graph this is a connected weighted undirected graph what is the minimum spanning tree of this graph let's find out first let's find out the spanning tree okay this is a spanning tree in this tree we see that the total weight of ages 11 we have here no cycle and we have included all the vertices in the spanning tree this is also a spanning tree, total weight of edges 8, 
this is also a spanning tree this is also a spanning tree now we saw that we have here four spanning tree what is the minimum spanning tree in this spanning tree we see that we have total weight of ages seven so this is the minimum spanning tree for this given graph if you're given this graph data structure we have to find out the minimum spanning tree what is the minimum spanning tree of this graph this is the minimum spanning tree we see in this tree we have included all the vertices in this minimum spanning tree we see that we have included all the vertices and we have here no cycles the sum of weight the total weight of ages 37 for this given spanning tree and this is the minimum spanning tree we can generate from this given graph now let's see the application of minimum spanning tree to find path in the math we use minimum spanning tree to design networks like telecommunication networks water supply networks and electrical gates we use minimum spanning tree in the next video we'll see how to find out minimum spanning tree from a given graph using prim's algorithm in this video we're going to talk about prim's algorithm what is prim's algorithm prim's algorithm finds the minimum spanning tree from a given graph the graph must be connected weighted undirected graph prim's algorithm is a greedy algorithm that finds a minimum spanning tree for a weighted undirected graph this means it finds a subset of the edges that forms a tree that includes every vertex where the total weight of all the edges in the tree is minimized if you are given this weighted undirected graph we have to find out a minimum spanning tree in the tree we should include all the vertices and we should have we should have no cycles and the total edge weights need to be minimum the steps for implementing prim's algorithm are as follows first we'll initialize the minimum spanning tree with a vertex susan at random so we'll choose a vertex randomly we can choose zero we can choose one and so on then in the second step we will find all the edges that connect the tree to new vertices find the minimum and add it to the tree and we'll keep repeating step two this is step two until we get a minimum spanning tree now let's see how this algorithm works and how prim's algorithm find out a minimum spanning tree in a given weighted undirected graph let's assume we're given this graph first we're going to create an array in this array we will keep track the selected vertex let's see how this algorithm works we're going to choose this vertex zero so let's select this vertex zero we select this vertex zero now here we're going to insert two it means that we have selected the vertex zero now let's explore the adjacent of this vertex zero the adjacent is one and three now we're going to find out the minimum distance from this vertex to the adjacent that means the minimum weighted edge here we see four is minimum then five now i'm going to choose this edge with weight four so let's select this vertex one now let's choose this minimum weight edge that is four so let's select this vertex one here let's select this vertex one and let's connect here here weight is four we have selected this vertex okay so let's insert here true at this point we say that we selected two vertex zero and one now let's find out the minimum 
edge that is adjacent of 0 or this vertex 1. We see here we have two edge from 0 to 3 and from 1 to 2. And the minimum edge weight is 1. So we'll select this edge. Here we have vertex 2. So let's select this vertex 2. Let's connect this edge here. And here the weight is 1. So we selected this vertex 2. Let's insert here true. We selected here this vertex true. So let's insert here true. Now let's find out the minimum vertex that is the adjacent of 0 or 1 or 2. Okay. We see the adjacent we have for 2. For 1, we have adjacent 0 and 2 that already selected. Here we're marking the selected vertex, so we'll not have any loop here. Now from 2 to 3, we have edge weight 2, and from 0 to 3, edge weight 5. So we'll select this edge. So let's select this edge, and the weight in this edge is 2. So let's connect, and the weight is 2. Here we see the total weight of edges 4 plus 1 plus 2, that is 7. And this is the minimum spanning tree. Since here we have selected three, we have to insert here true. In the minimum spanning tree, we'll have number of edges v minus one, where v is the number of vertices. Here we see that we have four vertex, so four minus one is three. So we see here we have three edges. Here we have created an array. The length of this array is the number of vertex and we're creating this array to mark the selected vertex, okay? And this is how this Prim's algorithm works. For a better understanding, let's check another example. Let's say we're given this graph data structure. First, what are we going to do? We're going to create an array, mark the selected vertex using this array. So we'll, so we'll not have any loop. We can ignore loop by using this array and we'll keep track the selected vertex. Let's pick this vertex randomly zero. If we pick this vertex randomly zero, here let's write out this vertex zero and here let's mark it as selected because we have selected this vertex 0. The adjacent of 0 is 1 and 7. The minimum edge weight is 4. So let's select this vertex 1 here. We have selected this vertex 1. So let's connect here. The edge weight is minimum here. Okay. Now we're going to mark here the vertex 1 as selected. Now for 0 and 1. For this vertex 1, we have 2 adjacent, 2 and 7. For 0, we have 2 adjacent. We have already selected this adjacent vertex. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to select the minimum edge weight. Here we see 8, 11, and 8. Here we're going to select this vertex. Okay, so let's select this vertex. 7 because here we have the minimum edge weight is 8. We'll process the adjacent vertex from 0 to v minus 1 times. We'll see when it will go through pseudocode. Here we'll choose this edge with weight 8. Okay, here we have vertex 7. So let's pick this vertex 7 here, and here we see the edge weight is 8 so let's add here and let's add edge weight here 8 now we selected 7 so let's mark it as true true means selected true means selected now we have here these three vertex we have to find out the minimum edge weight that the adjacent of these three vertex here we see we have 1 here we have 7 and here we have 11, but 1 is already selected. And for 1, we have 8. 
we see one is minimum so let's select here six now let's connect here and the edge width is one so we selected here six so let's mark it as selected now let's find out the minimum edge width that is the adjacent of one seven and six here we see adjacent of six is here this vertex with edge weight 2 and this is the minimum so let's select 5 here let's connect it here the weight is 2 we selected here 5 so let's mark 5 as selected here here the index is the node or the vertex now we have to find out the minimum edge weight that is the adjacent of 1 7 6 and 5 we see here we have the minimum adjacent for 1 7 6 5 is this edge 4 okay so let's select this vertex to here and the edge width we see 4 let's connect it here so 4 now for 4 6 5 7 1 what is the minimum edge width that is the adjacent of this vertex one seven six five and two here we have selected two so we have to mark it as true and we see that the minimum edge weight is this eight so let's select here eight so let's select here eight and here we're going to connect it the edge weight is two so we have selected the vertex 8 so let's mark it as selected if we do not mark it then we might came to that again and that will cause a cycle now let's find out the adjacent of 8 2 5 6 7 1 and that is the minimum and for 1 all the adjacent selected for 7 all the adjacent selected for 6 all the adjacent selected and here for 5 and for 2 are left so for 2 we have here 7 and for 5 we have here 10 and 14 so let's select here this vertex 3 let's connect it here and let's add here 7 7 is the width now for 7 and 5 now for 3 and 5 the adjacent is 10 14 9 so let's select this edge and here we have vertex 4 so let's select this vertex 4 let's connect it to this vertex and here we have the edge width 9 here we have selected 3 we have to mark it as true and then we selected 4 we have to mark it as true here and we're done we have processed 0 minus v times we have here v minus 1 edges here we have total 9 vertex so 9 minus 1 is 8 here we should have total 8 edges 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 the sum of the edges 37 and this is the minimum spanning tree this is how prims algorithm works now let's see the pseudocode this is the pseudocode for prims algorithm this function prims takes two parameter graph and vertices here we're declaring a variable inf for infinity and here we're storing the maximum integer we can store in 32 bits then we're creating here the array to mark the selected vertices then we have here number of edges we'll have v minus 1 edges okay for spanning tree we know that if we have v vertices the number of edges must be v minus 1 initially we're picking the first vertex of value 0 and we mark it as selected by inserting this value true here we're printing edge width here we have this while loop while num underscore edge is less than vertices minus 1 will run this code this is the body of this while loop here we are initializing the infinity to this minimum variable and here we have x equals to 0 y equals to 0 and 
it will keep track the minimum age it will keep track the age with minimum weight here we have two nested for loop for int i equals to zero i less than vertices i plus plus inside here we're checking if selected i equals to two if i is selected only then we will execute the inner loop here we have inner loop for int z equals to zero z less than vertices z plus plus and here we're checking if the vertex j is unvisited only then we will process this code and here we're checking if graph ij is not equal to zero this is just for checking the adjacent okay since we're implementing the graph data structure using adjacency matrix and here we're checking if minimum is greater than the current value okay then here we're updating minimum and x to i and y to j at the end of this for loop we're printing x y and the current value and we're marking the vertex y as selected by putting true and we're increasing num underscore h this is prims algorithm let's see how this actually works let's assume we're given this graph data structure first what i will do we'll create a boolean array this is our boolean array of length 4 because here we have 4 vertices now let's run this while loop okay first we have here inserted 2 it means that we selected the node 0 that means the vertex 0 now let's run this loop okay this while loop nums age equals to num underscore is equals to 0 initially it's less than vertices minus 1 4 minus 1 is 3 so 0 is less than 3 let's run this code minimum equals to infinity x equals to 0 y equals to 0 initially now we're running a loop here from this vertex 0 to all other adjacent vertex here we see that 1 is unvisited and that is 4 4 is less than infinity now we have x equals to 0 and y equals to 1 for the second iteration of this loop then for i equals to then for j equals to 3 we will have this node but here we see 4 and 5 but but we see that 4 is less than 5 so we will not update x and y now here we will print x y and and here the weight so first we selected 0 then we have the vertex 1 let's connect it and let's add here weight and we're just printing it okay and this is just a logical representation 0 1 x y and here we have the weight graph x y here we should have a brackets now let's mark one as visited one is here y so y is visited now let's increase now num eight equals to one one is less than these vertices for one we will have two let's mark it two as visited so we find out here too because here we have is with one and it's already visited okay this is already visited and here we have five for zero and we see one is minimum so let's select the vertex two we mark it as selected so let's connect it here and the weight is one now for two we have here minimum and here we see two so let's select the vertex 3 here and the weight here we see 2 so here we have 2 and let's select it and we're done we're not going to go through each iteration for better understanding you can go through this you can go through each iteration of this loop this is the minimum spanning tree you can construct from this graph data structure this algorithm will take big o of e log v time complexity and it will take big o of v space complexity to construct to construct the boolean array hope you've understood how this algorithm works for a better understanding let me walk through another example let's say we're given this graph in this time and here we have this array this is our boolean array now we can connect 
the intuition with this pseudo code. Let's try it, okay? First, we have inserted here true. So we selected here zero. Now, the minimum edge is this, okay? We will find it using this for loop for i equals to zero and for j equals to one, we will find out this minimum edge. So let's connect it here. So zero, one, here we have wait for. So here we have wait for. Now let's mark it as selected. Now the adjacent of one and zero is two, seven, and seven. So here we see we have eight, we have eight. We'll choose this eight because we'll iterate from zero to eight and we'll find out here this value. Okay, first. Then we'll move from one to zero to eight. Then for we'll process for this node from zero to eight to find out the adjacent. Since you'll find out this edge first, so this value is not less than eight. So we'll have this edge. So let's select this vertex seven here. And let's draw here. So here eight. Now for seven and one, this is minimum. Here we see this is minimum. So let's draw here six. I'm going to work first here. Then for six, we'll have this is minimum five. All right, so let's backtrack. When you select seven, we have to mark it as true. When you select six, we have to mark it as true. When you select five, we have to mark it as true. Okay, and here we have wait two. Now for he from here we see now from here we see the minimum edge width to this node two. So let's connect it here. Now from two we see we have eight with the minimum edge width that is two. So let's connect it here, and here we're gonna connect it and let's add here two. Now from two to three, I'm going to work first here. Two to three here we have width seven. And then the minimum. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to mark all the selected vertex as true. We have selected two, so let's mark it as true. Here we selected eight, let's mark it as true. We have selected here three, we have to mark it as true. And then we have here four, so let's mark it as true. And here let's connect, and we have here weight nine. Total weight is 37, okay? 9 plus 7 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 8 plus 4 equals to 37. We miss this edge right here, okay? 4 plus 8 plus 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 2 plus 7 plus 9 equals to 37. This algorithm will take big of E log V time complexity and big of V space complexity. Hope you've understood this Prim's algorithm. In the next video, We'll talk about Kruskal's algorithms. Before learning Kruskal's algorithm, we have to learn disjoint set data structure. See you in the next video. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about disjoint set data structure. What is disjoint set data structure? Two or more sets with nothing in common are called disjoint set. If we're given set S1 equals to 1, 2, 3 and a set S2 equals to 4, 5, in between these two sets, S1 and S2, we see nothing in common. So these two sets are called disjoint sets. What is the representation of the data structure? How disjoint set is represented in computer memory and how it works? We'll see everything in this video. We'll see how disjoint set represented in computer memory and how it works. Now let's talk about the application of disjoint set. Here we have two uses of disjoint set. Kruskal's algorithm uses disjoint set. We can detect cycle in an undirected graph using disjoint set data structure. In disjoint set, we have two operations find operation and 
union operation. We'll see how find operation and union operation works. And we'll see how to detect cycle in an undirected graph using disjoint set data structure. Now let's see the representation of a disjoint set. Now let's talk about the representation of a disjoint set data structure. We can represent disjoint set using a simple array. Disjoint set uses chaining to define a set. The chaining is defined by a parent child relationship. Let's say we're given this set. We have to represent this disjoint set. How to represent this set using disjoint set data structure? We're going to implement disjoint set data structure using simple array. First, we're going to construct a structure. This is a structure. We can construct this structure here. 0 is parent of 1 and here 1 is parent of 2. And 0 is the absolute parent of 2, okay? Also, we can construct this structure. Here we see the parent of 1 and 2 is 0. And here we see the parent of 2 is 1, the parent of 0 is 2. The absolute parent of 0 is 1. So we can consider the absolute parent of 2 and the absolute parent of 0 is 1. Now how this structure can be represented using a simple array. This structure can be represented using a simple array, something like this. Okay, we have here 0, 0, 1 and here we have 0, 1, 2. How it's represented? We have here 0. So the parent of 0 is 0. Okay? That's why we have here 0. Now here 1, we see that the parent of 1 is 0. And we're storing the parent of 1 here. Okay? And here we are storing 1. 1 is the parent of 2. So we're storing here 1. So 1 is the parent of 2, 0 is the parent of 1, and 0 is the parent of 0. Now how to find out the absolute parent of 2? In order to find out absolute parent of 2, first we'll move to the index 1. At index 1, we have value 0. Now, let's move to index 0. And at index 0, we have 0. And we see that this is the absolute parent of this node 2. Okay? We can consider here the element as a node. So, this structure is represented something like this. We can have many different structure to represent a set. This is a valid representation of the joint set data structure of this set which contains three elements 0, 1, 2. This is how the joint set represented using a simple array. Now let's see the representation of this structure. This is the representation of this structure. The parent of 0 is 0. The parent of 1 is 0. The parent of 2 is 0. This is so simple, right? Now what is the representation of this structure? What is the representation for this structure? This is the representation of this structure. Here we see that the parent of 0 is 2. And the parent of 1 is 1. And the parent of 2 is 1. This is a valid disjoint set data structure. So we can represent this set in this something like this. Or we can represent something like this. Or we can represent something like this. And we can have many different way to represent a set that depends on our implementation. So this is a simple representation of disjoint set data structure. Now let's see the representation of two set. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the representation of two set. We have this set S1, 0, 1, 2, and we have this set S2, 3, 4, 5. How to represent this two set using one array? Let's see how to represent this two set using one array. And we have to made this two operation, find operation and union operation. Using this find operation, we will check R2 and 5 in the same set. And using this union operation, we will merge two set S1 and S2. Let's see how we can represent this two set using the joint set data structure. This is our given array, okay? This is our given array. Here we have index and here we are storing 
the value okay here at index 0 we have 0 at index 1 we have 1 and at index 2 we have 2 at index 3 we have 3 at index 4 we have 4 at index 5 we have 5 what does this means when you have the index and the value are the same it means that the the element is the disjoint set okay this is a disjoint set here we have total five disjoint set we have to we have to construct a set with this three elements zero one two and then we have to construct this set using this three element three four five how to do this okay now here we have individual or distinct set all the set are disjoint we have here total six set zero one two three four five in this array we have total six disjoint set zero one two three four five now let's construct a set for this set s1 first let's join these two set zero and one for that what i will do will replace this one with zero let's replace this one with zero so here it means that the parent of zero is zero the parent of one is zero okay so the parent of one is zero now we have this set in this array now we have total five disjoint set now let's join this two set two and this set okay we have to join two into this set so what i will do here we will replace this two with one so here let's add one it means that the parent of two is one so let's add here two so we get this disjoint set so we get this disjoint set now in this array we have total four disjoint set this is a set now let's construct this set now let's join this two set here three and four for that what i will do will replace four with three so three is the parent here three is the parent of four and here we see that three is the parent of three now let's join this set five to this set if we want to join to this set then what i will do we will just replace this five with four now here we're gonna add five so this is our set so in this array now we have two disjoint set now let's find out two and five are two and five in the same set for two we see we have here one for one we have zero for zero we have here zero so what is the absolute parent of two the absolute parent of two is zero now let's find out the absolute parent of five the parent of five is four so the parent of four is three the parent of three is three so three is the absolute parent of five so we see that the absolute parent of five is three and the absolute parent of two is zero we see the absolute parent are different so two and five is not in the same set so it will written false two and five exist in the different set now let's perform this operation now let's merge this two set s1 and s2 how to merge this two set okay if we merge this two set then what's going to happen we will have our one absolute root to merge this two set what i will do we will first find the absolute parent in this set and the absolute parent in this set the absolute parent in this set is zero the absolute parent in this set is three now what i'm going to do i'm going to replace this absolute parent three with zero so we connected this set something like this now we have here one absolute parent that is zero so let's find out the absolute parent of this node four so let's find out the absolute parent of this node four the parent of four is three the parent of three is zero zero is zero so we find out the absolute parent here so zero is the absolute parent of four what is the absolute parent of five the parent of five is four the parent of four is three the parent of three is zero the parent of zero is zero so zero is the absolute parent here so we merge this two set 
something like this. We just merge the absolute parent for both set. That means we merged the two set. This is called the union operation. We're just merging two set into one. And we're doing all the operations in this array. This is just a logical representation. And this is called basics disjoint set. Now let's see how to detect cycle using disjoint set data structure. Now we're going to talk about how to detect cycle in an undirected graph. Cycle detection works only in undirected graph for disjoint set. We cannot use disjoint set to detect cycle in a directed graph. Let's see how. Let's say we're given this age and here we have four age. Okay, we have to detect whether we have a cycle or not. Here we have this array. This is our disjoint set data structure. This is an array data structure. We are implementing disjoint set using array data structure. Let's see how we can detect cycle in an undirected graph. First we have 0 and 1. In this array we have four disjoint set. 0, 1, 2, 3. We have 0 and 1. The absolute parent of 0 is 0. The absolute parent of 1 is 1. They are different. So let's connect these two vertex with an H. Now let's perform union operation for this two disjoint set 0 and 1. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to just replace this 1 with 0. The parent of 1 is 0. Here the parent of 1 is 0. Something like this. This is the parent and this is 1. Now let's process the next age. This is our next age. Here we have 0 and 3. The absolute parent of 0 is 0. The absolute parent of 3 is 3. So they are different. Here we see that we have two distinct set. The absolute parent of 0 is 0. The absolute parent of 3 is 3. So we can connect these two vertex because we find out two different absolute parents. Now let's connect these two disjoint set. Here we have 0 and here we have 3. So the absolute parent of 0 is 0, the absolute parent of 3 is 3. So we're going to replace this 3 with 0. So here, what we're doing, we're just setting the absolute parent of 3. So here we have 3. The parent of 3 is 0. The parent of 1 is 0. The absolute parent of 3 is 0. Now we have this edge. In this edge, we have 2 and 3. For 2, we see the absolute parent is 2. For 3, the absolute parent is 0. So we find it two different absolute parent, 2 and 0. So what we're going to do, we're going to connect 2 and 3. So let's connect these two vertex with an edge. Now this vertex, okay? Before that, let's perform a union operation for 2 and 3. So let's perform here union. So let's perform here union operation. So here we'll update this 2 with 3. So here we have the root of 2 is 3. So here we see that the parent of 2 is 3. Now let's move to the next stage. This is our next stage. We have 1. Absolute parent of 1 is 0. Here we have 0 and the parent of 0 is 0. So here we find the absolute parent. Absolute parent is 0 for 1 and for 2. Let's move to 3. The parent of 3 is 0 and 0 is 0. So, ab so absolute parent of 2 is 0. We find out absolute parent of 1 and the absolute parent of 2 are the same. So we find it a cycle. Here we see that if we connect then we will have a cycle here. This is how we can detect cycle in undirected graph using disjoint set. Now we can optimize our time complexity from linear to logarithmic time complexity. For simple implementation of disjoint set data structure it will take linear time complexity. That means it will take big of n time complexity or n is the number of elements in our array. Now how we can optimize this linear to logarithmic. Let's see that. Now we're going to use path compression. Let's see how. To represent the joint set we are using parent child relationship. Okay. Now we're going to create an array of nodes. The node will have two parts parent and a rank. Let's see how. This is our array, okay? Here we have parent and rank. For each index, we have parent and rank. Rank is initially zero. We'll see what is rank. 
and here parent is zero parent means initially the parent of zero is zero parent of one is one and so on here we have total six distinct set that means we have total six disjoint set now we're gonna connect the two set zero and one okay let's connect it and we'll perform here this two operation find operation and union operation first let's now let's represent this two set s1 and s2 using this array now we have here index 0 okay and here 1 now what are we going to do we can connect in this way or we can connect in this way because we have same rank here we have 0 here we have 0 we'll move from lower rank to higher rank if we saw the rank are the same then we'll move in any directions now here what I'm going to do I'm going to replace this one with zero so here I'm going to replace this one with zero and I'm going to increase this rank so we can go in both direction we can go from here to here or from here to here now here I'm going to move from one to zero okay in this direction so what I'm going to do now I'm going to replace one with zero and we're going to replace zero with one why we're replacing zero with one it means that we're just increasing the rank from zero to one because we have here the same rank here we're increasing rank to one because here zero is the absolute parent of one so the absolute parent of one is zero if we want to merge another set with this set then we'll merge the absolute parent of new set to the absolute parent of this set from lower rank to higher rank let's see how now let's connect two to this set okay so we're gonna merge this two here we're just performing union operation okay now let's merge this two to this set so here we see that we have rank zero here we have rank one the absolute absolute parent of two is two absolute parent of zero is zero so we're gonna connect this two with this zero so it's represented something like this zero and here one okay now absolute parent of two is zero okay so here we're gonna store the absolute parent let's store here the absolute parent if we store absolute parent here then we're gonna replace this two with zero so here we'll have two so we represented this set s1 in this array now let's represent this set first we have here three and four so let's merge this two the joint set three and four we have here similar rank so we'll move from four to three so here we'll increase the rank here three is our absolute parent so let's replace four with three now let's merge five the absolute parent of this set is three so let's merge it's something like this so here we'll replace this five with three the absolute parent of five is three it represents something like this three here four and on this side five so this is our set representation this is how we can represent this two set using this array in this array we're storing a node at every index the node has two attributes parent and rank now we want to merge this two set here we want to merge this two set before that let's find out this operation r2 and 5 in the same set when we are representing this two set for this set and two now let's part from this point operation here we have this question r2 and 5 in the same set two for two let's find out the absolute parent for two the absolute parent is zero for five the absolute parent is three now what are we going to do we're going to check the absolute parent we see absolute parent are different so they are not in the same set if we see the absolute parent are same that means 2 and 5 exist in the same set but they are in the different set since we find it different absolute parent now let's merge this two set in order to merge this two set first we have to find out the absolute parent the absolute parent for this set is 0 the absolute parent for this set is 3 so let's connect the absolute parent here we see the rank are the same so we can connect from 3 to 0 or from 0 to 3 let's connect it something like this so here what I will do 
we'll replace this 3 with 0. So the absolute parent of 3 is 0. We see that parent of 4 is 3. What is the absolute parent? So the parent of 4 is 3, parent of 3 is 0, and parent of 0 is 0. So 0 is the absolute parent. For 5, the parent of 5 is 3, the parent of 3 is 0, the parent of 0 is 0. So absolute parent of 5 is 0. So here we're not storing the absolute parent, we're storing the parent. That can be the absolute parent, that may or may not be the absolute parent. Here we're not storing always just the absolute parent. We may or may not store the absolute parent. We may store the parent, okay? This is how we can represent the joint set using arrow representation. Here we're storing node at every index. And here we're just moving okay so here you find it zero when you find it zero we will update the parent of three with zero okay and that's called the path compression if you wanted to find out the absolute parent of five here you have three and for three we see that we have here zero for zero we have zero so you find out this absolute parent and we will replace this with zero it means that we find out a absolute parent here. So we are reducing. We are reducing. And this is called path compression. Don't worry about that. If you are not understanding this, I will highly encourage you to check out the source code. You will see what is path compression. Now let's see how to detect cycle using this representation, using this kind of representation of the joint set. Let's assume we have these five edges. And here we have five vertex, okay? Now this is our disjoint set data structure. For this, we see that zero and one. They're having different absolute parent, zero and one. So let's connect them. Now let's merge zero and one. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to replace this one with zero. So the absolute parent is zero. So let's increase this rank from zero to one. Now this age 2 and 3, the absolute parent of 2 is 2, absolute parent of 3 is 3. They are different. So let's merge 2 and 3. Now here we see that we have two disjoint set 2 and 3. Let's merge them. If we want to merge them, we'll replace this 3 with 2. And we'll increase this, we'll increase this from 0 to 1, okay? Now this is our next age, 1 and 2. The absolute parent of 1 is 0. The absolute parent of 2 is 2. So they are different. So let's merge 1 and 2. And now let's merge here, okay? Let's call union function or union method for this two set. 0, 1 and this set 2. Okay, here we have this set. We have to merge this 2. The absolute parent of 2 is 2. Absolute parent of 1 is 0. So let's merge this. We're going to replace this 2 with 0. So we merged it. Now for this age, 0 and 4, the absolute parent of 0 is 0, the absolute parent of 4 is 4. So they are different. So let's merge 0 and 4. So let's replace this 4 with 0, okay? Because it's having the lower rank. We have to connect from here to here. So we replace this 4 with 0. Now for 4 and 3, we see that the absolute parent of 4 is 0, absolute parent of 3 is here we have 2, the parent of 3 is 2, the parent of 2 is 0, the parent of 0 is 0. So the absolute parent of 3 is 0 and the absolute parent of 4 is 0. So we see that the absolute parent are the same. So if we add this age 3 and 4, it will form a cycle. So we find out a cycle here. This is how we can detect a cycle in an undirected graph. This method will not work for directed graph. Because in directed graph, we cannot move backward and forward. That's why we cannot detect cycle in an undirected graph using the joint set data structure. Here we see that we see the absolute parent of 3 is 0, but here we have 2. So we'll update this 2 with 0, and that is called path compression. And we'll see how to do this in the source code. Hope you've understood the disjoint set data structure in a very high level. For Kruskal's algorithm, you have to understand the disjoint set data structure.
in the next video we're going to talk about how to find out minimum spanning tree using Kruskal's algorithm. Kruskal's algorithm uses disjoint set data structure. See you in the next video. Hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video. In this video we're going to talk about path compression. In the previous video we have talked about path compression. Now let's talk about path compression in details in this video. Now here let's say we want to find out the absolute parent for the node 5 okay and here we have the structure of this disjoint set now in order to find out the absolute parent of this node 5 we have to find out the parent the parent of 5 is 3 3 is not the absolute parent of 5 so let's move to the node 3 the parent of 3 is 0 and the parent of 0 is 0 so we see that 0 is the absolute parent of 5 now what we will do we will replace this 0 with 0 but here we see we have 0 already okay now let's move to 3 here okay now here what I'm going to do I'm going to replace this 3 with 0 okay let's replace this 3 with 0 now here we have this 3 okay now in this structure what are we going to do we're going to disconnect this we're going to connect this 5 directly to this 0 okay so we can find out 5 in constant time now if we want to find out the absolute parent of 4 first we have to find out the parent parent is 3 and the parent of 3 is 0 and here we have 0 okay let's replace this 0 with 0 and then let's replace this 3 with 0 as well let's replace this 3 with 0 so the absolute parent of 4 is 0 let's disconnect it let's connect it to 0 here we see that 4 directly connects to 0 so we can accept 4 5 in constant time this is called path compression so we reduced the path we can find out it in constant time this is called path compression hope you've understood what is path compression in disjoint set data structure when we perform the find operation then we will reduce the path something like this okay this is called the path compression hope you've understood in the next video we'll talk about Kruskal's algorithm see you in the next video Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about Kruskal's algorithm now let's see how to find out minimum spanning tree using Kruskal's algorithm Kruskal's algorithm finds a minimum spanning tree for a weighted undirected graph it is a greedy algorithm in graph theory as in is stiff it adds the next lowest weight age that will not form a cycle to minimum spanning tree this is the formal definition of this algorithm if we're given this weighted undirected graph we have to find out minimum spanning tree from this graph the steps for implementing Kruskal's algorithm are as follows sort all the edges sort all the edges from low weight to high weight then take the edge with the lowest weight and add it to the spanning tree if adding the age created a cycle then reject this age we can detect cycle using disjoint set data structure so we'll apply here disjoint set data structure to find a cycle if we find out a cycle then we'll reject that age and keep adding ages until we reach all vertices this this is the algorithm okay this is the Kruskal's algorithm now let's see how it works let's say we're given this graph here we have total four edges one two three four this is source this is destination and this is weight now we're gonna sort the edges by their weight in increasing order so we sorted the edges by their weight in increasing order one two four five here we have zero one three two here we have four vertex now let's process this edge one two 
let's connect it okay if we merge these two vertex with an edge then it's it's not form a cycle then let's process this two and three let's connect it we see if we connect these two vertex with an edge it forms no cycle so we can connect it now let's process this zero one let's connect it it will not form a cycle here we have weight associated so for zero one let's add in one four two three here two then for zero one four now for this edge zero three five the weight is five from zero to three we see that if we add an edge here it form a cycle so we cannot include this edge we'll reject this edge how to reject an edge and how to detect cycle we'll detect cycle using the joint set data structure and we'll see how to find out a cycle and how to reject and we'll go through line by line of code now let's see how cross scales algorithm works since the edges are sorted by their weight in increasing order so we find out a minimum spanning tree this is the minimum spanning tree this is how we can find out minimum spanning tree using cross scales algorithm now let's see how to detect cycle and how to reject the edge that form a cycle this is our disjoint set data structure this is an array of nodes the node has two attributes parent and rank the rank initially is zero and parent is zero for the index zero for index one the parent is one and so on here we have total four disjoint set zero one two three now let's process this edge one two okay we see here we have one the absolute parent of one is one the absolute parent of two is two if we find out two different absolute parent for source and destination that means it will not form a cycle it's simple okay so let's connect one and two now let's perform union operation for this two for one and two now I'm going to update this two with one and let's increase this zero to one now here we have one it means that we have absolute parent one in this set one two okay now let's process this edge we have here two three the absolute parent of two is one the absolute parent of three is three here we see the parent of two is one and the parent of one is one so one is the absolute parent of two and the absolute parent of three is three because here we have three so one and three are not the same so let's connect here this so let's add this edge two and three this edge here we have weight one here we have weight two now let's connect this two set one two and three the absolute parent of this two is one and the absolute parent of three is three so what are we going to do now we're going to replace this three with one and we don't have to increase the rank here because we have rank one here we have this direction okay here we see that one is the absolute parent of three now let's process this eight zero one here we see that the absolute parent of zero is zero absolute parent of one is one they're different so let's add this edge it will not form a cycle because the absolute parent are different so here we will have the weight four here we have four now let's add this to set okay zero and this set one two three the absolute parent of this set is one absolute parent of this set is zero so let's connect it here we have one so we'll replace this zero with one because here we have higher rank so we're done now let's move to the next edge let's process this edge zero absolute parent of zero is one and the absolute parent of three is one okay so we find out the absolute parent one and one we find out 
same absolute parent for 0 and 3. So if we add this edge, it will form a cycle. We clearly see that if we add this edge, it will form a cycle. So we'll reject this edge. And we have processed here 4 vertex. So we're done. We have processed all the vertex in the graph. So we're done. This is how CrossCal's algorithm works. Now let's see the pseudocode. This is the pseudocode for CrossCal's algorithm. This function CrossCal takes no parameter. Inside here, we're creating an array of edges. The length of this array is the number of vertices. Then we have here equals to zero. Because initially we have processed zero edges. I equals to zero. For i equals to 0, i less than vertices i plus plus, result i equals to new h. Here we're just adding new h to the result array. Then here we're sorting the edges in ascending order by their weight. From low weight to high weight. That means in increasing order. Then here we have this subset. This subset means here we're creating an array of nodes. Subset is a node and this node has two attributes, parent and rank. The length of this array is the number of vertices. Then we have this array here we're just adding the new subset. That means the new node to the subset. Then here we're running this loop. Here we're inserting the value of parent at index v, the value v, and the rank is 0 initially. Then we're resetting i to 0, and here we're running this while loop, while e less than vertices minus 1, because we will have the total number of edges in the spanning tree, the number of vertices minus 1. Then here current is equals to new edge. Current is equals to is i plus plus so we're selecting our current age and we're moving i to the next to select the next age now here we're trying to find out the x x means the absolute parent of the source of our current age and the absolute parent of the destination we're storing it into this y variable so x and y if x and y is not equal then you can add that age to our result array okay then we're performing this union operation in between x and y x and y is the absolute parent of source and destination of our current age and here we're moving it to the next okay it will point to the next node here we have the age okay then we have this loop by this loop we'll print the source destination and the weight this is our find operation. It takes two parameters subset and i. If we saw subset i dot parent not equals to i, then we will recursively call this. And this condition is called path compression. Here we're calling this function recursively if subset i dot parent not equals to i. Here we're calling this function find subset subset i dot parent. We're calling this function recursively. This is called path compression we're just this is called path compression we're just reducing our path we'll see how we already saw in the previous video and then we'll return subset i dot parent we have here this union method it takes three parameter subset x and y here we have xr for x root find subset x the absolute parent of x and here absolute parent of y we're checking the rank if the rank of absolute if the rank of absolute parent of x is less than the rank of absolute parent of y we will will set the absolute parent of y to the parent of absolute root if we saw the rank of absolute parent of x is greater than the rank of absolute parent of y we will update the absolute parent of y with absolute parent of root the parent value okay 
if they are the same then this condition will be satisfied then this code will run where setting absolute parent of root as the parent of absolute parent of y and here we're just increasing the rank of absolute parent of root by one because the rank are the same in this case we have to we have to increase the rank of our absolute parent here in between these two absolute parent the absolute parent of x will be the rank of absolute parent will be increased if the rank are the same now let's see how this works let's say we're given this graph and here we have this age if we sort this age we get this age okay so we sorted the ages by their weights this is our disjoint set data structure and here we have four nodes 0 1 3 2 so we constructed this using this two for loop okay this is subset and we have this two loops now i equals to zero current is equals to this age let's process it let's process this age absolute parent of one is one absolute parent of two is two they're different so we can connect it they're different we can find out that find it will return one and it will return two so let's check this condition we see one is not equals to two so let's connect one and two now let's perform union operation in between one and two we see absolute parent of one is one absolute parent of two is two and we see the rank are the same so we'll apply this code here if we apply this code we'll update this absolute root of y here this is x this is y okay so let's update this with one and let's increase this rank to one now let's process this age okay we're done let's process this age now here we see x equals to two here x equals to the absolute parent of two that is one here we have one okay the absolute parent of two is one and the absolute parent of three is three one and three are not the same so it will connect this age two and three two and three okay here we have weight one let's so let's add here weight one so this point will return one for two and it will return three for three okay let's see how it's written one for two we will call this subset at index two we have value one one is not equals to two so we'll call with this set here okay here we see we have one and one equals to one so it will return one and it will update this value with one but here we have already one now let's return one okay this is how this find will return one now we're done okay let's add this eight to this result that means we connect this eight and the weight is two we're just storing the edge in order here to this result array now let's call this union with one and three if we call or with if we call with one and three here we see this condition okay absolute parent of two is one absolute parent of three is three so here we see rank equals to one okay at one we have the rank one and here zero so so we have to update this value with one let's update this value with one so we're done let's move to the next age this is our next age zero one the absolute value of the absolute parent of zero is zero the absolute parent of one is one they're different so let's add this age to our result array that means we'll connect this age zero and one let's connect this age here we have weight equals to four now let's call this union with zero and one here we have rank equals to one so we'll update this zero with one we'll move from lower rank to higher rank something like this okay this is the absolute root so we're done now let's move to the next age here this age absolute parent of zero is one absolute parent of three is one they're the same so 
will not add the edge to our result array that means we will not connect it because if we connect it it will form a cycle this is how we can detect a cycle and this is how we can reject the edge that form a cycle now we have processed four vertex so we're done this is how this cross scales algorithm works now let's take another example for better understanding let's say we're given this graph and we have the edges here and we already sorted the edges in ascending order and we have this array this is our subset array we constructed this array using this for loop okay this two for loop now i equals to zero well e less than vertices minus one here we have total six vertices our current edge is this edge here we have six vertex this is your current edge here we have zero and one the absolute point of zero is zero absolute point of one is one they're not the same so let's connect one and zero zero and one here and weight is one now let's connect them using this union the parent are the same so we'll update the parent of y here this is x this is y so let's update it with zero and let's update this with one by this formula because the rank are the same now let's move to the next this is the next age we have added this age to this result array okay we're here just showing you the logical representation now here we have one the absolute parent of one is zero the absolute parent of three is three they're not the same so let's connect one and three one and three okay we connected here one and three the weight is one now let's connect one and three the absolute parent of one is zero and here three we have here higher rank so we'll update three with zero by this formula okay by this formula subset yr dot parent equals to xr because here we have the higher rank here we have higher rank one it means that this is the absolute parent in this set so we added this set this is a disjoint set this is the joint set so we added this set to this set now let's move to the next eight this is our next is two and four the absolute parent of two is two absolute parent of four is four they're different so let's connect two and four here we see the weight is one so let's add here one now let's call this union with two and four here we see that the rank are the same so we'll update here this yr that means the absolute parent of y with x okay the absolute parent of x and we'll increase this zero from zero to one so we're done we have added this three edges in this result array and we're just showing you the logical representation now let's process this edge zero two the absolute parent of zero is zero absolute parent of 2 is 2 so we can connect here 0 and 2 let's connect 0 and 2 here we have weight 2 now let's call union with 0 and 2 for 0 and 2 we have the same rank so we will replace this 2 with 0 and we'll increase this rank from 1 to 2 we have rank here 2 it means that this is our absolute parent for this set this is a joint set and here we have disjoint set we have here two disjoint set now two and three the absolute parent of two is zero absolute parent of three is zero they're the same so if we add two and three it will form a cycle we clearly see that if we add here this eight then it will form a cycle here so we'll not add this eight here this condition is false now let's process this now let's process this edge here okay we don't have to add here the union because we don't have to apply here union because we have no edge here we rejected this edge 
now this is our current is 3 and 4 okay here we have 3 and 4 the absolute parent of 3 is 0 absolute parent of 4 is 2 they're different no they're not different actually the parent of 4 is 2 the parent of 2 is 0 the parent of 0 is 0 so we'll update this 0 with 0 and then we'll update this 2 with 0 this is called path compression and it will return this find will return 0 for 4 so we see that for 3 and 4 if we connect it will form a cycle it will form a cycle okay if we connect 3 and 4 it will form a cycle so we'll reject this edge now let's move forward now let's process this edge 1 and 2 here okay absolute parent of 1 is 0 absolute parent of 2 is 0 so we'll ignore this edge let's move forward 1 and 4 absolute parent of 1 is 0 absolute parent of 4 is 0 they are the same if we add 1 and 4 it will form a cycle we clearly see that for this edge as well if we add 1 and 2 it will form a cycle so that's why we ignore that edge do you see how we are using the joint set to detect cycle and to reject the edge that form a cycle hope you are understanding now let's process this edge 4 and 5 the absolute parent of 4 is 0 and the absolute parent of 5 is 5 so let's connect this two vertex here so let's add this edge 4 and 5 here we have the weight is 3 now let's call this union 5 and 0 here we see that 5 and 0 absolute parent of 4 is 0 absolute parent of 5 is 5 so they're different and here we see higher rank this is having higher rank the absolute parent of x having higher rank so we'll update this 5 with this value 0 so we're done now let's move to the next this is your next age 3 5 the absolute parent of is 0 absolute parent of 5 is 0 so they are the same so we will not add the edge we're done we have no more edges here so we have processed all the edges we find out this spanning tree this is a spanning tree we find out using cross scales algorithm this is called cross scales algorithm here we're using the joint set data structure to detect a cycle and to reject the edge that might form a cycle hope you have understood Kruskal's algorithm and how we are using the joint set with Kruskal's algorithm. Hope you've understood. This algorithm will take big of E log V time complexity, this log V for this the joint set and here we have E, E is for number of edges, V for number of vertices, okay? Here it takes big of V space complexity for this subset array and for this result array. Hope you've understood how Kruskal's algorithm works here this sort algorithm will take e log e time complexity so we should add here e log e so this algorithm will take total e log v plus e log e time complexity and o of v space complexity hope you've understood Kruskal's algorithm thanks for watching this video